the hour of 9 o'clock having arrived, the special meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council for budget consideration purposes is called to order, and the clerk will call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Members Newsom? Present. Brown? Here. Watkins? Here. Bruner? Good morning, present. Calentari Johnson? Present. Vice Mayor Golder? Here. And Mayor Keeley? Here. A quorum having been established, we will move along. Uh, our item here is uh, the proposed 2023-24 fiscal year budget. Uh, if you want to participate in this as a member of the public, you can either do so here in chambers or you can call in and we will receive your testimony uh, online. <coughs> this would be the opportunity for public comment at this moment um, on, uh, if you just hold for just a second, just, I'll be right with you, just, just one second. Very good. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Mr. Longinati, uh, how are I, you, sir? Good. My name is Rick Longinati. Thank you. Um, so I have some questions about the parking district. It, it's called the Parking Enterprise Fund. Mm -hmm. um, so as you know, the pandemic hit downtown really hard. Uh, the revenue has been lower than expenditures ever since fiscal year 2021. And it looks like it's getting worse. The estimate at the end of this fiscal year, which is next month, is that um, the deficit will be two and a quarter million dollars. That's out of a expenditures of six and a half million. So, a little over a third of the of the revenue of the of the expenditures is being paid somewhere else. Um, and we know from previous years that there's no fund balance. You know, the the, the downtown parking district ran through its savings, right? It would be really good to see the fund balance. In previous years, it was listed in, in the documents, and this year it's not. Um, so the question that I have is where's the money come, coming from to pay the bills? Um, and if these funds are coming from another source, will they be repaid? Is it a loan? What, you know, what's the plan for repayment? Um, so the estimate estimated deficit for the next fiscal year 2024 is even larger than for this year it's 2.6 million dollars um so does staff estimate that we're going to break even one of these years uh, like if so how long will it take to be in the black and then the next question is after we're in the black how long before we repay the loans presumably from the general fund or wherever else it's coming from so I've, I have these questions for you in case you didn't take notes, but you're all here. Thank if you would give those to the clerk, Mr. Lodge Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Us? You? you have someone online. Someone online. Let's go to the person online. Good morning. Good morning, the person online. Your, your moment has arrived. Three, two, one. We will hear from you later if you'd like to call back in. Right. Members, we are on the library presentation. Yolan Wilburn, our library director, will be presenting on this item. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning, Mayor Keeley. Good morning, council members. Yolanda Wilburn, director of the Santa Cruz Public Libraries. Um, thank you so much for having me here. I'm thrilled to be able to present to you the library's 2024 fiscal year budget. So, oops, went a little too... Okay, there we go. Uh, so today I'm gonna tell you a little bit, bit of an overview of Santa Cruz Public Libraries. Um, we just recently celebrated National Library Week and the theme for this year was there's more to the story. And so our libraries are no different. There's a lot more going on than you think. Um, our, I will then uh, talk a little bit about our achievements in 2023, things that we accomplished, um, some of our challenges, 
and then a brief overview of our budget as well as what we have to look forward to in 2024. So again, there's more to the story, um, and it looks like sometimes we're just a bunch of people hanging out over there at the library having a party and <laughs> crafting and singing and dancing and having a good time. Um, but there's a lot of work that goes into what we do. Part of that begins with our library financing authority. So the library financing authority oversees the county measure R, quarter cent sales tax, that comes directly to fund the libraries. So annually, we get about $10.8 million from that Measure R sales tax to help us operate our libraries. We also have our wonderful Joint Powers Authority Board who contributes and oversees our operations. Um, our, the cities of Santa Cruz, Capitola, Scotts Valley, and County of Santa Cruz all contribute funds through the Joint Powers Exercise Agreement. And so the city of Santa Cruz, this body, actually contributes about $1.9 million annually to our budget. Our Library Facilities Financing Authority also oversees the Measure S sales tax, and that's to renovate and rebuild our libraries. Um, and we are coming to the end. We're, we're so pleased um, that since the city council here approved, the new downtown library affordable housing and parking project, we are going to be able to move forward and we're looking forward to the city of Santa Cruz going out for its bond. That's the last bond we need to be able to complete the downtown library. So in addition to our wonderful boards, we have a fantastic staff. Um, our library advisory commission provides citizen input to what we do. We do a lot of work with them. And then we also have our friends of the library who really help us out. Our friends of the library really do help us in not only raising funds, but they also volunteer at the library. And they've begun providing some community-led programming, which has been really successful, because it's really based on the needs of each individual community. Um, this year, we did a, something a little different. Um, we actually sort of restructured our organizational chart in that Assistant Director Eric Howard is now sort of overseeing the public services side, where I oversee directly more of the administrative and operational side of our, our operation. Um, our library's vision is uh, to transform lives and strengthen our community. Uh, we do that through lifelong learning, digital inclusion, community connections, and transformative spaces. As you've seen, this has been the year of building for us, so we've opened a lot of libraries. We also um, really have begun to work on our organizational capacity. We believe with all of the things that we do, it's really important to have our staff be able to have the skills that they need. So training our staff has been a really important part of what we've done this year. All right, so some of our achievements for this year, we completed a new strategic plan. We actually completed a new communications plan. That's something that the library has not had in the past, so we're really proud of that. It's helping us to better tell our story to the public and get people actively involved. We've begun a new information technology plan. We have a lot of work to do on our IT infrastructure at the library, outdated computers. So we're in the process of we've uh, updated servers this year. Those are all part of our IT improvement plan. We, as you can see, reopened Garfield Park, Scotts Valley, Live Oak, and just recently the Brand Safordi Library, which was a fantastic opening, and I know many of you were there, so we really appreciate all of your support. We relocated our collection management and IT teams. They were at the downtown library, but we were moving them into the administrative office because they actually serve people 
countywide, and so we believe that that's where they should be, where the rest of the staff that serve people countywide are. Um, and so we got that accomplished. That's something that had been on the books to do for the last several years, and we got it done in 2023. So we're really proud of that. Uh, we added 8.5 additional FTE library assistant twos. We had a lot of temps working, so we took some of that temp budget and we used it to specifically hire regular staff and give people regular benefited jobs, which is really important. It also allowed us to be able to increase our service at the library branches. We were able to open most branches six days a week and have regular hours for every community. And it actually allowed us to go from providing 240 hours a week open to 414 hours a week for our community, which is really important. We added a 1.0 community relations specialist. Again, that helps us tell our story, get our marketing out there, and make sure that the public know what we're doing so they can participate. We put a librarian at every branch. This is something I heard from the community every time I went out and talked to different groups. They said, hey, what happened to a librarian in every branch? We used to have them sort of clustered regionally, but the branches felt like, hey, the community said, hey, I don't have that librarian I can talk to. We've now got a librarian back at every branch. We migrated to a hosted integrated library system, again, to help us, that's cloud-based now, help us control our IT infrastructure. Um, we actually served as a FEMA disaster recovery center at our Felton Library after the atmospheric rivers. We also, at our Scotts Valley Library, we actually served as an evac evacuation point for kids who were coming out of a youth camp during the atmospheric rivers. They had to get kids out, so they brought them to the Scotts Valley Library, and that served as a staging point. So as you can see, lots of things going on at the library. And in addition, we added ukuleles to our collection of items you can check out. So we are still having a little bit of fun. So some of the challenges that we're facing this year. Um, we recently, as you know, the city of Santa Cruz actually um, increased their cost allocations across the city. They hadn't done that for a while. So that cost allocation was going to hit the library pretty hard. Our costs were going to double. And so um, the city has agreed to uh, the service agreement that we had previously in place since 2016. Um, but we are going to be working on renegotiating that agreement. Um, we want to make sure that we're getting a fair and equitable uh, value for what we're spending. And so we have partnered with the city to do an RFP for cost analysis. Um, so that we anticipate will take about a year. Um, and we are looking forward to working with the city so that we get some really great outcomes from that. Our information technology infrastructure, I've already spoken about this a little bit. We have electrical infrastructure upgrades. Even though we've, we're rebuilding and renovating libraries, there are some additional electrical concerns that we have. Our Boulder Creek Library, we believe we need to put a generator in place. In order to do that, we've got to upgrade the electrical system. So that's a project, a one-time project we're going to come back in and do this year. We also want to redesign our website and rebrand. I've heard from the community, hey, what is that thing that you guys have? Is that a quote mark? And so um, we want to look at rebranding. That brand hasn't changed for quite a while. Um, in addition, we've had this year, uh, the seven-year average showed that we have a 10% vacancy rate. We want to bring that down. Right now, we almost have all of our positions filled. And I know just about time we get something filled, somebody will retire. But we are really close. And so we're really looking forward to bringing that vacancy rate down. Oops, All right, we'll get there. Uh, so our projected revenue, um, so this year we are projecting that our overall revenues will be about $19,335,000. Um, we have seen a, we projected a decrease in those measure our sales taxes, you know, people, the, the recession's hitting, so we projected that downward, which is about a 1.3% decrease in the amount we're going to get from measure R. 
this year. Um, the uh, MOE that the cities and county negotiated, um, that actually is now increasing. Um, so that's really a good thing. They got that renegotiated last year in June at budget time. Um, so that will give us about an 11.5% increase in that MOE amount, um, which equates to about a 3.5% increase in overall revenue. Our personnel expenses, as you know, across the city are up. A lot of that is due to our increase in uh, benefits, our COLAs, our PERS. Um, but we also are up in personnel costs because we've actually opened branches, right? And so where we could take that 10% vacancy rate in the past, we just can't hold that right now um, in order to keep the branches open. So higher personnel costs. Um, the good thing about when we were closed was we were able to really use that salary savings to build our fund balance, which is really great. We have a really healthy fund balance, which you'll see here a little bit later on, and that's going to allow us to do those one-time projects. Um, we actually, with the opening of Aptos in the fall, we actually want to add in this year's budget a 1.0 librarian for the Aptos. We already have a youth librarian designated there, but because we are going to be taking in collection materials from the Aptos History Museum, we want to make sure that we have an adult services librarian there to provide programming and do local history programming. We've also reclassified a, um, an assistant volunteer coordinator position that's been vacant for a long time. Um, it's uh, a position that we feel could be utilized better elsewhere. So we are going to make that into a 1.0 position. We're going to combine that half time to a 1.0 in order to provide a library specialist who will work with our community relations specialists, doing more of that outreach, and then working also with volunteers. Um, so our volunteers, when we do events, we do tabling, we do pop-ups, we need volunteers to help our staff. Um, so that position will help with that. Um, and again, we've talked a little bit already about our vacancy factor. Our operating expenditures and capital outlay, uh, we've seen a, actually I sat and worked with all of our branch managers to bring down their budgets, about 2.6%, so we ended up balancing the budget. Um, we know that there's a 4.5% increase that we took this year, and that's from that city uh, services agreement that we have, that cost allocation. Um, and then we augmented some of our collection materials by a trust fund that we have. We have a number of smaller trust fund accounts that the board had spoken to me, our library advisory commission, and they said, hey, you guys have had these small amounts for a long time. Why don't you start spending those? Because they're not earning a whole lot and it would be better served by putting the materials into the collection. So we're going to use some of that trust fund to augment about 8% of our materials budget this year. And then, of course, I've talked already a little bit about those one-time projects. So as you can see here from our budget overview, um, our total expenditures are coming out to be about $19,915,000. Um, and that leaves us with a $580,000 um, need to go to our unrestricted fund balance. We do keep a 20% reserve that we are mandated to have on hand. And as you can see, that still leaves us with a really healthy fund balance to be able to go back in and do a lot of these one-time projects. Some of those one-time projects include a 10-year financial plan. I know that's something that the city is going out for this year as well. We want to do the same. We want to be fiscally responsible, and so we need to be able to project out how many of these one-time projects can we do, what are our CALS, CALPERS and escalating benefit costs going to be to make sure that we have the funds available to sustain the library system. We're also looking at doing the Link Plus program. Link Plus allows our users to sort of go to our catalog and look at what other libraries have and place an order. So it's similar to ILL, but there's no charge to that. Um, this will help to beef up our collection and people's access to more materials. Also, Capitola, when we open the Aptos library this fall, um, we will be pulling 3.0 FTE out of Capitola. Those are Aptos staff who've been working there. And now that we're reopening Aptos, they're going to have to go back. So we have to make a decision. Are we going to put more money into personnel to keep Capitola open on Sundays? So our board has um, 
tentatively approved us going out for a pilot project um, where for six months we're going to use temp staff to help cover the Sunday hours and then we'll get some do some surveying with the public we'll look at the numbers we have people counters that we installed at every branch this year as well and those will be able to get good counts on how many people are using the space um, and then we'll make a determination of and we'll go back to our board to say are you going to fund more people right to keep that open or is it something that we need to close? I will say this, that in preliminary, just looking at the current statistics that we've been able to get, Capitola does continue to serve downtown, still serves more people, more people in and out the door downtown, um, but Capitola serves more books on Sunday. <laughs> so it's interesting. Uh, lots of people checking out books there. Um, again, our cost allocation analysis and then rebranding our website and redesign. So looking ahead, um, opening the Aptos Library, we are really close. I'm scheduled to do hopefully a punch walk at the end of June. That doesn't mean we're opening, it just means we're almost there. Um, and so my goal is to get our Aptos Library opened in September. Um, Live Oak Annex is another project, and that's really more study rooms and community space that we'll be opening. Um, so that should be around the same time is what we're projecting. Um, and then we have the downtown library project. We are so excited. The community is very excited. Um, our friends are very excited and they have begun their campaign. So I continue to work with them on their campaign to raise funds for the downtown library. Um, and then again, those one-time projects are gonna keep us pretty busy. Um, and of course, we will continue to provide our programs and services as we always do. With that, I'm happy to take any of your questions. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, and thanks to all of your staff as well for running such a fine library system. Let me ask if there are questions by members right here. Ms. Kalantari Johnson. Hi, thank you so much for the presentation and all of your work. Um, just a couple of questions I was pleased to hear and see about the um, 8.5 FTEs um, instead of the temps. I'm wondering if you could share how many temps, approximately how many temps was that and, and in what direction and how did it impact the budget? So um, I can't say how many temps it was because yeah. temps usually are based on hours. Sure. And so we did take half of the temp bu bu budget. We still kept half the temp budget to be able to provide because our aides, and those are our library workers who shelve materials, those are still under the temp budget. And so we've been able to sustain aides at all of our locations with that budget. Um, and then we also have some on-call librarians and library staff if somebody's out on an extended leave. Um, one of the other things that we did this year was we really looked at having our managers schedule better. So if you need today off, but you can work tomorrow and that was your normal day off, let's just reschedule you rather than calling in temps. And our staff has really been working hard to do that. Um, so we do know this, that of those 8.5, we're hiring those temps. They're taking the permanent jobs. We have some people here who they've retired and they only want to work temp sure. and they can continue to do that with us. But the bulk of the people who we're hiring are people who already live here and they were in those temp jobs. That's really great. Yeah. Um, one other question I see in the FY24 goals establish a partnership with County of Santa Cruz to provide a social worker in the downtown library. Um, can you just share more about what that looks like and um, um, well, if it's if it's reflected in the budget or what, yeah. So it's not really reflected in our budget. So that's something that we've been talking with one of our board members, Carlos Palacios, the county administrative officer, um, and they have committed that they are willing to have a social worker be placed in the downtown library. And so it will be a partnership with them where they would fund it, they would pay that position, and we would provide the space for them to operate. Right now we have, as you know, a number of community partners that go in and out, mm -hmm. but they're not there all the time. And so I think having a permanent social worker there will be really helpful. It'll alleviate some of our staff from doing that work. Mm -hmm. um, the, the problem is that the county is struggling to hire people for that position, uh -huh. and that's where we were hoping we'd get that done this year, but they just don't have this staff. 
to be able to staff that position. So in the new fiscal year, we're going to really hope and push for that um, to get that position hired at the county. Great. Thank you so much. Those are my welcome. questions. Further questions or comments? Ms. Bruner. Thank you so much for that um, thorough report and information. Um, as the current chair of the Library Financing Authority, I'm very pleased to see uh, the healthy fund balance and the reserves and so much action moving forward in the upcoming year. It's just absolutely amazing. Um, so with um, uh, the city of Santa Cruz library locations, um, I'm happy to see the goals. I'm also happy to see the number of staff members that completed DEI training. I know that has been a topic um, because the libraries now serve such an array of, of folks coming in and using the services. And um, so I look forward to the analysis and um, the cost allocation analysis as well as a huge project. So um, thank you. Thank you for all your work. I didn't, after our previous library director, Susan, left, I was sure it would be hard to fill her shoes, but you have just stepped into the role and really I feel like the library's in good hands and your whole team, thank you for this work and continuing all the library services for our community. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Couple of questions. One is, could you step through uh, what you understand right now to be the timing for the new downtown library? Sure. So my understanding is that we're not anticipating groundbreaking until 2024. So probably end of the year, 2025, early, <laughs> something like that. Um, we'd love it to be sooner um, if we can, um, but I think in order to get all the pieces in place, that's the timing. Um, we did go out recently for the infrastructure grant from the State Library Building Forward. Um, that is, we're hoping we get that, um, but again, uh, the city of Santa Cruz bond is one of the big pieces that needs to be done in order for that project to be moving forward, as well as the other pieces of the construction project. So ground break, we're anticipating probably 2024, late 2024, 2025, early, and then uh, us moving into the building and opening 2027. And this bond that you've now referenced twice. You referenced it earlier in your presentation. Can you talk about that? Sure. Um, each during the Measure S, so the Measure S, there's the the fund is there for the the city to go out for the bond. Our other uh, county has gone out for their bond, um, and I know that the city is in talks with the county treasurer who oversees that fund in order to go ahead and have their bond issued. Um, right now, to do the other projects, the, my understanding is that the city has been using a pay-as-you-go kind of plan. So as the project has funding, they can draw down from that account, but they do still need to go out for the larger uh, bond issue. They, meaning the city, city. of Santa Correct. Cruz, needs to go out on a bond issue in order to build the downtown library. Correct. And that is, I believe, uh, about $27 million. Thank you. A couple of other questions. Uh, the, uh, there, am I right in believing there, there will be, because I think we do this on, on many pro public agency projects, there'll be a, an art component that will go into the library, the main downtown library. There'll be art components to it artistic features to it, is that right? So I do not have any information on the art. I know with the county projects, there was a public art piece. My understanding is the public art piece for the city of Santa Cruz is gonna be part of the parking area, um, a different aspect of the project. So um, that's my understanding. 
we do not have any plans at the library and the plans that we've been working on over the last year, we, we have some feature walls and things like that, but we don't have a specifically art piece. That seems a bit unusual uh, in that uh, in the city, we are big proponents of public art in public places, in public buildings. Uh, and uh, I'm wondering if this project is so far along that there isn't some uh, opportunity to still include that, either on the interior or the exterior, or is that a policy decision that's already been made? No, I don't think it's a policy decision, and that's where I think that the parking component, I think in the parking garage may be where that public art piece was gonna come in. Again, um, probably Bonnie Lipscomb is the better person to ask about that because that's where my understanding was. So that may be an external feature of public art where, you know, on the side where you enter the library, um, I'm not um, aware of what specifics are to that art piece. Do you personally, uh, professionally think that it's a good idea to have public art associated with it, in, incorporated into new library construction? Well, I think we, in our libraries, and all of our libraries, we do have art hanging systems. And so one of the things that we worked on this year was really establishing a clearer policy about public art in the, our library spaces. And so we actually, uh, up until now, our friends of the library have largely gone out and solicited artists and said, hey, would you like to hang your art in the library as a rotating exhibit type of thing? We have some display cases where local artists are able to put in their works. And that's, again, a rotating art piece um, where we can hang a variety of artists in the community's collections. Um, I know, again, at our other facilities, um, we do have some public art that was incorporated in some of the county facilities. Um, but, uh, you know, even with Aptos, we've got kind of, there's a gate feature. So the gate to the, uh, the teen area is a piece of public art. Um, so I think it could be certainly incorporated. Um, I am comfortable either way because I know that in the library spaces, we make sure that we're displaying public art. Um, and we believe in equity, diversity, and inclusion, and we wanna make sure that there's representation from every member of the community. And so I like having that rotating ability where you can display a variety of artists, not just one artist for all time, and then other artists don't get an opportunity. So for me, that's kind of my perspective. I know you asked me the question about how I personally felt about it. And uh, staying in that vein for a moment, uh, is, there an, is there an adopted policy with regard to either the selection of uh, artwork that is uh, displayed? Is there a process and is there a policy? There is. We do have an art display policy and it, that is available on our website. Again, we just recently updated that policy uh, because it had been outdated for quite some time and so we've gotten that reestablished and we're actually working on uh, putting up a, a web, on our website a space where artists can just go there and they can actually sign up to try and be cons have their art considered to be displayed in our public space. Again, and the friends can go there and, and recommend an artist, but we also want to make sure that other artists' voices are being heard and that they can just go online, sign up, and then we have a committee. We're establishing a committee that would review those artists, and then they would determine, okay, you get the first quarter of the year, you get the second quarter, you get the third quarter, right? That type of a thing, so that we would uh, have the art rotate. Mm -hmm. And when that committee is meeting and considering, do they have some kinds of guidelines, criteria that is adopted, is available to people who know what that, what filter the committee will be pushing the applicants through? 
Certainly, that's exactly part of what the committee work would be. And we have, we will have guidelines for them to consider. And generally what we're trying to do is get like a, an art commissioner from the city, an art commissioner from the county, maybe some of the friends of the library, and then get some citizens to serve on that committee so that it's fair and equitable. And not just me sort of saying, oh, I like that artist, put that artist up. We want to have a really robust discussion around the artwork uh, to ensure that we are being fair and equitable. Would you be kind enough, we, we will have, finish uh, this portion of our budget deliberations today, then we will come back in June for a final day of reconciliation of various kinds and adopt the final budget. Would you be kind enough to forward uh, to the city council the guidelines that are used by this committee in determining what public art is selected Absolutely. Thank you very much. And just so you know, on the public art from the county side, on those pieces that they've put into their facilities, um, we actually do not decide that. That is the entity that owns the facility. So same thing with downtown. If the city of Santa Cruz wants to put art in that building, they can. That's your, it's your building. We don't own any of our buildings. It's, it's always the city or county or entity that owns that facility. Okay. So. Uh, I thought I had it, and now I don't have it. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I, I'm sorry. It's me. It's not you. It's me. I thought you just said there was a, a, a committee that did this. And mm -hmm. That's for the, inside our space I, as tenants. We're, we're leasing the space from you, and so that's where we would determine what will go up on our walls inside the library. But for those big public art pieces, that is part of the building, and so therefore, that is the owner of the building. And that, that's where that falls to the city. And like the county has a process. Um, and actually, I served on the county's board. And again, that's where we're kind of looking at best practices that other cities and counties are using to determine how our selections will be made. Is there a process inside the library system, uh, an adopted written policy you could share with us? Uh, that uh, that guides you on removing public art that has been approved. Do you have Do you have any policy on that? There is not. Okay. You think you might ever have one, or do you think that's an important thing to do? So we don't uh, think that that's necessarily an important thing to do on how we remove public art. What we do is we, in the agreement that we have, it states when we accept public art, when we accept art from someone, what the terms are. And that, out, that, in, it, in that agreement is where we spell out what can happen with art. That you know we don't hang art necessarily in perpetuity that we may keep it up there for a while, it may become damaged, we would take it down. We sort of outline all of that in the agreement that we have people sign. So it's we're really upfront about it, we're transparent. We don't wanna do something on the back end. Um, and so that's where if there's public art that's already existing, then what we do is we go to the entity that installed the public art and say, what agreement did you have <laughs> with this person? And absent of any agreement, then there is not an agreement. And so that's where it can get a little sticky. That's why we put it in in that new policy. We built it in up front to say, here's what the terms are. The uh, so my basic concern here is, uh, is that we're talking about what I consider to be temples of truth and temples of um, education and learning and, and possibilities and enlightenment in very wa various ways. I think they are, in my view, secular churches is what I view libraries as being. And uh, I, they have lifted so many people up out of circumstances on their life. I, mean, I don't have to tell you, for God's sake, you've dedicated your life to it. Um, I am concerned, and this I'll cut to the chase on this, uh, I uh, am very concerned still about what happened at the Boulder Creek Library with regard to the removal of 
a set of ceramic masks which were placed there as a when the library was brand new and there was a public competition for placement of art inside the library uh, an artist was selected they were placed there I think they were there 37 years uh, the Boulder Creek Library got uh, was uh, th and thank everybody in the library system for this uh, underwent a major uh, re uh, renovation by the way I think it's just fabulous a terrifically good work done there and I know it's considered you know, it's held closely in the heart of the people of San Lorenzo Valley in the Boulder Creek area it's my understanding that that art was uh, was taken down for the renovation, then put back up with the approval and assistance of uh, the library system, including the County Public Works Department, and that there was one anonymous complaint about the art, and the art came down. And uh, I'm not asking to re-litigate that issue. I will share with you that that's a very disturbing lack of a process in my view for a public library to uh, take down artwork uh, that had been there for 37 years and was done by an artist that is deeply revered and has passed away deeply revered there Boulder Creek's Boulder Creek, so Supervisor McPherson has to decide what he wants to do with him, anything in that regard. Uh, but as mayor of Santa Cruz, uh, that is stuck in my mind as, in my view, antithetical to libraries. Um, for that to have been removed in that way. And that's why I'm questioning what process is in place and what policies are, are in place for putting artwork up, selecting what art goes up, where does it go, and what artwork comes down, and under what conditions. I wonder if you share any of those concerns. So in that particular instance, we went back to the entity that accepted the art, and they had no agreement. That is why the art was removed, because we asked for an agreement before we would proceed with installing it. And there was the, the party who had ownership would not sign an agreement. Therefore, we were not able to install that. Well, I think the facts are slightly different. I don't mean to be argumentative, but I think the facts are slightly different. And that is that the artwork was, in fact, reinstalled, that you visited it after it was reinstalled. Then there was an, one anonymous complaint, and the artwork was taken down. That, I believe, is the fact pattern. Again, I, I know you said you don't want to get into debating this. I'm happy to have a well, conversation with you. I, yeah. What I said was yeah. I didn't want to argue. Right. I, I'm, I'm trying right. to engage in a conversation here. Mm -hmm. we, again, we went back to the county, and I said, do you have an agreement? Because there, was, there were many concerns, not just one complaint. There were many concerns. And so I went back to the county and said, do we have an agreement? I looked through every library record. Is there a, an agreement that we have for these, this art? There was no existing agreement anywhere. So I need now to get a signature, because again, if something does happen, then we're the library are responsible. And so that's where no one would sign agreement. So we can't put it up in our space. That's kind of what it came down to, ultimately. Thank you. I appreciate that. You're welcome. Any other questions or comments? Thank you very much for being here. Sure. Thanks. Thank you. Finance Department. Good morning. Good morning. Elizabeth Cabell, Finance Director. And I'm pleased to present to you this morning our fiscal year 24 budget. Okay, so. Oh. Okay, got it, thank you. Okay, so this morning I'd like to talk first about our core services. 
look at our organization chart and staffing changes that we're proposing for fiscal year 24, review the accomplishments of 23, our goals for 24, and then look at some of the services that we have in our current status quo discretionary budget. So uh, the finance department really has six divisions, and we have accounting, which covers financial reporting and grants, audits, all things kind of general ledger related. Our accounts payable and payroll division, which takes care of pretty much all the money going out. So we've got the paying the bills, the payroll, um, making sure everybody gets paid on time. The budget division handles our long range planning and forecasting, obviously putting together this large document. Um, and works with HR and bargain un bargaining unit costing. We have our purchasing division, which has um, grown significantly this year. I'm very happy for that, um, which handles all things purchasing, getting the purchase orders out, contracts, RFPs, IFBs, all of those various purchasing acronyms. Um, our revenue division handles all things money coming in. So we have um, TOT audits, debt collections, um, cashiering, all of that is handled through our revenue division. And then risk and safety management, which deals with liability insurance, claims, and workplace safety. The organization chart here, I have all of the di various divisions. At, with the, we have two additional positions that are proposed as part of the 24 budget, and that will bring us up to 31 FTE. And we're very pleased to be able to do that without any additional cost. So we are removing um, and kind of moving some positions around and also taking some um, funds from our professional services budget so that we're able to get more, we're able to fill the staff with what we really need right now, which is we need an additional, some additional support in the accounting division in particular, as well as budget. So we're looking at, and, and also purchasing, I guess everything. So we're looking at trying to um, get the staff that we need so in doing that, we deleted a finance manager, we added an accounting technician, an accountant, and a buyer. And then we did a little bit of movement between an accountant and a management analyst, um, senior payments and payments tech. So we're really just trying to right size the department, get the people and places that we need in order to do what we need to do. But we are very pleased that we could do that without additional cost. So looking at um, fiscal year 23, We've done some of the accomplishments that we have. We, there were several new um, GASB pronouncements from the Government Accounting Standards Board, so we had to implement those. That was a huge lift. We've got more coming up in 24, but that was a huge lift for the accounting, um, accounting division. Um, in purchasing, we have a purchasing assessment that was done about a year ago, and we've been working on implementing that. We have now two buyers as well as our purchasing manager, so that's been a big um, huge um, lift for the purchasing department, so it's awesome to have that. Um, we've got a fee study that's been launched. Um, planning talked about this a little bit yesterday, but revenue, our revenue division is also involved in that, so we're working on getting updated fees for cost recovery. Um, let's see, payroll, got everything out on time. Huge, awesome, again, big accomplishment. <laughs> um, everybody likes to get paid on time, reports filed on time. Um, we did implement a weekly check run for accounts payable, so that's made things a lot smoother and a lot better for departments as far as getting everything processed. So lots going on. There's been a lot of um, movement and um, trying again, like I said, to try and get the divisions with the right number of people in the right positions. So I'm um, very pleased with how 23 has been going. For 24, we have a couple of big things coming up for the department overall. We've got an ERP implementation that is really going to start. It's being led... Um, by the IT department, but finance is, of course, heavily involved as part, part of the um, getting a new financial system. So that process is just beginning. We're getting the RFP out. We are going to be working on doing major things like revamping the chart of accounts and getting the whole new system in there. So that's going to be a big um, project, not just for 24, but moving forward into 25, 26, 27, and so on. Um, we do have an updated um, land management system, which again, I think planning spoke about that yesterday. That will also impact our revenue division as business licenses and things like that, that we also use that system for. Um, and then we are hoping to, um, in fiscal year 23, to create and implement, um, provide a popular annual financial report. We always do our comprehensive annual financial report, but the popular report is something that is much more readable. It's about 20 pages instead of 180. It doesn't have as many numbers. It, much, it talks a lot more about what the services the city offers. It makes the numbers a lot more 
understandable and readable, and it's a lot easier for citizens to sort of navigate through that very cumbersome um, annual comprehensive financial report. So we are working on getting that um, implemented for fiscal year 23. We'll get that, um, that done hopefully by the end of the calendar year. And again, more GASB pronouncements. They always seem to be coming up with new things. So that's a never ending, never ending thing for us. Um, we are working on the budget side. We're working on improving our capital investment program. We have fact sheets that went into the budget this year. That is a new thing. Um, as far as the, the program itself, we are working on other ways and better ways of tracking and managing projects in there. We have a very large capital inv investment program. So working on um, streamlining that and really getting um, understanding that and being able to track that better. We've got a lot of multi-year projects and things. So, so that's another project for the, for the budget division. And then accounts payable. Um, the big project is going to be getting some ACH, more ACH payments going on. We've got a lot, we do a lot, still do a lot of paper checks. So we're working on getting that process streamlined as well. We've been working with the bank on that. So talking about our status quo budget, it was about 750,000. We've got lots of things that go into that, but what we were able to do, we sort of looked at our expenditures and tried to determine what projects, what things we wanted to do and needed to do for fiscal year 24. These are a few of the things that we have there that are covered under all of these different professional services, property services, other services, and so on. Um, a lot of this GovInvest e-procurement, that's something that um, came to the council yesterday, so we are getting that e-procurement system going. We're hoping to get and working on a budget and act for builder. So again, a long-term goal, hopefully not too long-term, is to get a lot of things online, like even an online budget book. So working on things like that. So that's sort of what that's, we've put some money in the budget just as kind of a starter to start working on that. Um, and then continued things, we use um, consultants HDL for property and sales tax, we'll continue that. We're looking, we have a RFP out, or I think closes today, for a municipal advisor. So we are working on getting an on-call municipal advisor. We don't, we have, we don't have one citywide right now, so we're working on getting a contract for that. Um, and then investment advisor as well. So just sort of some things that we're looking at trying to, um, we don't, Right now, we do all of our investments internally. We're looking at let's do an RFP and just see if there's another, um, if, if there's a better or different way of doing that. Again, more GASB reporting. I seem to hear that everywhere. Um, hotel and short term audits services. So we do um, contract out for that. So we will continue that. Our forecasting model as well. So that's something else that um, those are sort of continuing there. And then on to the other fund that is part of finance is our risk fund. So the risk fund is an um, internal service fund that we have. And there's been a lot of, I know this is a teeny tiny, lots of numbers there, but basically the message is that insurance costs have been increasing significantly over the last few years. Several reasons for that, natural disasters, higher verdicts. Um, we, we are a city that, ha that is full service and has a lot of very unique things like a wharf a dam, a levy, those sorts of things. So that all of those sort of contribute to our increasing insurance costs. So the chart down there at the bottom sort of shows you how things, liability and property insurance has cre increased over the years. Um, fiscal year 23, as I mentioned, we did have the $2 million that came from the general fund to support that, that large increase that we saw in 23. In 24, that $8 million is what we have now worked with the actuary to spread out over all of the departments. And then just sort of I listed there a few of the things that we are paid out of that fund. Obviously, it's the insurance, but we've got claims, settlements, litigation, um, safety consultant, actuarial expenses, litigation expenses, safety officer. We're in the process of hiring that. We're in the final interviews for that particular position. So all of those things come out of that particular fund. They're not paid out of the general fund, the finance piece of the general fund. They're all paid out of the risk fund. I think that's it. So I have um, myself or risk or budget here to answer any questions. Thank you very much for your presentation. Let me see if there are questions by members. The vice mayor is recognized. Okay. I, you don't even have to answer this, but I'm going to ask it every year. Um, in regards to TOT tax, if there's a way that we can streamline and collect that through the VRBO or Airbnb tax instead of having the monthly onerous remittal process that I guarantee you're not getting you know, all your money. 
Um, so you don't have to answer, just I'm throwing it out there like I do every year that hopefully we could do like what the county does at some point to collect that from people. I don't know. And, and I, you can tell me no. So that's all right. I because I understand it's different here. Um, but I do have a question that's with, um, and I don't know if it's for you or for HR, but it's in regards to workers' compensation claims. Should I save that for HR or ask you? Save that. You can save that for HR. Okay. I mean, I, I may jump up too, but it, but that, that particular um, internal service fund is handled through HR. So, um, so Sarah might have a little bit more information. I can also, um, or you can ask both of us. You can ask me, and I'll, if I don't have it, we okay, can I'll just ask Sarah. it now, and then maybe she can answer it later. But I'm just wondering um, if there if there's a record kept of workers' compensation claims that um, happen as a result of homeless encampment and clean, cleanups. Um, I know that there's been some injuries to to um, different department. Um, uh, in, individuals in different departments, and I went, oh, here she comes. And so I'm just wondering if we keep track of that as an expense when we're talking about the ongoing cost of, um, associated with this good, issue. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. The answer is yes. We do keep track of descriptions of the uh, related injury um, with some cleanup and reporting to keep the privacy sections safe. We can definitely report out on those things. And I don't need to know. I just think like keeping it while well, we're keeping it ongoing. When we like our last item last night about the ongoing expense to the city in regards to um, homelessness, that this is another one that the city's tasked with um, having to, to step up. Councilmember Bruner. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, my question had to do with the hotel and short term rental audit services. Um, so, can you remind me again why we contract out for that and what that, well, I'll start there and then I'll ask my next question with that. Well, we do have, you know, we do have an internal audit team that's small, so we do, we have an account, a senior accountant and an accounting technician, but we do contract out for the actual audit services. I don't have all of the information on exactly what portions are inside and outside, but I can, um, I can get all that information, find that out. That would be great. And I see in the uh, workload indicators and performance measures on page 120, um, no there's idea. number of transient occupancy tax audits completed. And that looks like 23 was 35. I'm just wondering what our costs, the, I, I, I didn't, I was having a hard time finding the cost of that audit service, and if they did 35 audits, what that return brings? Um, I will check with our revenue division, but I believe because those are on our um, on our metrics there, those are the short-term rentals that are done internally, and then we outsource for the larger, um, like the hotel audits and things like that. So okay. I will confirm all of that, but that's I believe that's what the our audit division here does, so that Internally. we do an internal versus the larger, the big hotels would be external that we would contract out for. So Airbnb, Verbo, or VRBO, um, that's internal. Yes, I and believe. large again, hotels are external right. with the audit service. That we pay for, uh, externally pay for, yes. I'd be curious to see that um, cost and return on that and um, I, I'm trying to remember maybe city manager knows um, I remember in the budget and revenue committee maybe two years ago uh, there was we had a discussion about um, there are two different ways to collect that tax and um, I, I don't remember the two different ways and why the city is doing it one way, but I've had a couple of community members that have found it really hard to pay their tax. They want to abide and comply, and it seems like we should be making it easy to <laughs> collect the money that is owed. So I was curious about that. Ms. Thanks. Schmidt, good um, morning. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council Member Brenner. Um, I will dig up. Bobby McGee, our interim finance director, did um, yes. research, and there was a write-up 
that we had related to transient occupancy tax and the collection and the method that we do it versus going through a third party agency to do it. Okay. So I will get that unearthed and re-forwarded to all of you and we can also attach it. Okay, great. And so you mentioned third party and it just tr triggered a memory about um, if we collect from directly from Airbnb or VRBO, there's something about they just give it in one lump sum and then we don't have data, right? Correct. And so we opted for the data. Is that correct? Yes, if I recall, um, it also had to do with the one lump sum and traceability and accountability to actual properties and whether or not they were remitting, were remitting or not. Okay. I feel like there's something in here that we should evaluate and analyze a little deeper to make it. Um... I, I, I believe once I unearthed the memo, okay. and I was looking on my devices, but it, they don't go back far enough. Okay. Um, uh, as I recall, the bottom line on the revenue take was the finance did the research and they recommended that the revenue, that our take revenue of the current process was larger than if we did it through the other mechanism that they researched. But let me find the memo and okay. um, we'll get that reread and back out. And then if there are any other additional things to be detected, I am sure finance will do so, right? Thank you. Voice. I'm I'm curious if that was related. Yeah, that, that's to exactly what I was going to say. And so I just it, it, even after you dig up the memo, is it possible to reach out to the county and see if that's been their experience? Because um, I know they used to have a similar remittance, and then now, so for, for me, I rent out my house on Airbnb, and so, like, it's confusing for somebody coming to town, too, and then, because um, the county collects it on their behalf, and, and so I just maybe reach out to the county and be like, did you find that to be true, that you got less just getting the lump sum, or? We will, and we also do have, this is not, we do have a, a bot kind of program that goes out and looks to see where there are Airbnbs and VRBOs and things like that. So, so it's not just that we're receiving the data, the the money, and we're not going out to check and make sure that people are not collecting and not remitting. So we do have a process for doing that. But yes, we will get back and determine and see if there is um, kind of what the county's process is, the process that we're doing, and if it is beneficial or would be beneficial to um, to change that process. Because it might save time staff time as well, collecting all the envelopes and doing that. I don't know. Factor that in. Sorry, thank you. I have one more question. Um, it, collections on, uh, is that under finance? Uh, so bills, uh, fees, and all of that is collections under finance? So there, yes, there is a collections that's actually under risk that, um, that the, the individual that goes out and does like the big collections and then things like, um, and then just, so those sort of collections like the bigger things, yes, we do have a person that is dedicated to collections. And um, um, I, in, in the previous department, um, there was a mention of staff DEI training and whatnot, and I'm wondering if that's in place for finance department, especially in the roles of collections and people interface with our community. We do have plans for a, a more of a citywide thing, not specific to finance, but um, as far as workplace safety, work being aware, things like that, it, the DEI is definitely a part of that. I, I don't think it's something we, we have specifically planned as a do only in finance, it's more of a, we're, this is something we're going to be doing citywide. But yes, recognizing that even though we don't have a front counter and our interfaces with the public is not the same as some of the other departments, we do, there's, there's angry customers, there's things we need to deal with on the phone just, just like we do with, pe with people in person. So we do recognize that. Okay, is that an HR? Um, does that live in HR to ensure that customer service side of um, the city and uh, well, the, is is sensitive to I would say the training lives in HR but the but yeah I mean <laughs> Ms. Schmidt good morning again thank you mayor good morning again um, thank you for your question 
Health and All Policies resides underneath the city manager's office and our um, Climate Action Sustainability Equity Manager, Tiffany Wise West, covers Health and All Policies. So she coordinates with the various departments to roll out components of Health and All Policies. And um, the DEI piece for training citywide, Tiffany is coordinating that with Sarah, our Chief People Officer, and um, Sarah's Human Resources and she'll be up at the podium next, or is she after IT? I can't remember. Oh my God, I can't remember. Shame on me. So th those are kind of, that's the connection point between the city manager's office and human resources, and then human resources strategically rolling out DEI programs to all of our employees, whether it's customer service, the way that we hire, the way that mm -hmm. we interact, the way that we just present as a city and who we are and and what we want to be thank you um i appreciate you framing it that way and i know being on the health and all policies committee and the racial equity resolution we passed a couple of years ago and really making that front and center a priority um i guess maybe seeing it in the goals like some of the other departments I think with finance, it would be equally important to see that. Um, thank you. And as you know, with the focus areas that you all started to draft in the um, third week in April on the strategic plan, Thriving Organization is one of them. And as we solidify those goals and the strategies to achieve them, we'll be able to roll that out to all the departments and then next fiscal year you'll start to see a connection to the direction that you all set with thriving organization and all the components underneath it great thank you welcome thank you that concludes my questions thank you council member brown thank you mayor thank you uh for the presentation i um this isn't necessarily uh, with respect to the, the questions that have come up around ease of use for participants in the system, but I do think it's worth mentioning since we've been talking about the Airbnb um, dynamic and how we receive those funds that um, we, just to remind us all that we do now have someone who is tracking that and um, collecting, and so that uh, position is, is more than paying for itself, is that That's correct? correct? Yes. Yeah. So um, it's not about the kind of ease of use and when payments get made and how, but um, with respect to our uh, short-term vacation rental TOT, we are doing much better now than certainly when I started on the council. Yeah, so it's, thank it's you for that. It's been a big difference, yeah. Yeah. Um, and my, so my question was, and I think I probably know the answer, but I want to just make sure I'm clear. On page 121, which is your uh, budget summary, the live, I'm just wondering about the big change in the under resources by fund, the, the liability fund, that big jump. Um, just wondering, it's probably, it's accounting, I imagine, <laughs> but I'm just no. trying to figure, and, and it's related to the increase in the cost. That table was really helpful to understand, you know, what our costs are around risk. So, and I'm, I'm guessing they're related, but I just wanted to ask you about the, the big and, jump. And Ross is here, can answer more specific questions, but but basically it is simply an increase in property and and, um, and liability insurance. And it's been happening for several years. It's just that this is the first year that we're seeing it um, spread out over all the departments. You know, last year there was a general fund component to that. So, um, but yes, it, it truly is just the cost of insurance that, that's increased. And, and so I, I'm, I'm starting to feel a pattern here. Any question I have about these big anomalies are really related to this cost allocation system that you've implemented. It's great. Um, so thank well, you. This, this isn't cost allocation. Yeah, not this one. Right, but, but you're right. The yeah. other ones, if you, if, if you don't know, say yes, cost allocation. <laughs> <laughs> couple of questions. Good morning sure. again. Uh, on the same page, a couple of lines down, the. I think a very positive thing is happening here, which is that the net general fund cost is going down quite substantially. And as a service department, I'm suspecting that's because you're able to take and properly allocate those costs across departments. You're a service department, and so you do that. That's and correct. your net city costs should be very, very low 
Right. And it is. And I'm suspecting that because of that, as we look forward in your budgets, this is more what the net city cost is going to look like in terms of the general fund. Exactly, yes. Okay. I mean, ideally it gets to zero, but that, that's really what we're trying to do. Everything in the, fi in these internal, in the central service departments should be allocated out. Absolutely. Let me uh, ask about, uh, if I understood it, I thought I heard you say that you are going out to potentially a vendor on the investment side of Treasury. Is that correct? Correct. And what is it that, uh, why are you doing that? So right now we do, we have, um, our, all the our, our investments are managed by our, in our revenue division, does all the investment and putting things in life and keeping track of it. But I think that, um, but we're looking now at maybe, is it, would it be advantageous to have that outsourced, to have not just, to, to basically do two things, come up with a, a current and updated investment policy, as well as an investment strategy. We are pretty much, our strategy right now is, you know, let's stay liquid. Um, and we want to make sure that, and, and part of this too is just having, we, our portfolio is a little larger than it's, or maybe a lot larger than it's been over the last few years. And so make, make, I think it makes sense to look out and see, is there a, someone professionally, there's lots of companies that do this, it, is it beneficial both cost-wise and resource-wise to outsource that particular function in our department? As someone who had this responsibility at the county level as a county treasurer, um, I know that under the law, the considerations for the investor, whether it's your office or you contract that out without being able to move the responsibility over there, that's still your responsibility, certainly, is safety, liquidity, and yield in that order. Uh, don't break the buck, as they say in the investment world. Uh, <clears throat> chasing yield is almost always a bad idea in the public space. Uh, if you have a positive return on investment, that's all we should really hope for. You, sh we should, you never have and you never will, as they say, break the buck. You never will make an investment that, that is going to... Uh, going to fail in some way. Uh, the question I have then is, what is it that somebody else could do following the principles? Of, as I understand it, we have a lot of money in LAFE, Local Agency Investment Fund. A lot of money in there. Most cities our size do exactly that. They put a lot of money in LAFE. LAFE is a proven performer, does a good job, takes care of your money, safety, liquidity, yield. You're never going to get rich off of it, but that's not the idea. The idea is safety first, then liquidity, and then you ladder your investments so that the liquidity occurs when you need it every two weeks for payroll or whatever it happens to be. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, though, you keep our money safe. You ladder your investment such that it is liquid when we need it and you don't ch chase yield, what is it somebody else could give you? Because that, that's the goal here. I'm not even the slightest bit interested in going with a contractor who is suggesting they can do better on yield. No public agency should be chasing yield. And we're not. Okay. I think that what, we, what I would hope to get is a better ladder. We have a lot of money invested in LAFE right now, yes. and I think that there's a better way that we can balance that so that we keep enough liquid that we really need. I think right. we right now have overestimated that and so kind of dialing that back and getting a more more wide ranging ladder from of, of yield I think is what would make sense for us. I don't think I'm not looking at this as you know all of a sudden it's you know investment returns are going to skyrocket or anything like that but I think it's more than worth it and I honestly think it's it's you know, for me, and it's my, part of my fiduciary responsibility is to make sure that we are getting the best return, we are liquid as we need it, we are following that safety, liquidity, liquidity and yield, that we're doing that. And so part of this is just an exploration, and let, let's just see, is this something that makes sense? But part of it is, I, I do think it's to our benefit to really an, analyze what, how much do we need to have in life, how much do we need to have 
spread out a little bit differently in some of our investments. You and I will not disagree at all that concentration is a bad idea in, in municipal investments. So I, I like hearing we have a lot in LAIF, but we also have money elsewhere. And I, that's prudent investment policy by any public agency. Uh, will this contract uh, come to us, or you do, is that within your authority to undertake that contract? Oh, no, it'll come to you. We haven't gone out for RFP or anything yet. This is just exploratory at this point. But yes, it would come to council. Thank you. One last question. I strongly encourage this TOT collection business to to uh, be undertaken with some level of aggression. Uh, again, when I was the county treasurer, uh, admittedly the technology was different, but uh, I had a summer intern come in who layered three concepts across each other to identify those who were advertising for vacation rentals but not registered with the county, therefore not remitting the TOT. And in one three-month period, this intern was able to increase the county's TOT collection by $1.75 million. There's that many people out there that do this and don't play by the TOT remittance rules. I strongly encourage you to go there. I think there is a there is a, a, an untapped resource, and I think that it is also a constantly changing situation. More people are coming in. Some people go out of it. Some people this. Some people that. But I think more than a sort of one time, a systematic annual effort to push hard on that uh, TOT remittance is a real good idea. And I will come back to you with an analysis of that. We do. It is a constant thing. It is not it is. a one-time, exactly. these are the only people who are collecting TOT or renting out. So we are aware of that, and we do have mechanisms in place to kind of do that, like I said, kind of do a search out there in the, um, in the wide universe um, to find out people who may be posting things and are not registered. So we do have, there is a method to this. It's not just we're sitting there waiting for people to voluntarily report. Yeah. So, um, but I will get back to with more detail about exactly what that is and how that compares to other, other options that we may have for that. Very good, thank you so much. Let me see if there are other questions or comments. Thank you so very much. Uh, you, your department does this is a very compound, complex enterprise, and uh, not all dollars are the same, and uh, they come in different colors and different ways with different strings all over them, and uh, you and your department do an exceptionally fine job in managing our public finances. Thank you for that. Members, we are in the Human Resources Department presentation. Sarah De Leon, our Chief People Officer, will be making the presentation on behalf of the department. Good morning. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you, Mayor. Good, Good. morning, Council Members. Pleasure to be here. I'm honored to present to you on the Human Resources Department budget. Let's see if I clicked it right, Bonnie B. That's a delay, you said. Can I do one more time? Oh, I did it. <laughs> I tried not to. Um, so I'll also be providing you a department overview, which includes a look at our organizational chart and our core services. I will give some highlights of our fiscal year 2023 achievements, as well as go through our proposed fiscal 24 budget, which includes um, some, at least the major changes in that, in that area. So our human resources department is 11 full-time um, equivalent staff. We have three different divisions that you'll see here, starting with our employee and labor relations led by Debbie Jones. We also have recruitment, retention, and classification, which is led by Kathy Benino, and employee benefits by Delia Schultz. The core services in these areas are a variety of things. I won't read everything on here, um, but some of the major items include training and development, diversity, equity, inclusion, onboarding and orientation, classification and compensation studies, as well as management of over 300 different job descriptions, um, employee development, career development, as well as a whole list of employee benefits related to retirement, medical, vision, and dental. I like to think of these three different divisions as, as married to each other, the first two being 
the health, the care and feeding of our staff in their careers, in their day-to-day -day life with us, and then the employee benefits is the, the personal life, right? The other, the health benefits, everything else we otherwise manage for them. Some of our fiscal year achievements for 23, which I will say the clock is not done yet. We are not even in June yet. Um, but some of the major items include employee safety. We have increased um, the safety boot stipend for our service employees and in the adopted uh, temporary contract adopted yesterday, also added that to our temporary service staff at 250. We've also been this year working with risk management, Ross Brandon. Oh, he was, not, he was here to earlier. Um, but we've been going out. He's allowed me to tag along with him to meet people, uh, meet our staff in the field, see the places they're working, and hear directly some of their safety concerns, which will result in some further actions over the next few months. Um, we've also completed woohoo our, our contracts, our negotiations, and get our head above the water for some th certain things there. And we've also made some minor improvements, albeit improvements, to our training and development calendar um, with use of online feedback forms to gain from staff to better inform training programs for the future. Um, change some um, email kind of enrollment to an online form as well for easier collection and centralized training resources, resources offered by other departments within that calendar so staff is more aware of what, what is available to them. Um, on the right here, we have some temporary new hires. Since July 1, we have hired 133 new temp staff, 168 full-time new hires. Um, some of those recruitments are multiple vacancies. I do want to emphasize this point. That's on average about 15 hires per month since July, handled really by one person, Debbie Bailey, in recruitment classification. So I do want to give a shout out to her. While our timing on that can vary from two to six months for hiring, it is a huge feat for one person, and we really appreciate her efforts as well as the other efforts from staff who handle the decentralized hiring from different departments. Um, as you heard yesterday from Johnny and Karen, we've had over 2,600 hours of volunteer support since July as well. I believe that was about 300 plus volunteers that provided that service. We're very grateful for them. Regarding our fiscal year 24 budget, we are a whopping 0.3% of your net general fund budget at $1.82 million. Like many other budgets, 67% of that is our staff at 11 FTEs that you saw. Um, our services and supplies is 30%. Those are things for mo mainly outside consultants, things like our engagement surveys, if we go out for, for diversity and equity inclusion programs, legal support, that's a major chunk of that 30%. And then, of course, our volunteer program, which is three. Regarding changes for fiscal year 24, we are asking for one additional staff to bring us to 12 and increasing very minorly our temporary support. Um, we do have one temporary staff now and we would like to maintain that service for our upfront counter. Um, the major change, if the proposed change would increase um, the FTEs in our employee and labor relations section with an HR analyst is the hope. You may ask why. Um, from that previous list that I showed, employee, employee and labor relations is where our diversity, equity, inclusion program is. It's where employee engagement is. We are really trying to move from more transactional HR to programmatic and holistic services. And building our capacity will allow us to focus in investing in areas of improvement, such as in our people, whether that's safety, our training programs, our processes, moving from email to something more automated to help not just us, but all the other department staff who support us in our decentralized HR services, um, updating policy and also leveraging technology. Um, Elizabeth mentioned the ERP upgrade that also impacts human resources. Um, so that capacity will help us in a number of areas and really have a citywide impact. Um, with that, if you have any questions, I'm available. I'll do the best that I can. Members have questions on this budget item? Ms. Kalantari Johnson. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, looking at the budget, I wonder if you could touch on why, um, specifically on the workers' comp and medical dental vision, the, uh, the FY23 adopted is so different than the end year estimate. Yes, yeah, so that's actually something I'm working on with Elizabeth. We've noticed some of the year end estimates may need some corrections. We'll be looking into to that. I don't know if she has anything to add, but I also noticed that as well. Um, it does seem a little unusual and that we need to correct some errors there. Yeah, especially the medical dental is significant. Right, right. Yeah. Okay, thank you for pointing that out. Further questions 
on this item. Seeing and hearing none, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. Good job. <laughs> thank you to all of your staff who support us. You're one of those departments that is a little bit invisible, right? And uh, we see you in closed session from time to time, but by and large, you folks uh, sort of toil in obscurity, but it isn't it does not go unnoticed or unappreciated by the council. We thank all of your team so very, very much. You're certainly welcome. Good morning. Good morning, Mayor Keeley, Vice Mayor Golder, City Council. My name we is Ken. We are on the information technology budget. Mr. Morgan, how are you today? Doing well, sir, thank you very much. Good. Council members, Ken Morgan, IT Director, City of Santa Cruz. Uh, appreciate your time today. Uh, gonna spend a few minutes talking IT budget. Great, so we'll cover our core services, our accomplishments from the current fiscal year. Uh, we have a quick budget overview for fiscal year 24 and we'll wrap up with some goals. So for those of you that have been uh, present for IT budget presentations in your past, you may recall that we've had some rather significant staffing challenges to the tune of 30 to 35% vacancy uh, for the duration of the last three years, really the entire pandemic. Uh, really happy to report today that within 30 days, I'm anticipating uh, having filled 21 and possibly 22 of our 23 FTEs. So a huge push uh, forward for us. Uh, excited to see the traction we can get for the department and the city and a huge debt of gratitude to our HR department who not only helped us fill these positions, but in my estimation, fill them with really qualified people. So excited to see where we go. With regards to our core services, uh, our divisional support remains the same. Uh, that there is Isaac Steinbrook. He is one of our client services individuals. A lot of smiles, great guy, great customer service. Part of the team that's out there supporting 550 PCs, 200 laptops, uh, all of our mobile devices, voice over IP phones, printers, and really kind of leading with that customer service guidance. Uh, our infrastructure services team is responsible for kind of keeping the electricity on when it comes to our wired and wireless networks. They're kind of the behind the scenes folks. They also manage four data centers citywide. Uh, we have 150 virtual servers in those data centers, networking equipment, and then these are also the folks that are wearing the security hat, whether that's physical access security, uh, cyber security, network security. Our process and application solutions team, as a full service city, you can imagine there's a application for every aspect of service delivery here at the city. So this is the team that supports over 90 applications. There are database administrators, our programmers, uh, they're out there trying to improve process, uh, and then a very project oriented team. We do upgrades, implementations, uh, so a real busy team there. And then last, strategic and admin services, that's myself, uh, a wonderful administrative assistant, Jackie Trumbull, and a project manager, we're doing strategy, personnel, and then uh, obviously today, focus on budget. So real quick, I wanted to highlight some of our accomplishments and again, underscore that despite having some really significant staffing uh, challenges for the last number of years, not only have we sustained operations, but in my estimation, we have really moved the city forward and modernized a lot of applications. Uh, our applications team has upgraded our Tyler cashiering system, our check imaging software system, utility manager. Uh, we have an aggregated payment portal here at the city, my city of Santa Cruz. We made some improvements to that. The community request for service portal, we did a business process improvement on that and we retained staff. Uh, from the infrastructure standpoint, uh, we upgraded our security firewalls. We onboarded a managed security service provider, which is really a partner uh, to help with our cyber posture. Uh, and then you all are uh, likely carrying these cards around now. This is the team that implemented physical access security at the city, and this is the 35th site now that we've completed and added to the standard system. Our client services uh, folks, 6,000 work orders completed, 2,000 phone calls answered at the help desk, replaced 120 PCs, and really uh, we're at the forefront of our M365, our Microsoft 365 project that we led this year, which I'd like to talk about for a second, really a kind of a transformational uh, uh, period for the city. We have traditionally managed all of our email on-premise. We've had our productivity apps, the words, the excels, the, the PowerPoints posted at the city. So we finally moved to a subscription-based model and moved all these to the M365 cloud. We gained better business continuity, advanced security, reliability, but really 
I think the win was collaboration for our employees, the ability to access files and folders uh, and applications from anywhere that has an internet connection. It was a huge lift for the department and a really proud project that we completed. Uh, a lot of effort went up into leading into it, but when the implementation process took place, it was a six-month project. We had staff here every Wednesday night till 10 o'clock, uh, doing 750 installations on workstations so that when staff arrived the next day, there was no dis uh, disruption to service. We moved 850 email accounts. That's 42 million email messages uh, without causing any disruption to service. Uh, we switched to our Santa Cruz CA.gov account and kind of further delineated, delineated us as a government agency. And anyone that wanted training in the city was provided training. We trained 300 staff members. Uh, I think from a return on investment perspective, it's the kind of what did it bring to the city, and that really is increased collaboration. You see that in just 180 days, 200 teams were created, and a team is a virtual workspace where uh, divisions can work on projects or uh, process. You can uh, collaborate on documents, applications, uh, have teams meeting. So excited to see kind of the traction we're getting there. Uh, over 5,000 meetings have taken place. Those are virtual meetings, kind of replacing the Zoom technology. Uh, over 1,300 one-on-one -on -one phone calls, kind of replacing the need to pick up a phone and call somebody. Now we do it through our computer. Uh, 95,000 chat messages, uh, a whole new way to communicate at the city. We're not early adopters to chat, but it's really cool to see how some of that less formal communication can take place on that platform. Uh, and then last is uh, every employee in the city has a OneDrive, and that's a virtual space to share files. And in six months, 321,000 files have been moved to OneDrive that they can access from anywhere and collaborate better with uh, people both internally and externally. Super excited about M365, super excited to see where it kind of takes the city in the next couple of years. Uh, switching to budget, uh, our proposed budget is $6.2 million. Uh, like other departments, about 60% of that is going to our people. Uh, the remaining 42% or $2.5 million is wrapped up in our service supplies, other, and capital outlay. Of that 42%, about $2 million, $2.1 million is going straight to the maintenance and support contracts that the city provides uh, for our applications and hardware. So it leaves kind of a thin slice uh, of about $400,000 for us to kind of strategically update our data center infrastructure, uh, improve applications, and then also rely on professional services for skills that we might not have or in the past three years, uh, people that we did not have. As far as the changes that have taken place, uh, typically we see about a 2 to 3% increase in our contracts for uh, CPI and inflation. This year, it was more along the lines of 7 to 10%, just a, a sign of the times. Uh, and that equates to about $100,000 in increased fees that we needed to kind of absorb into our budget for maintenance and support, et cetera. Uh, no change in personnel services. There's obviously an uptick, but not related to any FTEs that we're adding. So as we look forward to how we absorb this, we'll strategically look at deferring some of our small projects. Uh, we have some deferred maintenance in data centers. We'll make sure that we're taking a risk-adverse approach to uh, maybe passing on replacing equipment that normally would be scheduled for replacement. And then the slight uptick you see in service supplies is a $59,000 increase, and that's specifically for the land management software system that has been discussed by Director Butler. Uh, and for that, we are looking to absorb that through some technology fees that exist, as well as some changes that will be brought to council in the coming weeks. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of our planned projects, but I, again, wanted to highlight the ERP project because this is one that is going to continue to come to you guys uh, for consideration, especially with fund allocation. Uh, at the city, ERP is responsible. It's the backbone of services, utility billing, HR, payroll, uh, accounts payable, purchasing, budget, on and on and on. So really a, a fundamental application. It's now two decades old. It's been announced as end of life in 2027. So a uh, court uh, group of departments, uh, including IT, are endeavoring to get an RFP done this year with an implementation process taking place in fiscal year 25 and fiscal year 26. Some other exciting projects up there. I won't go through all the details. Happy to take questions. Mr. Morgan, thank you very much. And I think I speak on behalf of all of us. Thank you every day, every hour, every minute uh, for the fine work of your department. When If we don't have that, the work of, and the products of your department, it all comes to a grinding halt. So thank you very, very much. Let me see if there are questions. Vice Mayor is recognized. 
I just have one question. What's a virtual server? So in the old days, we used to have mainframes, uh, and it was a single server that supplied applications for um, multiple facets. So uh, then we moved to these physical individual servers. Now what we do is we buy a big rack of hard drives, of RAM, of processing power, and we can actually install individual Microsoft Windows servers on there. So one appliance can hold 150 servers. Each one of those servers has a specific functionality for uh, a business application or you know, something network related. So it's really just a, an aggregate of uh, servers where we used to buy a single function server for everything. Now it sits all in this big bank of array of uh, hard drives, RAM, et cetera. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome to come to the data center to take a preview if you ever want to see it in person. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Council Member Watkins. I just have like a, a quick question around your opinions and thoughts around AI and just how that's starting to be integrated. And I mentioned this to Matt. <laughs> Um, and he joked with me to check with ChatGPT, but nonetheless, <laughs> think, um, it's going to start changing um, many things. And I'm wondering, in terms of your opinion, and as you know, our IT director, how you think that could impact city services. I don't think that the city should be early adopters to AI. Uh, Microsoft, I just got back from a conference and is pushing AI heavily. They have a product called Copilot that's going to basically uh, partner up with all the applications we use every day day from Microsoft Word to Excel or whatever. Uh, I think there's some benefits with AI that we can use today, um, similar to Teams can actually go through and notate uh, and meetings as they're narrated out and, and provide that. But I think uh, it's very early on in, in the AI world and I think there's a lot of concerns about um, being early adopters and getting into a position where we might be putting ourselves at risk for some of the, the capabilities. It's exciting. I use ChatGPT every single day. Uh, so I, I absolutely understand what we're kind of on, uh, what we're sitting on. But I, I think uh, we need to kind of see what the municipality space is doing before we kind of run to the finish line. It's more of a crawl, walk, run. And and and, and if I'm hearing you correctly, there's also conversation happening within city jurisdictions or your industry, if you will. There are. I'm a part of, I'm a part of a, a MESAC group, which is the, the California Information Services Divisions, and they're already talking about policies and preventing ChatGPT from you know, becoming too integrated for all the reasons that really relate to we don't know what we don't know quite yet. Right, exactly. Okay, well, great. I mean, I, I, I'd love to understand more as that unfolds. I think it Me will too. happen quickly, right? Yeah. So I think we already have a lot of interest for the Teams component to be able to kind of narrate out you know, meeting notes so that we don't have to have that and we can refer back to that for people right. that missed a meeting or want to go back and kind of grab that. So I think that's some low lying fruit, but yeah. we'll see. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Council Member Bruner. That was a great question. Was and a good question. Um, thank you for, for that answer. Um, I, I guess my, I kind of have a comment, but. Um, the system side of, of things and security side of things. Uh, and you mentioned our, our key cards and whatnot. And I just want to applaud the modernization that I have pushed for and you have executed on since I came in 2020. Um, that has really made it a more secure and um, efficient, uh, um, all the facilities and the processes, the emails and the integration, and all along the way, the customer service from your staff, including Isaac that was pictured there, has been so excellent um, and helpful. Um, so I'm really happy to, to see you know, where the workload indicators and performance measures are and how that's broken down and um, the allocation of where the spending is and to see that we still have the upcoming projects and that it's still continuing to improve. Um, so the cybersecurity as well, and that's a huge one. Um, you know, I even received some emails from Mayor Fred Keeley that were not Mayor Fred Keeley. That was pretty scary, and your team was right on it. Um, so thank you so much 
for all of this work. I Welcome guess I don't you. really have a question specifically. Those are my favorite kinds of questions. Yeah. <laughs> for the questions, comments. Thank you so very, very much. I return to my initial comments. Uh, without the work that you do and your staff, this place would come to a grinding halt. And that's true of virtually all departments, uh, but you are connecting all of us to each other irrespective of department or function and the ability to keep this up and running. Another comment is, uh, thanks to your staff, when you live next door to the heart and soul of the technology industry, my guess is, is that uh, recruiting folks to work in local governments uh, is a challenge. And to get high quality folks who will choose public service over stock options and whatnot, which is a perfectly legitimate choice either way, but the folks who do choose this should be thanked because they are taking uh, in their career uh, a chance where perhaps they won't make as much. Uh, but what they will get is that reward of working with a public agency. Uh, if they can't do uh, well, they can at least do good. And we do the best we can to compensate them. I understand that. But recruiting and retaining in your field, given who we are next door to, I suspect is a challenge. And the ability consistently to retain good talent. Uh, is uh, really, I think, a compliment both to you, uh, but it is also a compliment to each and every one of your staff. And they're not unaware of that, and they've chosen public service, and for that we are, we are very grateful. Thank you. I Thank you, that. sir. We are on the police department budget. Chief Bush is here to present on behalf of the department. Chief, good morning. Morning, Mayor. Nice to see you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Uh, just on behalf of the Chief of Police, uh, unfortunately couldn't be here this afternoon, uh, but representing for him, uh, I just want to thank you for your time, and we're happy to present our 2024 fiscal budget uh, to you guys this morning. Um, this uh, wouldn't have been possible without our principal management analyst, Catherine Brothers, who's behind me here. She's new to the position, but not new to the organization. Uh, so she's been our PMA for the past six months and has just done incredible work at getting caught up to speed and uh, finalizing a lot of projects that we needed to complete it. So uh, very happy to have her, and you'll probably see her more going forward uh, meetings in the future. I uh, just want to recognize that uh, it was National Police Week earlier this month, and want to thank the mayor personally for the proclamation that you gave, uh, recognizing the services of our men and women that are out there doing the job 24-7. So, again, we appreciate that, and, and thank you for the time in recognizing our agency. All right, so we'll go ahead and get started then. Uh, we'll kind of breeze through this to try and save time, but if you have any questions through or after, please feel free to let me know, and I can expand on anything in particular. Uh, just the agenda that we have lined up for this morning, we'll talk briefly about our core services. We'll go over our organizational chart, uh, speak about current and past workload indicators, uh, talk about some of the major achievements and accomplishments that we did in 2023, then speak briefly about uh, our goals going forward for next fiscal year, and talk about our 2024 proposed budget. All right, so core services, we, uh, we basically have about 11 major functions that uh, represent the agency and serve our, our city. Uh, the biggest being our police patrol uh, division. Those are your uniforms, your men and women taking 911 calls, being out on the streets 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, that represents a good chunk of what we do, about 50% of our organization. Uh, supporting that, we have a traffic division now, which consists of four full-time traffic officers, two during the day, two during the evening. We have a property and evidence section. Currently, we have two uh, employees assigned to that, but we're allocated for three, looking up to pick up that third one shortly. Uh, they are responsible for the intake and storing and uh, 
uh, of thousands and thousands of pieces of evidence, found property, narcotics, guns, uh, incredible amount of uh, stuff that comes in uh, throughout the day. Uh, so alongside that, we have a, uh, we're fortunate enough to have a lieutenant and a training manager assigned full-time just to our training division. Um, we're a very younger department nowadays, and so we're fortunate that we have two people full-time that are committed to just looking at current and best training practices, getting us the best instructors here, uh, just providing the best training program we can have uh, so that we have the most highly trained and effective officers out in the field. A little off to the right is our volunteer program. Uh, Joyce Blaschke, our communications relations specialist, was instrumental in developing that and getting it to where it is today. Uh, we'll speak a little bit more of that later on, but it's just been a tremendous uh, asset to us in records, uh, in the field, in downtown. Um, I'm just very grateful to have them. Another core component to our services is our investigations division. When we're fully staffed, we have a lieutenant, two sergeants, eight full-time detectives uh, that are responsible for following up on cases. Uh, we're also fortunate to be the only agency in the county that has a full-time victim advocate to serve victims of violent crime within our community. Uh, so that falls under that as well. Um, records division is kind of the backbone of our agency. They take phone calls, they house, they store all things that we write, we cite, uh, we do. Tremendous amount of paperwork, tremendous amount of undertaking. Uh, we couldn't live without them, but uh, they are a key component to what we do. Uh, full time, we have a records manager and eight records technicians. Community services, uh, that's kind of where our homeless services response team falls under. Um, right now we have a sergeant and two officers committed to the homeless services response team. Next to that we have a school resource officer. We generally like to have two or three, but we're, because the staffing levels, we currently have one. Uh, it's currently Trevor Kendall. He's been doing it for a few years and does an amazing job. Uh, downtown, uh, we're looking to rebuild that program as staffing levels increase. We currently have six community service officers attached to that, uh, three each day uh, on both sides of the week. Uh, but looking to expand upon that as our numbers get back up. And then, of course, administration division, where the chief of police, myself, professional standards, principal management analyst, uh, and community relations are uh, housed out of as well. And just to give you a brief overview of the organizational structure of our agency, of course, we're led by Chief Escalante. Uh, then underneath that, we kind of separate our department into two divisions operations on the left there, which is led by Deputy Chief Garcia, and then administrations on the right, which is myself. Um, the operations division is basically your uniform response, your 24-7, your in-the-field officers, and administration is all your support staff, support services, uh, budget, investigations. And I'll just talk briefly a little bit about each division, and just let me know if you have any questions. But under Jose Garcia, we have uh, four uh, but lieutenants assigned to operations, uh, Lieutenant Wes Morey, who oversees our mobile field force, our traffic division, and all of eight side uh, patrol. Next to that is Lieutenant Dan Forbes. He oversees our mental health liaison program. We currently have two full-time mental health liaisons deployed in the field, uh, responding with us or in place of uh, to mental health crises. Uh, he also oversees our hostage and crisis negotiation team, and then the other half of our patrol side, which is the B side. Uh, just for reference, we kind of separate our, our department into two sides, an A side, which is Sunday to Wednesday, and then a B side, which is Wednesday to Saturday. Next to that is Lieutenant Carter Jones. We're fortunate to have a full-time lieutenant assigned just to community services, and under that is, of course, the downtown and the homeless response unit. And directly next to him is Lieutenant Greg Crofts, who was a full-time assigned to our field training program, our overall department training, as well as our emergency services unit and our canine unit as well. So that's pretty much all the operational side. Those are the uniforms, those are the men and women you see out in the street every day, uh, handling the calls, doing the work. And then not as exciting on the right side is administration where I oversee, and that basically will include your investigations division. Right now we're currently short a lieutenant, so I kind of fill in for that at the moment. But normally we'd have a lieutenant, uh, two sergeants, eight detectives, and a victim advocate. Uh, between the, uh, all of those individuals, they're responsible for following up on all persons, property crimes, sex crimes, domestic violence, missing persons, uh, anything that a patrol officer can't handle or resolve at that moment in the field will get sent up to investigators to follow up on. Our property and evidence unit falls under that, uh, as well as our school resource officer 
and we contribute one officer to a county task force um, agency, uh, county, county anti-crime task force agency. So we contribute one officer to that. Then uh, just shortly after the right, also falls under administration as our community relations specialist, Joyce Blasky, our records manager, Megan Patsky, uh, our internal affairs or our professional standards unit, uh, Sergeant Eric Hoppe, and then Catherine Brothers, uh, our principal management analyst. So that kind of breaks down the organizational structure uh, of our agency as it is today. And talking about some workload indicators, um, looking at the past three years, it's a little hard to kind of get a good grab on, a good, a good handle on workload indicators because of uh, COVID, the 2020 shift and national narrative on policing, uh, our staffing issues that we're currently experiencing. Uh, but it does uh, give you at least uh, about a three-year period of reports written, traffic citations written, general municipal code infraction citations, uh, arrests of adults, and calls for service. Um, generally speaking, everything is kind of on a decline at the moment. Uh, and like I said, mainly that was uh, COVID in 2020. And then, uh, unfortunately, uh, the current staffing crisis that we're under right now being short about 30% uh, of our patrol uh, sworn officers uh, out there in the field uh, equates to, obviously, less reports written, less traffic citations issued, and less arrests made. Uh, but uh, as one of our many priorities, uh, we've been increasing those numbers, and we hope to continue to increase those numbers and get uh, those numbers back up. Now, with those numbers being down, uh, we are still uh, adequately and ready to respond to 911 calls, emergency calls, 24-7, where we end up taking those, uh, those, def those lack of officers is from our specialized units. Uh, normally, our downtown unit would be bigger. Normally, our traffic unit would be bigger. Our investigation division would be bigger. We would have a, a sergeant, a four-person, four-officer uh, street crimes team. Uh, so right now, all those units are either temporarily suspended or decreased in order to uh, make sure that we provide 24-7 service to the community. All right, talk briefly about some accomplishments for 2023. Um, the chief has mentioned before, I think, his priorities are obviously staffing first and foremost. Um, it's gotten better but there's still a lot of room for improvement. Like I said, we could use about 15 more to get up to full staffing. We are about down six community service officers. We're still short a couple of uh, non-sworn administrative staff. Uh, so we've increased, got better, but still looking to build upon those uh, as we go forward. Um, Chief has spent a lot of focus on uh, retention and well-being of our officers. Uh, the well-being mentally, physically of our officers, their family is a priority. Uh, in order for them to be successful and be safe out on the job, they need to be physically and mentally in a good state of mind. And we've really, uh, the chief has really focused on uh, internal wellness and, and taking care of the employee uh, so that we can in turn go out and take care of the community. The chief has uh, uh, really driven home a more service-oriented philosophy for our, uh, our officers out there. Um, really prides ourselves on trying to be out there, deliver the best service possible. So we're um, really fortunate um, to have Chief Escalante, and um, you know, like I said, uh, the numbers are down, but we're we're, we're tracking better, in a better direction. Uh, so again, uh, with the accomplishments, uh, just some notable events is that uh, we've been able to dedicate two full-time CSOs and a sergeant to the interdepartmental homeless response team. Our uh, amazing volunteer program has contributed over 4,300 hours of service to our department, to our city, from working the front counter, assisting records, handling calls, uh, patrolling the downtown, uh, assisting with vehicle abatement. Uh, that's just 4,300 free hours that were given by these amazing men and women uh, that definitely help us achieve our, our mission. We've uh, enhanced our recruitment efforts. Uh, just in 2023 alone, we hired 26 officers. That seems like a lot, uh, but at the same time, we continue to lose some either through retirement or competing with other agencies over the hill that pay a little bit more uh, in the Silicon Valley area. 
Uh, this is a difficult job. It always has been. It always will be. But in the last couple of years, because of the public narrative and some changes in legislation, it's become even more difficult. So we're not seeing the influx of people wanting to be law enforcement officers like we did 20-something years ago when I started. There was two, 300 people showing up for you know one position, and, and now I probably get maybe six or seven a month. And we don't lower our standards. Uh, so of those six or seven that come through a month, we're lucky if we maybe get one that makes it all the way through. Uh, so, but yeah, people are getting out of the business earlier nowadays, uh, as soon as they can, or looking for other, other career options. It's a dangerous job. Uh, it's a difficult job. It's a stressful job. Um, but, uh, just not a big demand for the, for the career anymore. So it's, uh, difficult to retain, difficult to attract. Uh, but like I said, we're heading in a, in a better direction. Our records division processed over 778 public records requests from the public. Uh, tremendous amount of undertaking, tremendous amount of work. Uh, we've been able to commit uh, four officers full-time to our traffic enforcement team to enhance traffic safety measures. And we've also been enhancing, like I said, our department's wellness program and really focusing on the mental well-being, the physical well-being of our staff. So those are just some of the accomplishments that uh, we wanted to highlight for 2023. Going forward for 2024, uh, again, we kind of want to improve our organizational capacity uh, to be able to support our sworn and non-sworn staff. We really need to increase our numbers. Uh, so that's a major goal as we continue forward in 2024. Another big goal, which was, I believe, recently approved by the council last night, is the ability to purchase new uh, hand pack radios for all of our officers. The ones we have now are outdated, antiquated. Uh, they're just no longer uh, up with today's technology. Uh, so we will be purchasing 120 new handheld radios, each one for each one of our uh, uh, sworn staff. Uh, so that'll be coming in the next month or two. Uh, we are redeploying and rebuilding upon our specialized units uh, throughout the community, including the downtown, looking to increase our numbers that, uh, of officers that we have on Pacific Avenue, looking to build upon our numbers in our traffic unit, uh, also looking to create and develop uh, more units and specialized teams that we've temporarily had to suspend due to staffing levels. So we're really hoping that as our numbers ingress, as our numbers increase, those special teams will come back online. Uh, continue to support successful recruitment and retention strategies. Uh, you know, can't speak about that enough. Uh, just trying to recruit and retain people is, is, is probably the biggest challenge we have, uh, and it will be continue to be our goal for 2024. Uh, we've invested in commercials, social media, advertisement, uh, incentive strategies just to try and really develop or try to retain and attract the most successful and talented people we have. And without reducing our lowering our standards, it is often difficult. Uh, and then again, just uh, continue to uh, take care of the wellness, the well-being uh, in, of our um, employees is a priority. And then finally, uh, uh, continue with the work that uh, the chief has done uh, with the city manager's office and public works and the, uh, the start of the integrated of the health response team, the CAHOOTS model, as we move forward. Okay. This is just kind of a snapshot of our budget for 2024. As you're aware, we have a pretty much a status quo budget. Uh, not much is changing, uh, although just to highlight, you know, you'll see that our personnel costs are a big chunk, uh, almost three quarters of what our, our budget represents to a tune of about 24 million. Uh, the other six million falls under services and supplies. And then because of the new CAP program, we're gonna see an additional 3,182,000 added to our budget uh, to cover that. Uh, so our budget does increase by a little over three million, but that's just to incorporate the money that's now given to us through the CAP program. But other than that, uh, we're a status quo budget for 2024. The next slide is just kind of a, uh, a pie chart, a snapshot of our funds by activity. Uh, if you're able to read that, uh, <laughs> I apologize, but uh, pretty much shows is the patrol, our uniform, men and women represent about 50% of our budget. Um, their personnel services come in around 14 million and the other services uh, fall around 2 million. Uh, but really patrol is a significant part of, uh, of the expenses that you, you folks allocate to us to be able to provide the personnel 24 seven 
to have enough officers, enough non-sworn and sworn staff to be able to protect and serve this community 24-7. Uh, to the left, it breaks down a little bit more as far as um, administration division, our records division, our investigations division, our community services, our traffic division, and then that small little orange slice represents our homeless response uh, money that's allocated for that division as well. That just kind of gives you a little pie chart of how that 30 something million is allocated to us every year. And just to break down, uh, not including the personnel expenses, but just to talk about our non-labor expenses. Um, this is just a, uh, a graph to show where the, uh, the non-labor expenses come from. Uh, starting at the top, the most predominant is our uh, fees that we pay to our NETCOM Regional 911 Center uh, to have 24 seven uh, dispatchers, people answering 911 calls, we contribute a little over $2 million to that. That's probably our biggest uh, non-personnel operating expense. Followed by that is our small tools and equipment, uh, and then vehicle leases, uh, training, which is huge. Um, the better trained uh, you know, officers we have, uh, the less likely they're to make mistakes, uh, the better service they're providing, the safer they're going to be out there. Uh, so really, training is a huge component uh, of what we need. And then it kind of breaks down into safety, clothing, building facilities, uh, evidence, office supplies, radio equipment, and uh, various other programs that uh, uh, we spend money on every year. Um, so with that, uh, happy to take any questions uh, from council. Chief, thank you very, very much. We very much appreciate it. We appreciate the work that the women and men of the Santa Cruz Police Department perform, both sworn and civilian. We're so grateful. I will now ask members if you have questions. We'll start with Ms. Bruner. Ms. Bruner. Thank you for that report and the information and all the work that you and your department does. And thank you to your new PMA. Um, my question, if you could, uh, I have a couple questions. One is the sexual assault nurse that in the non-labor um, uh, graph that you showed, does every jurisdiction and the county pay for a sexual assault nurse and where do they live at the ER or what it, can you talk about that a little more? Yeah, thank you, Council Member Son. Uh, great question. Yes, so we do, uh, every agency within the county uh, contributes a percentage based on their population or service needs to the countywide sexual assault program. Uh, and what that entails is that when we have a victim of a sexual assault, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, there's a forensic sexual assault nurse examiner uh, on call to perform a, a forensic exam uh, of the survivor. Uh, so they basically do an evidentiary exam of the survivor, collect evidence, <clears throat> obtain information, and package that up and later for us to use uh, during a criminal prosecution of the suspect. Uh, so that, pro that those fees incorporate the, the personnel costs, the uh, infrastructure costs, uh, the supply costs to support that program that's a countywide program. Uh, and yes, each, each agency contributes a portion to support that program. Great, thank you. Um, and then grants, I know recently we had a new um, equipment um, uh, presented to us that needed to be approved under the military equipment, the bot, and it was purchased with a grant. And I'm just curious, you may not know now, but um, how often grants uh, are able to be accessed, and, and do you have someone that regularly goes after grants, and how does that play into the budget? Yeah, great question. Uh, so we do try and capitalize on any grant opportunities that there are. Uh, as with all grants, they do come with work, reporting, right. uh, gathering, and take some time uh, to manage. So we generally will look for the ones that are going to be most beneficial for us that we are able to successfully uh, implement and comply with the regulations. Uh, so currently, PMA Brothers would be our person that uh, has been and continues to look for grant opportunities. Anything we can do to offset the, the cost from the general budget to uh, uh, enhance our abilities to do our job, we're definitely looking forward 
we look for. Uh, and like I said, each one that comes up, we just kind of weigh the value of it. Is it going to be to our benefit? Can we uh, handle and absorb the requirements uh, that are set forth in it? And then we apply for it. And uh, I know we've gotten uh, a few recently as well, and we continue to look for, for all available options. Great. Um, my next question is regarding uh, calls for service and that decline. And I remember in our strategic planning uh, day, um, there were a couple of factors attributed to that. And so when we, when we look at our budget and dollar amounts and staffing, I have a hard time associating it directly with calls for service um, because I know there are other reasons um, for that decline. And for example, CRISP, the Community Request for Service portal, that has increased. Our online reporting portal has in increased, but it still requires staffing to manage that from what I understand. But is that a different level of staffing than that? required to manage those? What have you seen on, on how does that affect the staffing, the type of position needed? Yeah, good question. So the, uh, yeah, as you notice, the, the calls for service have gone down and a lot of that is contributed to, uh, we have an online reporting system. Uh, we've uh, continued to uh, put out to the public where they have the opportunity to, uh, if they just need to make a police report, there's no suspect information, not gonna pr require uh, extensive investigative follow-up, the caller will be referred to the online reporting system to make a report online, which wouldn't generate a call for service. Uh, like I said, we just generally, those are for property crimes, no suspect information, uh, people just need a case number to document for insurance or property purposes. So we end up uh, deferring a lot to those. Uh, like you said, a lot goes to the CRISP app as well. And then just with the reduction of staffing that we have out there also translates then to uh, less calls for service. Uh, if we have more officers out there, we have more proactive units, we have more officers uh, on motors, more officers downtown, that's gonna generate more proactivity, more calls for service, and so with our Current numbers being down, uh, the actual calls for service are also going to reflect a lot of that based on the, the less proactive abilities we have to be out there at the moment. Okay, that makes sense. Um, the community service officer program and staffing, um, is it easier to recruit for those positions since they're not sworn positions and maybe, you know, they don't carry a firearm? So. I'm just curious how what you see is um, in terms of recruitment and staffing so. with sworn police officers versus community service officers. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I currently oversee hiring and recruiting. And yes, as I've seen lately, uh, a little bit easier and a little more in the community service officer applicants. Uh, we see both. We see people that just want to come and serve their community in the form of a community service officer. And then we also see people that want to have an interest in being a law enforcement officer at some day and they use that as a stepping stone into becoming a law enforcement officer down the road. Uh, our standards are pretty much consistent as CSOs but some of the requirements uh, are different. Uh, the less training, uh, there's no six-month academy, uh, some of the background uh, requirements are a little different so it um, plus the age limit is lower for a CSO than a police officer so we're able to cast kind of a more wider net of applicants that would be available for a CSO position than people uh, for a police officer position. It's a non-sworn, you don't carry firearm, uh, you generally don't work nights, uh, albeit the pay is less, but it's uh, less uh, dangerous um, and a little more appealing to people that are looking to serve their community, but not necessarily or graveyards uh, engage in the violent and dangerous acts that a police officer does on a daily basis. So it's a little more appealing to a lot more people. Also, it's open to people 18 and over versus police officers 21 and over. Mm -hmm. That's good to hear. Um, and um, I also have a minor uh, language 
thing, and maybe it's um, an Elizabeth question, but um, under workload indicators, it says fall 20, fiscal year 2024 goal. And I'm having a hard time. I know that might be standard um, accounting there, but I would like to see a different word than goal for number of arrests and number of citations. I would hope you don't have a goal of increasing citations and arrests, <laughs> but more of like a prediction or an estimate. Um, I think that language really matters with this department um, to kind of call that out. So um, on page 183 where it, where it has all the different columns in comparing the different years and um, having a, a goal for arrests and citations yeah, I absolutely agree. Uh, we don't have goals for arrests. We don't have quotas for citations. Um, matter. I mean, it, it would be a great world if we didn't have to make any arrests or write any citations. So the less, the better. Uh, you know, we but we do not put a goal or a uh, a quota on any enforcement type activity. Okay, good to hear. Thank you. Um, and then I think. That was it for my questions, and just thank you to you and your department. I know that um, I get to see working downtown. I get I get to see a lot of community service officers um, in action. I see your police volunteers in action downtown and at the wharf, and that is a wonderful community program. Um, they really embody. Um, community um, engagement and um, policing and presence in a way that um, is very welcoming and very helpful to everyone around and visitors and residents. And so I'm happy that, um, that I don't know specifically their volunteers, but I know that there is a cost associated with running that program and uniforms and supplies and whatnot, and I'm happy to see that continue. I think that's a very important program, and the CSOs as well. I think it's a lower cost, but a great value for both of those programs to be part of your department. And um, I would also, in, in, in the budget, I'm wondering if the Citizens Police Academy um, is reflected for 2024, and if, if you can speak, if there, are, if you know, if there are any plans for that to happen again um, in the course of the next year. I know there was a English and a Spanish version, and um, I know that has been well attended. I know I've attended two of them. It's very enriching and very eye-opening, and always attended by various. Um, community members, seniors, youth, neighborhood um, uh, people, people interested in knowing and understanding how, how the department operates. And um, um, I, I just wonder if that's reflected in the budget as well. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it is. That was one of the chief priorities is bringing back the Citizens Academy, both English and Spanish, as well as the Teen Academy. Uh, we anticipate to host those again this year. Uh, we really find it's one of the best tools to educate our community on what we do, uh, to be transparent and open on how we do things. And the more people we can get through that program to connect with our agency, to really see you know, what we do on a day in and day out basis uh, is both you know, great for the community and great for us. And the more trust, the more transparency that we have with the community, the easier it is for us to do our job, the better we can do our job. And so, yes, those are priorities, and they will continue to be so. Great. Thanks for reflecting that in the budget. And one last thing, a goal that um, just to call out, like in other departments, especially for this department, is um, DEI goals and really making sure that um, that communication is there, that officers are receiving and continuing to receive that training and really making that um, transparent that that is a priority and constantly improving um, that. And also on the flip side, I'm very happy to see that 
the priority for the officers themselves to receive um, uh, mental health and well-being training. I think both of those are very, very high-level priorities for this department, and I'm happy to see that reflected in this budget. Great. I appreciate your kind words, and I'll pass them along. Thank you, Thank you so much. Council Member Brown. Mayor, thank you, uh, Deputy Chief Bush. Uh, it was great to hear the overview. And I actually am just f wanted to follow up on Council Member Bruner's uh, kind of points and, and questions around the workload indicators and performance measures because I was ready to say, you know, I, it, I don't think that any of us would agree that these are goals, um, but it is within the standard framework for this budget. So I understand. Um, why, how it, why it's um, laid out in this way, and I do think that thinking about that language would really be helpful, so thank you for that. Um, I, I want, I'm assuming that the, the goals here, or the um, projections of uh, cit potential citations, arrests, and reports written is, um, the increase is related to your um, expectation that you will end up, you will get closer to that full staffing. Well, I, I, it feels weird to even say closer to full staffing because you're you have there's that you are so challenged, and I I really understand and appreciate that um, challenge. Um, but you're think you're thinking that this means you're going to have more sworn officers on the streets, and that's why those numbers are higher. That's my guess. Yeah, eventually the um, as our numbers increase, uh, so will our abilities to staff proactive units. And with proactive units will come proactive enforcement, uh, neighborhood engagement, uh, problem solving, uh, any and all efforts to try and increase the quality of life and improve public safety. And you know, with our job, enforcement always isn't the answer. A citation or arrest doesn't always, isn't what we always look to solve the problem, but sometimes it is. And so, with that work that we do, uh, you know, absent working with other agencies, other resources, other departments. Enforcement is a component, and that will tend to go up as our staffing levels increase. And like I said, it's not a goal of ours to increase arrests or citations. It would actually be great if we saw them go down, uh, but we don't have a goal to increase it at all. Gotcha. Yeah, that's that's what I I, I was thinking that it, this was being hopeful about the um, the number of folks that you can you can have um, on patrol, and all, as well for, under performance measures the increase of officer initiated calls um, meaning that you're have the ability you have the resources and the staffing to be proactive is that's what that's about that's what I assumed just wanted to check thank you um, and then my last question is who took that incredible photo <laughs> for your title slide we also have it in our budget it's just like this really cool photo of all these police vehicles with the sunset and I, I just it's it, it's not really a question I need an answer to but I it's like Whoever thought of it, uh, it's a great one. Well, it wasn't staged, but it did turn out quite nicely. Uh, uh, EMA Brothers found that. We do have a volunteer photographer. I'm not sure if it came from him or not. Uh, so it'll be Steve, where a lot of our pictures come from, but it uh, did turn out quite nicely, so thank you. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you so much for the presentation and all of the great work. Um, I have just a few questions. Um, looking at that slide where it was the org chart, uh, and you mentioned the investigative lieutenant has been vacant. Can you share how long it's been va vacant and what strategies we're using to fill that position? Yeah, thank you. Uh, that position's probably been vacated for about a year and a half since uh, Chief Mills retired. Uh -huh. uh, and I currently oversee both positions. Um, we anticipate or hope to end, uh, have that filled within the next few months. Okay. Uh, you know, having sworn officers on the street 24-7 to answer the priority calls is the priority. Yeah. Uh, so if we're looking for an area where we can make a sacrifice uh, with a body or two, uh, an administrative uh, supervisor or manager is probably where we're going to take that so we can make sure that we have enough officers on the streets. Uh, so right now I kind of do dual role. The two investigative sergeants that oversee investigations are fairly competent and experienced. So between the three of us, mm -hmm. we fill in that gap as the uh, investigative lieutenant position. Uh, but the chief, if staffing continues to project an increase uh, as we're hoping this year, uh, look to fill that within a couple of months. Okay, makes sense. Sounds like a lot of work for you. <laughs> 
Um, so in our packet, the org chart shows a CPVAW liaison. Um, I didn't see that reflected in the chart um, in your slides, and I'm wondering if you could just touch on who that is, where that is, what their role is. Well, you're talking to them. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> well, hello. Uh, yes, I have a lot of roles, but thankfully I have a lot of great people that I work with that help support me and, and accomplish the things we need to do. Uh, so normally the investigative lieutenant would be the uh, CATVA liaison, uh, but since I'm in a dual role at the moment, uh, I take that on as well. Uh, Catherine Brothers assists me with uh, some statistical data and crime and trend data. Uh, so yes, I will uh, represent the police agency at all their meetings, provide updates, trends, uh, programs, initiatives that we're doing to help assist the, uh, the commission in their ultimate goal of reducing violence against women. Okay, so similar question, I, and you probably have a similar response. Um, CSEC, Commercial Sexual Exploitation of Children. I know some um, larger uh, police departments have CSEC, uh, someone dedicated to CSEC. Um, so is, is, that, is it the same, I assume, that we have folks from our investigative team that just respond to that? At, and I wanna just add that I know that Chief Escalante was key in adding CSEC training into the training modules a couple of years ago. Yes, thank you. So we do have uh, our investigation division is, is comprised of highly experienced trained officers. And we have a couple with an emphasis and a more intense training background on crimes against children. Mm -hmm. uh, so 24 hours a day, seven days a week, we do have an investigator that's available to respond and provide those investigative services to uh, children of violent or sexual assault crimes. Uh, we also uh, are a part of a countywide uh, uh, multidisciplinary interview center mm -hmm. uh, where we contribute uh, as run by the sheriff's office, but it's a specially designed location and program to, uh, to interview children of violent crimes or sexual assaults uh, on a level, a more comfortable environment that uh, they can mm -hmm. open up in. Okay, great. Thank you. Wait, a couple more questions. Yes, ma'am. Um, so looking at the budget, um, I see in the co police community services, I'm sorry if you already touched on this, but the adopted budget of FY23 at 1.5 million and the year end estimate at um, 881,000. Just wondering if you could touch on what, what that discrepancy is. Yeah, for that particular number of question, I'll turn over to Catherine Brothers Great. here. She can probably speak a little bit more to that. Oh yeah, one page one eighty four. Maybe as she's getting she's, up, all while she's looking, I can take other questions and then we can come yeah, back to that one. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, and and you can get back to us later too if that's easier. Um, okay, let's see. I have just two more comments, questions. Um, I know that that SCPD and fire have been working on uh, evacuation response and protocols, and there was an app that. Um, was being developed, maybe it's already been developed. I can't remember now the name of the app or where it's at. Safe so, Haven or uh, Zone Haven, I'm sorry. Zone Haven, thank you. So just to note that that is either an accomplishment or a goal to accomplish that um, I would hope to have noted, because um, I know that it was a lot of work to put all that together and maybe it's still in progress, but um, be great to see that here. Yeah, Fire did a phenomenal job and took the lead on getting that implemented and rolled out the last couple of years. And uh, we've been slowly getting trained and updated on its use and integrating it uh, with our agency as well. Uh, but yes, a, a great program to have and thankful for Fire for rolling that out and uh, getting that going. But uh, we continue to train uh, yearly on it as well. Okay, great. Um, RBS, Responsible Beverage Services Training, I know that our police department used to do in collaboration with county uh, substance use prevention. Is that, um, I didn't see it anywhere reflected. Is that something that is just handled by the state or the county now? There we go, I'm sorry, to alcohol? Re responsible Beverage Services Trainings, yeah. Yes, yeah, so um, when we're full staffed, we will generally assign one officer full time to uh, alcohol beverage enforcement. Uh, who will uh, not only regulate uh, all the licenses and establishments within the city, but they will also provide ongoing training to uh, people that serve or uh, alcohol mm -hmm. uh, through the LEADS program right. uh, and make sure that uh, you know, uh, they're educated and informed on best practices to make sure that they're not over-serving people or serving underage people. 
Uh, that is a program we have. It's just currently not staffed at the moment uh, due to our, our staffing shortage. Okay, it's not staffed at the moment. Um, 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 okay, so just last point in picking up on what Council Member Bruno was saying around uh, the decline in calls for service and, and why that might be. I think it would be important to show that full picture in the stats that we show. So showing the CRIS numbers and the online numbers so that we can see you know, we've seen a decline for calls for service, but we've seen an increase here. So just to have the full picture when we have the um, stats before us would be helpful. Yeah, thank you. We actually do have that uh, just to, we, our, our presentation was pretty big and then we tried to condense it sure, down. Of course. Uh, but we're happy to uh, provide that to you. Okay. Those were my questions and if we need to get back to the other um, point, that's fine. Good morning. Uh, the discrepancy between the actual um, the number and the what is budgeted is simply because we just don't have uh, as many personnel. Okay. So we're budgeted for 13. We currently have 11. And it's just in that salary savings and employee benefits is where you see the difference. But we have uh, fully expended all the other uh, services and supply uh, funds that were available to us this year. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Watkins. Great. Thank you. Hello. Thank you for the presentation. That was actually my question in regards to sort of the salary savings that I know you're budgeting, I think. My understanding is you're budgeting for full staffing, but essentially not able to meet that. And so what we're seeing is that you're unable to to meet that, and that's where that salary savings, that's where that difference goes. And then how, um, and maybe this is, how are those salary savings? Are those rolled back up into our general fund and general or what then happens to those dollars and maybe that's a question for you matt or someone else it's like somebody's getting called up to take that one for me <laughs> yeah. oh there she is <laughs> they are general fund dollars but i will ask elizabeth to come up and speak to you, uh what happens with those salary savings when we have vacancies so hello again um so any budget items that are not spent in the general fund they basically it goes back to fund balance. They're then available for appropriation for something else. So you don't see it as a specific, like a transfer or anything like that. But if it's not, if it's budgeted and not used, then it's available later, like the next year, to be used for other appropriations. Next year. Okay, I see. Okay, thank you. Um, and then I just wanted to um, ap appreciate that you put a a measurable performance measure for wellness program participation, I think it's really important to track. You can offer, I see that often the case, like we do wellness, yet nobody really takes um, advantage of that or is actually experiencing wellness. And so having a measurable goal of trying to make it meaningful for your um, staff, is, I, I just wanna commend you for that. Thank you. Uh, yes, and we want to see them well. Um, and then in terms of what I believe I heard in your presentation is um, matching more senior officers with a lot of the newer staff and, and sort of trying to help mentor and support them, given that we have a younger staffing, I think is part of the concern. I mean, naturally, I, you understand um, that's who we're trying to recruit and they're younger and, and not as experienced and they're armed in our communities, right? And so having mentorship seems really critical. And then, and then I also wanted to see where um, maybe training is also allocated in the budget to support the, you know, the professional growth of these individuals. Yes, uh, you're correct. We do have a, a much younger uh, generation of officers out there you know, nowadays. Uh, and um, you know, they go through the same background, the same training as everybody else does, uh, but sometimes not as much life experience as uh, people who are a little older that come to us. So we really do put an emphasis uh, and a priority on training, uh, consistent ongoing year-round training to really maximize their exposure to scenarios, to best practices, to de-escalation efforts. Uh, so it's, that is really uh, where a good amount of our, uh, our funds go is to support that initiative, uh, so much so that uh, we've committed a, a full-time lieutenant basically to oversee, identify training needs, make sure we're up to date on the best standards and practices in compliance with the law, 
And it's just really been an added benefit. And that's, that's the best way to try and address that uh, these younger generation of officers coming in is not only training, uh, but yes, constant mentorship by some of the senior officers that we have out there. Yeah, great, I agree. And I, I just want to encourage you to continue to do that because that's truly needed, I think, as in any profession, but particularly one when individuals are young and armed, right? Um, and then lastly, I guess my, I, and maybe it's just not a, it's not really a question, but maybe it's just a comment in general, um, but a, and a strategy that across departments could be looked at is just the workforce development, really recruiting from internally, really thinking about, I know we've talked about that with water in the pre-apprenticeship programming. We're seeing vacancies in so many areas that if we can get individuals from our community, particularly in this field, um, it's, it's so much more ideal. And so, however, we're really taking a proactive approach to workforce development and recruitment and the pipeline educationally, I think for this and for other departments is something that, you know, I'd like to see as a priority as well. So no response needed, just a comment in general. Um, anyways, thank you for your presentation. I really appreciate thank it. Thank you very much. Thank you, council member. The vice mayor is recognized. I kind of like being second to last because everything I wanted to say has kind of already been said. But what I was trying to write a note to my colleague here was when you were, when she was talking about um, the, what was it called? Responsible beverage services. Do you also follow up do they do checks on like dispensaries? I just know that a lot of underage people get served in both places and it's kind uh, of Marijuana concerned. dispensaries? Yeah. Yeah, so part of a uh, community services division uh, overseen by Lieutenant Jones is the, the marijuana dispensary licenses and outlets. So we will provide uh, inspections, uh, training, and ensure that they are in compliance with all state and local laws as well. Okay, um, and then this is a hypothetical question. When I get a traffic ticket here in town and I pay the fee, where does that money go? <laughs> asking for a friend. Asking for a friend. <laughs> hypothetical. <laughs> when I run a stop a, sign. Uh, it depends on what kind of citation you get. If a traffic, it, it, it gets I ran a stop sign. Oh, you're, oh hypothetically. A red light, something like that. <laughs> Uh, some of the money goes, uh, stays locally, some of the money goes to the court, some of the money goes to the state, uh, some goes to traffic initiatives. Uh, it really gets uh, dispersed among several agencies. It doesn't come back to the department, so there's no incentive to give out more tickets. Uh, no, we generally don't, no. We don't see really an increase in <laughs> revenue by the citations we issue, which is good, because then that keeps us out of that uh, motivating to you know, write more tickets business. So yeah, we don't see more money just because we write more tickets or make more arrests. So I think a bunch of teenagers are going to hate me for suggesting this, even though it's not going to make any money, is the, the helmets. It makes me so nervous when I see piles of kids on those electric bikes and with those new, whatever they're called, jump bike ones coming back to town. I think it's only a matter of time before someone gets seriously injured when they're riding around without their helmet or their helmet unstrapped. And maybe we could bring uh, Officer Black back out of retirement to <laughs> start handing out. <laughs> I don't know, but it, I mean, it's just in in terms of goals and like public safety, yeah. it's really scary. Yeah, we do have a significant high level of. Well, I mean, we're thankfully, luckily, we're a bicycle friendly city, a uh, bicycle friendly environment. We do have a lot of bicyclists, but unfortunately, when a bicyclist and a car collide, the bicyclist always ends up losing. And so, uh, really, just emphasizing on helmets and, and, and safety uh, with the amount of riders that we have in this community is and, always important. Yeah, and I don't see anything wrong with citing underage kids as a reminder to click it or ticket. Um, and then um, the other thing I just wanted to, to, to add on is I appreciated what um, uh, Council Member Bruner said about uh, the CSOs being a good bang for the buck and same with the volunteers. And I think the more presence we have downtown really adds to the economic vitality um, of our community with the increase of robberies and things like that happening downtown, I know it makes not only uh, business owners, but people that work in the shops feel safer when they see um, uniformed officers, regardless if they're sworn or not down there. Yeah, we, we agree as well. And uh, the chief's priority is uh, is that as our numbers get back to uh, identify, you know, get more resources, more uniforms downtown, it's the priority when our, when our numbers get back up. Okay, appreciate it. Thank you so much. Morning. Morning, Mayor. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for pointing that out to me. I will start alternating so that you are not always the oh, second like to the last. Oh, you like yeah, going second to last. Crossing off. I don't have to touch so much. Oh, it sounded like a complaint. No, so, okay. I like it. Look how many things I crossed off. 
Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, Chief, <laughs> good morning again. Good morning, sir. Uh, I'm going to pick up on, on this e-bike business. Uh, these e-bikes are no longer a bicycle with a little electric pack on it. Uh, that added two or three pounds to what's going on. Some of these weigh 50, 60, 70 pounds or more. Uh, when you put somebody who weighs, you know, anything from 120 to 200 pounds on top of that, and these have the capacity to go 40 miles an hour, uh, I think it begs the question of where do they properly belong when they're moving? And it would seem to me that uh, sidewalks, walkways such as West Cliff, other areas uh, are not suitable and the bike lane might not, not even be suitable because Lance Armstrong can't pedal his bike 40 <laughs> miles an hour. Uh, probably bad choice of uh, bicycle riders to bring out of retirement for this purpose. But anyway, uh, even with his drug support, he can <laughs> ride his bike 40 miles an hour fl flat. Uh, gentle lady talked about the lack of helmets. Fair enough. I think there's this larger question of what we're going to be doing with these vehicles. Now, I, I, in my mind, this is suitable subject matter for the state legislature and the governor to take up. Where do these belong? As a municipal government, do we have the authority to start, uh, if we wanted to, to adopt local ordinances relative to where uh, e-bikes can be operated? Uh, thank you, Mayor. That's a good question. Uh, I'd probably have to defer to the city attorney or if he was here, but I, I could not tell you if we have the abilities to institute legislation or local measures to enforce or regulate e-bikes. It, it, I identify with your concerns. They are uh, increasing in popularity. Uh, we see them daily. Uh, they do carry a heavier weight, faster speeds, and uh, right now they're currently reg you know, regulated and uh, enforced as if they were regular bicycles. Uh, so uh, we could definitely look at exploring the options to, uh, some, to, to bring in some new legislation or ordinances to better safely regulate those. Chief, would you be kind enough if, uh, to, at least on, a, on an outline kind of basis, would you be willing to return uh, on or before our final budget actions in June? Uh, in consultation with the city attorney, uh, come back and provide us with some more thoughts on this issue. Absolutely, I'd be happy to. Thank you very much. For Mayor, to, to Just in really here. Pardon me, Mr. Mayor. Um, Tony, Tony came on screen. I was going to give him an opportunity. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do believe we have the ability Mr. to regulate uh, e-bikes, and I and I, my sense is that the California Vehicle Code has probably not caught up with the technology. Um, but we can certainly explore that with the police department and be prepared to report back to you. Thank you. I want to be clear about this. Uh, certainly folks in my age demographic uh, are finding that e-bikes is a way to extend your enjoyment of bicycling. Uh, this is, uh, and, and for younger folks, I think across age groups, this is, popular and growing in popularity. And I think there's a lot of reasons for that. So I think that if the state is not covering this territory yet, and without thinking about this in the context of we're trying to prohibit the use, that isn't it at all. It's where is it appropriate given that these are really no longer bicycles. They're, they're, they're trending closer to small motorcycles than they are a bicycle. So thank you for your willingness. Mr. Condotti, thank you for your willingness to take a look at that and report back prior to our final budget actions. Uh, my other question, sir, is I, you, you just happen to be standing there, so uh, this, this, uh, what I'm going to go into is uh, my particular hobby horse on, on this general topic of, of criminal justice and public safety. Uh, would you know or would your analyst know on the number of arrests that were made, the arrests, how that split between misdemeanors and felonies? 
I don't think we have that data available today, but we can source that data and get it back to you. Okay. Do you think that's another one that we might be able to have prior to our final budget action in June? Oh, absolutely. I could even get that back to you sooner if you need it, sir. Well, I uh, thank you, and I would. And let me tell you why. Uh, what we, what I think we know is the following. It's a criminal justice system of which you are the front of it. The middle of it is the district attorney. And the end of it is the sheriff's responsibility in, inside the city in terms of being the jailer. And if I understand the current either policy or practices or both at the district attorney and the sheriff level goes like this. The state of California in order to reduce prison overcrowding and not have to build new prisons, push the non-non-nons, non-sexual predator, non-violent, non-third strike from serving in state prison to now serving the remainder of their time in county jails. That helped the state resolve their overcrowding issue and Judge Stelton Henderson gave the state the authority back to run the prison system under those conditions. What, as I understand it, what that has done has put the sheriff in a place where the sheriff says, I have no room at the jail. And with that then backing one step further is that the district attorney is very selective about prosecuting misdemeanors and essentially doesn't prosecute, mis uh, excuse me, uh, felonies, and essentially doesn't prosecute misdemeanors. So what I see happening in this is that no matter how much good work you do, that some number of the citations and arrests are like Groundhog Day. <laughs> it is a largely meaningless act to the extent that, and it must be frustrating to you and your staff, that you do your part, but because the district attorney and the sheriff can't or won't not blaming them, can't or won't do their job, your job is hindered significantly, is my view of this. And that a better world would be if the district attorney had the capacity to prosecute and the sheriff had the capacity to jail those offenders who the law anticipates by its construct belong in jail or in state prison. Let me be very clear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that we should undertake some wholesale incarceration program uh, that is not the trend in the United States, that is not the trend in the world, generally speaking. But I think there's a vast difference between over-incarcerating over here and not being able, in my view, to keep our streets safe, our neighborhoods safe, because the two component parts above where we are can't do, won't do, fail to do, don't have the money to do their jobs. And for me as a, as a, as a mayor, that's unacceptable, because to me that severely constrains the effectiveness of what you do. Now, I'm not necessarily asking you to respond to my speech, but I would ask you this question. If the district attorney and the sheriff had increased ability to do their jobs, would that be of benefit to the city and the police department in doing your job? Yes, great point. Thank you for bringing that up, Mayor. Uh, just to go back a little further, yes, that is one of the probably the most frustrating components our officers deal with is uh, the recidivism, dealing with the same people over and over again, uh, the nuisance, the quality of life issues. Uh, literally, we know people by full name, date of birth, uh, sometimes deal with them a couple times in the same shift. Uh, and that represents probably a majority of the work that our men and women do is a, a small amount of population or the repeat offenders are the ones that we're constantly dealing with and responding to on a daily basis. So the abilities to have accountability measures, uh, 
to hold those people accountable, uh, whether it's jail or mental health or programs, would definitely uh, not only increase, well, one, the morale for our officers, the abilities to do their job, the effectiveness of their job, but would also reduce calls, increase quality of life, reduce crime. Uh, that would be instrumental uh, if that was uh, more effective. I thank you for that comment, that candid comment. Uh, do we, uh, our city manager isn't here for a moment, and I, uh, maybe I could ask uh, Ms. Schmidt in his absence. Uh, the city manager is back. Uh, sir, I was waiting just for a moment to ask you this question. We had, we had been in a colloquy about uh, the criminal justice system and the component parts and what effect that has when the other two actors do or don't do what they do, what happens to us, and Chief was uh, responding that at a minimum it makes the job frustrating and it may be a more sig equally significant level. It, it, that doesn't help at all having our, making our community a, a, a safer place to be. My question, now that you're back, is whether there are ongoing conversations between our city and those two countywide elected officials, because my guess is they're not making this up. This is an honest to God, genuine constraint on them. This is not that they're not choosing not to do their job. Uh, the district attorney has capacity issues. The, Sheriff has physical jail issues, uh, constraints, I understand. This is no way, to, in my estimation, to continue to operate a criminal justice system. Uh, and uh, I think that certainly a very significant portion of this can only be solved by the governor and the state legislature. Can't do this at the city level, probably can't do it at the county level, because when we talk to those two other countywide elected officials, they, have, they don't have excuses, they have real reasons. That means that the system is stuck. And for all the money we spend then on your department, the county spends on the district attorney and the sheriff, is to agree to fail. And I'm wondering if this city should engage those two elected officials and because they are not going to give us excuses, they're gonna give us darn good reasons. And then incorporate our senator, our two assembly members in a conversation because what we're going to say to them runs contrary to the tide that has been rolling through state government, which is to take Felonies make them misdemeanors. Uh, a lot of changes. And I think that they are well intended. I don't doubt that, that they're well intended. And th that may be quite helpful in some communities, what they're doing. I don't think it's at all helpful in our community. Not at all. And so I'm wondering if we, we have engaged uh, the county, the district attorney, and the sheriff, and our legislative delegation in trying to make a very significant change that will help us, again, not some mass incarceration, not spitting on the sidewalk get you two months in jail. That's not what this is about. But if you're dealing with a known group of reoffenders time and time again, it moves us from being champions of safety to chumps. And I think that should be unacceptable by our city. Sir? Uh, Mayor, there is no question that our state is uh, woefully failing when it comes to our criminal justice system and our mental and behavioral health support services um, across the state. Many of the, way, many of the ways in which the system is inadequate come to a head in our community, and we experience it every day. Uh, as Chief Bush is describing, and really, as you've heard, woven throughout all of our department presentations. 
So we, we are in regular communication with our county partners. We are also engaging at a state level. And as you heard yesterday, as part of the homelessness response presentation, we have brought on lobbyists that have uh, special experience in this area to engage with Senator Laird and our local elected delegation to really advance and champion statewide change that needs to happen. Without that, we're gonna to continue to be constrained with the challenges we have in front of us and not make meaningful progress on some of the most complex issues that are facing Santa Cruz. So those conversations are ongoing. Um, I think if any city is gonna be a leader, uh, it should be Santa Cruz, uh, again, given the way that these issues really come, come to a head um, in our town. So more to come. Thank you, sir. We are actually, Mayor, we were fortunate to have the state attorney general come and visit us a few weeks back and meet with law enforcement representation, probation, and mental health representatives, specifically to begin the conversations of this such an important topic and how to address those, including the abilities to provide additional mental health services or incarceration services, forcing people for treatment that need it, uh, and looking at long-term solutions uh, to this problem that we're having. So those. Conversations are also currently underway between the chief, uh, the state, and the county as well. I appreciate that. I, I know that, uh, I think we all know, we received a presentation on this a month or so ago that the, the so-called care court concept that is coming is probably a couple of years away, I would suspect. And uh, that component part uh, which goes to the issues around mental health and so on that are associated with, in some cases, criminal activity. Totally understand the appropriate move there is into the mental health side of, of the system. I think that's right. Uh, in, the, in the general category of we can't do nothing, about this until somebody above us decides to change the law or provide more funding or whatever it may be, which given the governor's proposed budget this year seems a not at all interested topic. Um, I wonder about this, and I want to be very careful how I frame this. Somebody commits what you folks believe to be a crime they are arrested for it. It is a misdemeanor, uh, maybe even formerly a felony, but it's a misdemeanor. Uh, under some circumstances, you take them to jail. Not all. Sometimes they're given a citation, that's that. Some cases, you take them to jail. Am I right on that so far? You're absolutely, yes. Some instances. And then at the jail, uh, the, the intake side of that, uh, unless there's probably certain conditions I imagine met, that person isn't there very long. And I think you said some 15 or 20 minutes ago that you actually encounter some folks that you cite twice in a single day, or more perhaps, and that this group of people is known to you. And I think it's, some version of the old broken window theory, uh, which is that if, if at a certain level, a certain group of people who commit an awful lot of, who are alleged to have committed an awful lot of crimes repeatedly, that it would seem to make sense that you've got a pretty good idea then uh, when you pick somebody up 20 or 30 times in a year, or whatever it might be, pretty good idea this is a bad actor. Um, now, whether they need mental health services or they need this, or they need, I'm, I'm going to stay out of that. That's what judges do. God created judges to figure that part out. And we don't have judges here. That's a county and state function. But from a policing function, I am wondering if repeatedly arresting people, uh, well, uh, let me do it a slightly different way. Is there a legal approach, a, a, an established best practice approach in the law enforcement field 
about dealing with the, I don't know that you gave us a number. I'm going to guess it's 20 to 30 to 40 people in the city that you know on this regular basis. And the community is having to experience that as it's, an, it's not a meaningful act. Uh, when that, at the moment it occurs, my guess is uh, victims or observers feel, oh goodness, there are really some consequences of that. Thank goodness. If they were to know that there are essentially no consequences of that, even when someone's arrested, I'm wondering if the department is engaged in any kind of work to understand what be best practices would mean uh, if we're trying to reduce the level of crime, especially by a cohort of folks that are known to the department, what the best way to deal with that is. I wonder if you have thoughts on that. Yes, thank you, Mayor. You are correct. There's a small number of people that create a majority of the problems for us. And usually behind those issues are either mental health or drug and alcohol uh, problems. And a five hour or a one or two day stint in jail is not going to solve the problem long term. We're not going to be able to arrest or enforce our way out of uh, addressing that population that creates the most work for us unless they commit such a serious crime. Uh, that it would send them to prison or, or jail for uh, you know, a year or two or more. Uh, ultimately, the success that we see is in collaboration with mental health, with probation, with drug and alcohol treatment programs uh, to really try and identify the core problem that these individuals suffer from and address that root cause uh, in hopes, whether it's, like I said, mental health, drugs, or alcohol, uh, to try and solve that underlying problem that ultimately leads to them causing and generating crime or the calls for service uh, that we often deal with associated with them. Uh, that's where we really see our best success. Uh, some of the problems we run into is that we can offer some of these programs, we can offer treatment, uh, and whether or not they want to take it, you know, sometimes it's up to them. So when it's mandated or forced uh, by the courts or the judicial system, uh, it, it's, it's much more successful. Thank you. So that does raise the question then. Uh, if there are some, can we agree that, uh, the, uh, so that I get less vague about this, can we agree that this, this number is closer to 30 or 40 than it is 5 or 10 or 60 or 70? I mean, it, it, are we speaking in the right uh, uh, range here? Yes, absolutely. 30, 40 people. We could even go a little higher, but yes. 50? Sure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so let's. I, I'm really trying to you get a sense yeah. of scale here, but something on the order of 50, 50 folks. Okay. Sure. So in the in the homeless space, uh, we know that uh, uh, we can offer people a place to go, uh, shelter, service, camping, whatever it might be. They're totally in charge of whether or not they do that. Um, it seems to me, because it's not illegal to be homeless, nor should it be. Uh, but, and so if somebody chooses not to accept shelter or services, whatever it might be, that's a right they have to do that. It doesn't seem to me that, that you have the right if you are arrested for and convicted of a crime and your underlying problem is drug, alcohol, or mental health, it doesn't seem to me that it's that person's choice. It seems to me that's the judge's choice on, and probation in consultation uh, with social services. Uh, so the idea that somebody may not want treatment, that's fine in this other context over here. But it would be like me getting arrested and getting sentenced to jail, and I say, well, I, I choose not to do that, um, which I think would be my choice. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering why that's a choice then. Uh, that's a good question. Um, probably couldn't uh, answer your question completely. I know 
there are uh, uh, oftentimes, I mean, sometimes mental health and drugs, uh, especially in mental health, people don't necessarily have a choice uh, when it comes to mental health issues. Uh, drug and alcohol, it eventually becomes a disease and an addiction and sometimes beyond their control. And really trying to work before it gets to that, you know, uh, that level is always a priority. But, uh, yeah, for instance, I can't speak for the justice system, uh, but there are instances where uh, court-ordered treatment uh, is, uh, is required by the, de by the offender. Um, you know, but prior to that, if it's uh, before an arrest or before a citation issued, uh, the ability to offer is, yes, up to them. Oh, yeah. No, I, I, I'm talking about post-arrest. And... Uh... But I think the example you just gave assumed that you get in front of a judge. Yeah, correct. In order for that to actually happen, uh, as you're familiar with, and I appreciate your understanding, is that, that those arrests would have to be uh, first uh, filed on by the district attorney right. uh, before that individual is even gone before a judge, uh, then either you know uh, subsequently plead guilty or convicted in a jury trial before we even would get to the component of mandated uh, behavioral health or drug and alcohol treatment. And the percentage of people that make it all the way through that process, uh, you know, could definitely be a lot higher than what it is right now. Thank you for that. I think this is a very important topic for us to engage uh, the two county officials that are directly elected officials who have jurisdiction over the prosecution and the and the jailing, uh, and also, I think it may be fruitful potentially to engage the bench in this conversation and the public defender's office, uh, who all have more than a minor role in in this activity. Uh, this is. I suspect, you, you said it, I don't have to suspect it, you said it, this is enormously frustrating for your officers and for the department at large. Uh, and uh, I hope that when we're here a year from now that perhaps we have got better ways uh, to deal with four dozen people who apparently cause a great deal of harm and havoc in our community around which we don't seem to be able to be effective and would like to see that uh, the chief and the city manager, CAO, we know what they're going to say. We, we don't have to think about it. We know what they're going to say. Once we've all said it to each other, then the question becomes, now what do we do about this? Because it doesn't seem to me that it'll work for us to get our legislative delegation to do something for a city. This isn't where the problem is in terms of law enforcement and real consequences. So it seems to me that those partners have to be in this and agree to it and then be willing to be advocates with us uh, in this enterprise. Chief, thank you to you, and thank you to all the women and men of your department who keep us safe every day. Council Member Watkins. Thank, thank you. I have one last budget question that I forgot to ask. I, I apologize when I had the floor. Um, in regards to the amount of overtime, I know that because of the shortage, it requires a lot of the patrol officers having, and just staff in general, having to work overtime. I don't know. I'm just curious, like, how do you, do you quantify that? It, 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 and could, okay, and what do you think, I mean, I know it's not outlined here in this budget, but what do you estimate that cost to be annually? Uh, that's a good question. Let me turn that over to you. And if you don't have, I mean, even just a general estimate, it'd be. I can, I can get you a detailed report on what uh, amount is set aside for overtime for uh -huh. each of our activities. Uh -huh. um, we've exceeded all of them. I'm sure. Um, however, we ha also haven't spent all of our funds, so it works out. Yeah, we're not running a deficit, but yeah. uh, because we have some salary savings. Yeah. However, we are having we had mandated over uh, mandated shifts and uh, staffing shortages. We've had we've had a lot of our officers work 
a lot over time. Yeah. yeah. So, and I can provide all those numbers for you. I'd be curious, I think, or, uh, you know, thinking about with the wellness goal also, how, you know, those go hand in hand, right, in terms of the pressure and work, um, the goal around, you know, recruitment, and then also probably reducing the amount of time officers are required for overtime, too. So, anyways, I, I just wanted to make that, you know, recognition and statement, and I see just a, a very quick follow-up to that, and Chief Bush could speak to this, but there was a period of time where we were having uh, mandatory overtime, right. and so as the staffing has reached a threshold that we're no longer having to mandate overtime in all situations, I know there's still instances in which we have to. Um, that helps with what you're describing, uh, Councilmember Watkins, and has been one of the one of the priorities of the department. Okay, yeah. That, that's absolutely correct. Uh, we were on a 12-hour mandatory overtime shift. Uh, Normally we work 10s, oftentimes 10s just turn into 11 or 12s naturally because it calls for service and paperwork. When you're working a 12, then a 12 turns into 13 or 14 hour shift and with commute times. So that was a big strain on our staff and, and to morale and uh, thankfully with the chief's efforts and getting our numbers back up, uh, we're back to a 10 hour uh, schedule which is uh, you know much more preferred by the staff and, and better on morale and personal life and family life as well. Okay, great. Well, it's nice to hear that that's moving in the right direction as well. So, thank you. Again, Chief, thank you very, very much. We are a better and safer community because of the fine work of the women and men of your department. Thank you, Did Mayor. you have a comment? Please do. Thank you. Um, I appreciate your questions, Mayor, as um, that you were asking and kind of framing the context of uh, the criminal justice system and the role that uh, our police department plays in in the process and um, the, la the lack of resources and support um, to get at some of the root causes of um, what we're, you know, what our officers are dealing with, having more programs in place, having more alternative locations for people to go besides jail which is full and there's just all these domino effects and um, I just wanted to mention that I have also been taking a deep dive in this exact same um, topic and um, I, I because I think our community needs better systems and it's a big undertaking and it's not just something that our council or the city can control and I would even say we could revisit this conversation with our next report at fire and some of the same people and repeat response calls um, we can um, again be back at that situation but um, I wonder if this is something um, to uh, you made a recommendation uh, for communication, and I wonder, you know, I, I've been doing some outreach on this for understanding, but I wonder if it's something the Public Safety Committee um, could take a deep dive in. I know we're meeting next month, um, and um, otherwise I'm happy to continue working on this and kind of looking at how we can support people in our community to get what they need for better well-being and to support our systems and our police department and reduce all of our calls for service and all of that. So thank you. Council Member Brenner, I think that's an excellent suggestion. That's a very good venue in which to have this uh, conversation. Uh, and I think uh, you will do what you will do in your in your committee. Uh, certainly focusing, it, it, you will focus where, where you deem appropriate. That's why you're the public safety, you folks are the public safety committee. Uh, I would hope that the committee, while we are a, a compassionate and caring community and while there are, uh, it does make sense to have various avenues for treating people, drug, alcohol, mental health issues, absolutely uh, important to do. 
Um, not everyone who commits crime has mental health issues or an addiction problem. And so uh, there are actually, yes, bad people. And so uh, I think that's important to keep in mind also. I, I, I don't diminish the, the importance of those who have addiction, mental health issues, need a different kind of assistance in life. Uh, but there are criminals who are victimizing our community on a regular basis who need, as far as I'm concerned, to be taken out of play for some considerable period of time uh, as punishment for uh, putting other people's public safety at risk. Other questions and comments? Seeing and hearing none. Chief, thank you very much. Please pass on to the women and men of the police department, sworn and civilian and volunteer, that we are very clear that our community is only as safe as it is because of the fine job that you all do. We, re we love you, we re respect you, and we care deeply about the work that you do every day. Thank you, I appreciate that. I'll be sure to pass that along to the chief as well. Thank you, sir. We are going to at this time, and I want to thank the fire chief for agreeing to do this. We're going to take a, a break right now. We will see you folks. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, they want to go before lunch. I misunderstood the, uh, the audible. Uh, come on, come on, come on. We're going to do this. No, no, I, I, that was my interpretation. I didn't. I can, I, 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 sort of a formidable uh, task being the one person between you and lunch. So. There we go, there we go. I Chief, understand that and I respect it. Um, Chief, welcome. We are thank you. Uh, pleased to have you here today in presenting the fire department's annual budget. Thank you, Mayor, Council. I appreciate the opportunity. Before we get started, I just wanna recognize my uh, entire budget team here. Okay. Um, it was an all hands collaborative effort um, to prepare this for you today as we have a number of people that'll be leaving and stepping into roles. So. Um, it was very important to me that we all sort of had a, a hand in this, so it would also be available for questions, should you have any. Um, I would also be remiss not to sort of recognize and show my appreciation on behalf of the fire department to you, Mr. Mayor and Council, um, for your support most recently during um, our loss of Brian, Captain Brian Tracy. Um, I just really appreciate the support that we've received from the city, and specifically the city manager's office, HR, um, had come out, actually had breakfast with each crew, and so that was uh, um, meant a lot to me, but I got a lot of um, good feedback from the crews, and so I just want to share our appreciation with each and every one of you for, for that, so thank you. And with that, um, I'll go ahead and jump into our presentation for our fiscal year at 24 budget. Okay. So the agenda really is quite simple, like many others, just a quick department overview, talk about some of our core services, our achievements for last fiscal year 23, our 24 budget, as well as some goals that we have set for ourselves. Um, first and foremost, um, you know, this is our organizational chart here, difficult to sort of read on the screen itself, but I know you guys have copies. Um, we are made up of 66 full-time employees, um, 61 of which are sworn. Um, and then in addition to that, we have 50, uh, over 50 temps, and those are comprised primarily of our seasonal lifeguard staff, as well as a few other uh, temps that we have that assist us um, in the prior prevention bureau by way of um, conducting inspections. Um, I think it's important to note that currently at this point in time, we only have one vacancy, and that is the deputy fire mar marshal position that we are currently actively recruiting for and testing. Um, that was just due to the various promotions. We've had eight in the last month. Um, with that, we also um, currently on the operations side have uh, no openings. Um, that was um, by way of we had one individual leave uh, for personal reasons to another department back down south. Um, but prior to that, um, we were able, with the cooperation of the city manager's office and finance department and HR, to bring back an individual who had left um, us um, years in a, a year ago and decided to actually come back. So right now we currently stand um, operationally um, fully staffed, although um, 
As I mentioned before, we have a number of forecasted retirements that will be occurring within this calendar year. We believe we'll have six by the end of the year, and so we're looking to uh, hire another six individuals um, and start them in an academy by January of next year. Um, and again, that overhiring that we did has all been in part by the cooperation and assistance we had with the city manager's office, HR, and the finance department, so I thank them as well. Um, and I think also it's really important to note that this org chart that you see here, um, aside from a reorg that we had in 2014, the addition of the fire station and fire crew from the university in 2014, um, and of course the addition of a marine safety captain when we took over the marine safety division from Parks and Rec back in 2007, we haven't really seen a net growth in the number of personnel that we have that respond to calls for service in the city. So something to sort of keep in mind as we go through some of our calls for service. Um, and of course, something that we will address in this next calendar year as we, or fiscal year, as we look to do a standards of cover survey to see that, that we are in fact going to be well prepared for the city in the future. <clears throat> um, the next thing I just want to review with all of you is um, for the fire department, we try and focus on three pillars. We consider them our foundation, and it's really um, an integral part of us moving into the future. And those three pillars consist of personnel, response, and community. Um, obviously, Santa Cruz firefighters are the ones, we're the ones who get things done. So in order to, to maintain that and um, uh, maintain that expectation on our staff, we want to make sure the workforce is healthy, engaged, satisfied, and prepared to meet these challenges of this job. So that's why personnel is, is one of those uh, pillars. Response, we're all risk. So we need to respond promptly, professionally, and respectfully to all calls for service. And lastly, community. Uh, a strong sense of genuine connection to our community allows us to excel in our delivery to the community. Um, so we want to educate the public about the services that we provide. And then, of course, in doing so, we enhance the re resiliency of our community. And so those are things that we try and remind ourselves every single day when making decisions. And of course, when we developed this budget, those pillars were um, the back of our mind, of course. So going into our core services for the fire department, you have obviously our fire operations. Those are the, the uh, division that respond to 911 calls on a daily basis. Uh, our fire prevention bureau, that's um, not just um, the preventative side of fire, but arson investigation, public education and outreach followed by the Marine Safety Division. Um, that, of course, is our Seasonal Lifeguard Corps. But also, um, as many of you know, we do have rescue swimmers that are embedded on all of our fire engines. And so it is a uh, well-oiled machine that um, responds to a number of water rescues um, year-round in the city. Um, the next one is followed as our Train Division. Uh, that's our Train Division of one. We have one individual who runs that. And of course, that's the focus on making sure that all of our men and women of the fire department are properly trained to meet the rigors of, of the job. And then last but not least is our Office of Emergency Services, which too is an army of one and comprised of Paul Horvat. And that is really the support that we get, um, not only for the EOC and you know responding to those local disasters, but also the um, reimbursement that goes along with FEMA and OES as we try and um, collect money that we have spent in, in, relation, in, re, um, in responding to those emergencies. So first and foremost, the fire operations, of course, we respond to, um, last year to 9,611 calls for service. Um, and again, those are comprised of fire, um, EMS or medicals, um, rescues, water rescues, public service, and of course, our mutual aid and the uh, Cal OES mutual aid system. Um, that's a 910 um, increase um, in calls for service from 2021. Um, and I think it's important to note that uh, you know, in the last 10 years, we've seen a steady rise in calls for service, about 31% since uh, 2012. And over the last 20 years, we've seen our calls for service go up actually 52%. And again, that's in contrast with the fact that our staffing levels have remained stagnant um, in that same time period. Um, I think it's important to note that of the fires we had, we had 107 structure fires, 144 wildland fires and then 46 other fires, and those are vehicle fires, trash can fires, nuisance fires of those nature. Um, 5, over 5,000 emergency medical responses, 25 water rescues, um, and 112 hazmats um, sort of comprise some of those. Those are some of the highlights of the calls for service for the operations division. Um, fire prevention, again, is comprised of not only the preventative inspections on new construction, 
but also fire investigation. Um, they are the tip of the spear when it comes to our vegetation management program for wildfire prevention. And in, um, this last year, we did over 20, about 20 acres of treatment in our open spaces. Um, they coordinate and conduct outreach with our firewise groups that are currently um, the Prospect Heights neighborhood and Highland um, neighborhoods. Um, of course, they team up and are an integral part of the homeless response and resource coordination. We've done site inspections at a number of different sanctioned encampments, as well as just working with the homeless response unit and PD in terms of ensuring that the unhoused are safe while they're out there. Um, of course, open space management, that's, that's um, during the high fire danger, so fire season, we will go out and proactively contact those that are out in the open spaces, um, both using them for hiking and biking, but also, again, the unhoused community to make sure that everybody is aware of those um, hazards in the open spaces during the fire season. And then, of course, just wildland urban interface code enforcement and outreach. So those are those residents that are sort of on the, the outskirts of the city that border the um, urban inter wildland urban interface to make sure that they're meeting all the uh, required um, building codes in terms of fire safety out in those areas. Next up is our Marine Safety Division. Like I mentioned before, they are the uh, lifeguard service, our on-call Marine Rescue Unit that pair up with our fire engine-based rescue swimmers. Um, we also have um, PwC watercraft that are an integral part of our rescuing operations, um, much more um, effective in our coastal area than any sort of other vessel like a boat that the Harbor Patrol has. Um, and we also last year did lifeguard services for the city of Capitola under contract and this year we've sort of changed pace a little bit. They're looking to actually um, have their own certified lifeguard agency and so what we have done a little pivot where we are basically training all of their staff to um, stand them up to be prepared to provide their own autonomous lifeguard service so that's something that we've done um, this year. I think yesterday you guys actually had um, um, Marine Safety Captain Brian Thomas here that talked a lot about some of the, the highlights from the Marine Safety Division, but I think some of the big ones that uh, are, should be repeated is just the sheer number of people that attended our beaches, you know, almost a million. It was 943,000 um, that were in attendance. We had 244 water rescues, and then of course that 70,000, over 70,000 preventative contacts. Um, and four vessel rescues. So again, they are um, the tip of the spear when it comes to um, our safety, public safety in the ocean environment. Um, again, last but not least, the Emergency Management OES. Um, we managed the Emergency Operations Center, which was um, a huge lift um, early this year um, during the storms. And again, we activated and directed EOC responses during those winter storms. Um, we coordinate reimbursement uh, processes for Cal OES and FEMA. Um, they also coordinate community re emergency response training, otherwise known as CERT, and then of course do a lot of coordination for um, grant um, acquiring for vegetation management and equipment. We actually just, um, along with all the work that we're going to be doing out in Pogo Nip and some of the other open spaces in the city, we just took possession of a chipper that allows us to do that work, and that of course was um, part and part by um, the work that um, Paul does in the OES office. And then, of course, another big lift is train city staff um, to manage and support our EOC activations um, when we have them. Um, some of our achievements, um, again, we um, successfully um, conducted some countywide training. And again, when I say countywide, it's a, um, a collaborative effort by all the departments in the county, Watsonville, Central Fire, Scotts Valley, and some of our, our counterparts up in the valley. Um, where we're training on live fire, ventilation operations, wildland, hazmat, and search and rescue. Um, again, we conducted that cost recovery for our Cal OES and FEMA operations. Um, vegetation management, we completed 20 acres this last year in the open space. Um, we purchased and installed a new station alerting system for all four fire stations, and that's really a focus on firefighter health and wellness. Um, that was one of our goals last year during the CIP process and we have that um, installed at this point. We ordered a new and took delivery of a new Type 1 fire engine in less than six months. Um, that was a heavy lift. And we completed 18-week Regional Firefighter 1 Academy for six individuals, and they are actually, as we speak, out at the Westside Fire Station completing their um, annual um, end of probation skills testing. And so that's going on, and again, that's a collaboration. We have some folks from Central Fire that are there assisting us in that because, again, it's a logistical uh, lift to get all that testing done in one day for six individuals. 
Um, again, we conducted a number of uh, EOC trainings um, just to get, and those covered finance, management, logistics, planning, and operations, and then provided um, leadership training um, for the city of Capitola, again, in, in standing up their lifeguard program um, for themselves this coming year. So for uh, fiscal year 24 budget, um, what we asked for and um, uh, is uh, the primary one is our, uh, the adding of a uh, principal management analyst um, to our ranks to sort of assist us in some pro focused project management. Um, we're trying to um, complete a overhaul of our department policies and procedures um, by way of using the Lexapol platform. PD uses that and it's basically a vetted uh, system that makes sure that we're meeting all of these state and federal and local guidelines when it comes to our policies uh, in terms of emergency response and health and wellness for the firefighters. Um, looking at shared services that may be available to us within the county and then also help us with budget management and standards of coverage survey that we look to put out for RFP and complete in the next fiscal year. So that will be a huge lift for us. Um, the other big piece that we got that we're looking for is the funds reinstated from previous um, budget constraints. We had to give some money back, and that was 20000 for rescue equipment, 90000 that we took away temporarily that was focused on vegetation management, and then another $40,000 for temporary fire inspectors just to bolster um, the funding we have for those, those temporary fire investigators. Um, and just to talk briefly on all three of those items, the rescue equipment just allows our lifeguards to purchase um, all the safety equipment they need, uh, rescue boards, rescue tubes, and potentially um, lifeguard towers. Um, the vegetation management, I think um, it's pretty obvious, it's just to create shaded fuel breaks and emergency access in our city open spaces. And in terms of those temporary fire inspectors, it's, it's critical for us because as you guys all may remember, in 2020, the grand jury sort of found us um, uh, made a recommendation that we need to increase our presence out there in terms of inspections and so um, recommended that we do something to address that and so these temps really allow us to do that um, in a, in a uh, better responsive way. Um, so quickly our, our fire department budget 18 makes up 18 percent of the net city budget. Um, it's been again status quo like many others. Um, the big differences are our, our, our budget this year for um, for personnel services um, is pretty stable. We haven't changed revenue. We don't really make a lot of money in a lot of our operations. The money that we do bring in is by way of our contract with UCSE for service, the Capitola contract, and then of course any response that we do out of county on any mutual aid fire. And last year there was actually a little bit less that we did that. A lot of that was due to a less number of incidents in the state, but also our inability to um, fill those orders or requests just because of the sheer challenge of um, a lot of injuries that we had and staffing challenges around that. So, um, and then supplies and services, um, we're gonna see a little bit of an increase and that's just because of that money that we're, we got uh, refunded into our budget for equipment and vegetation management. Our goals for 2024, um, we wanna shoot for the stars and complete, I was gonna go with 30 acres of vegetation management that we wanna complete, but we'll just say 20 plus at this point. But again, we always wanna do more every single year. There's a lot of challenges that we face, um, but of course our goal is to just make our wildland area much more safer and resilient. We, um, in that, are gonna implement a five-year city wildfire resiliency plan, and that's a collaborative effort with water, parks and rec, and public works. Um, and we are currently working on that. We received grant funding and hope to have that plan out within this fiscal year. Uh, we're gonna, of course, strive to conduct all of our state-mandated fire inspections, and that's, of course, um, in assistance with those temporary fire inspectors. Um, conduct more um, EOC training. That was something that came out of our after action in these last incidents that we had, um, end of 2022, early 23. We, am, we are currently in the process and going to continue to do so, um, provide leadership training to all department personnel to really um, galvanize our workforce and um, really develop a, a true succession plan for the future as we have a number of people with significant institutional knowledge and experience that will be going out the door. <clears throat> We've got a, um, a, a big focus on enhancing our health and wellness initiatives with a focus on cancer screenings and mental health services. Next step, um, develop an RFP and identify implementation strategy for, again, like I mentioned, a standards of coverage survey. Identify funding partnerships and location for a regional public safety training center. 
And last but not least, close out FEMA cost recovery efforts for the CZU, COVID, and our recent storms. And with that, I will take any questions. Thank you very much, Chief. Let me ask if there are questions. Let's start here. Are you good? Okay. Ms. Kalantari Johnson. Thank you, Chief, for the presentation and the amazing work. Um, I've been hearing about uh, fire district consolidation throughout the county. I don't know if that's going to happen or not or when it will happen, but how, if it does happen, and maybe you can share more if you have information, how does that impact um, our department and the contracts that you named? Or yeah, any other contracts. That's a great question. So um, the contracts are all a little bit different, but in terms of consolidation itself, um, we are working closely and collaboratively with our neighbors, Central Fire. Um, uh, both of us being sort of the busier of the two in the county and um, a little bit more um, upstanding in terms of our level of preparedness to serve um, our constituents. We are working a lot in different areas at, at investigating shared services by way of our training division, um, our marine. Uh, safety division. Um, we're sort of the benchmark for the county and, and they're sort of starting that. They have rescue swimmers on their engines and so we've helped them over the last year um, sort of and they've assisted us in delivering the service and working with the city of Capitola in both delivering lifeguard services last year and also with the training for them to stand up their own operation this coming summer. Um, so we are looking in that. We, do, we have talked a lot about it. Um, like I said, the, the primary agency that we've been working with currently is just Central Fire being so close. We share that boundary, and we do so many things um, together um, in responding to large emergencies. We're all there together anyway. Um, but I know concurrently LAFCO is also looking at it, and I've had to provide some information to the county for that purpose. And so they have yet to come up with a report, but we will work with them on that. Um, and like I said, just working with Central Fire to, to examine all the opportunities that are out there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good questions or comments? Ms. Pruner. Thank you. Thank you for all of your work and for bringing the whole team, for everyone contributing to this. Um, my question, I guess, uh, you mentioned, and I um, see it in the Pulse Point app, medical emergencies. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be the most frequent. I think you said 5,000 5, medical calls for service. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I just, I wonder how that's called out. Everything is marine and fire. And I, I guess I want to see a little more about where how funds and cost is around medical and those medical responses. And oftentimes I see an entire large fire engine truck respond and um, to medical emergencies. And um, I'm also hoping you can speak to um, how that came to be that the fire truck would come and respond to a medical emergency and why there are not smaller fire trucks that could respond in those situations. I have questions around all that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. No, that's a great question. Um, a lot of it comes down to, um, you know, we are part of an EMSIA, a JPA, with all the other um, fire agencies in the county. Um, and in doing so, um, that's how we've sort of came about to have paramedics on the fire engine. Um, and so with that, there's a whole host of training and other requirements that the EMSA provides. But with that, we are under contract with the... Um, comma, but not all comma. <laughs> of the comments um, during the police department presentation, or at least tangentially related Tony? to budget until the mayor started. Tony Candotti. <laughs> no problem. I've done that myself. Um, so we are under contract with AMR for their county contract. We stop the clock for them. So there's only at any given time on a good day, six ambulances in the whole entire county. So that's from Watsonville up to the North Coast and in the Valley. You stop the clock, what does that mean? So we have paramedics. So when the call is dispatched and they, are, they have determined that it's a medical emergency, they send an ambulance and a fire engine. Right. And that's in every jurisdiction. And so when we get there, we stop the clock. The clock is the requirement that the county has put on AMR for them to meet their contractual obligation. 
And so we stop that by having a paramedic on scene. There's a requirement the county has established that says a paramedic needs to be on scene in this amount of time. I see the like eight minute mark that you had. Right. Okay. And so we are supposed to be there. And so what we do is because an ambulance would is typically there within 10 or 12 minutes, unacceptable. So the fire engine shows up, but because we are closer and throughout the whole entire county, you have you know, 20, 30 fire engines versus six ambulances. So we are much closer and responsive to those medical emergencies. Um, and as such, um, can, can intervene much quicker. And unfortunately, because we, all, we are all risk, um, we have to show up with our toolbox. So that toolbox is ready to go to a medical emergency, a, a structure fire, a wildland fire, a vehicle lockout, a water rescue. So we have to go with that toolbox. And so it's sometimes it, it, we're struggling you know, obviously to meet all the needs of the community. Um, and we'd have to have a tremendous amount of staffing to then staff smaller vehicles to go there. So it's sort of a, a delicate balance. Does that answer your question? It does. It's very interesting to me. And um, especially in, in, in my job working downtown, I see a lot of uh, response to medical mm -hmm. and then refusal of service. And then the truck goes away. <laughs> And so I'm just in my mind thinking again, uh, you know, how our systems can do better, but the impact to the city and and this department and our, the budget. And um, I just don't know if you've had those conversations over the years, if you have ideas, um, you don't have to answer that now, but um, However, we can support in, in, in that field. I think it's important to continue looking at how we can do better as a city, as a community, and advocate to our higher level state, federal, you know, um, so. Absolutely, no, I appreciate that. And, you know, again, going back to the fire engine being on those calls, it's, it's not uncommon for us to then leave that one medical and go to yet another medical and or a fire vehicle accident. And so again, the reason you see the large engine there. Okay. Um, to your point about, we, we call it resource utilization and making sure we're sending the right uh, resource to that call. We're taking a pretty proactive role in a number of discussions to look at ways, one of which is the resource utilization uh, group within the county. We're looking at sending, again, um, maybe certain calls, like at the jail, for instance, doesn't require a fire engine since they have medical staff on scene. Um, and so we're, we're in meetings and looking at ways we're in phase two of trying to address some of those issues. Uh, in addition, we're working with PD and the city manager's office on that mobile uh, response unit, uh, health unit, to see how we can um, sort of, again, respond to um, the right resource to what people actually need and not just dumping everything um, on there and maybe making the situation worse. So we're working on that as well and have offered up EMTs to be a part of that potential unit um, down the road. And then, of course, in my conversations with my counterpart at Central Fire, we have looked at other models that down the road, um, when AMR's contract is up, that we could better serve not only you know, the county, but this community as well. And the, the community, and then, of course, its workers, I think it would be we would benefit greatly if we had some sort of resource here in the city that would be like an ambulance that would be responsive for special events, any disasters, and, of course, um, to medical emergencies within the city. So that's something that's on, um, you know, our long to-do list. So thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm curious, do you track um, the medical um, uh, response, like what type of medical, and specifically if your increase is related to Narcan um, administering and um, overdoses? It's interesting you say that. So we can get a breakdown based on the run cards, they call them up at Netcom, and so that's where we source our data. It would be difficult to get down to the, that granular detail, um, but what we are doing on our end for our reporting um, within the fire department is um, adding a checkbox that would denote that as well as some other key indicators that we're looking to sort of monitor in the future. And so Narcan or drug overdose, and it might not be specifically an opioid overdose, but an overdose in general, we're looking to gather that information. And so we're adding that on our end. Um, it's just to, to really get down that deep on the Netcom side of things where they sort of keep all that 
um, that data is difficult. But we do, we can get down to sort of, is it a chest pain, like a cardiac call? Right. Um, yeah, or a traumatic call. Those right. those things we can break down. But when you Our get to the medical, right. Those yeah, there's so many various exactly. medical responses. Exactly. Is there anything um, uh, cost, uh, anything that would help um, that, is uh, that would be needed in the budget that would help with some of those long-term goals. I know over the past couple of years, when I first came on council, it was really important to get a new truck. Mm -hmm. There was one truck that kept breaking down mm -hmm. and was at its max life. And, um, and so really prioritizing um, Equipment systems needs for your department. You you respond to so many needs in the community, and so do you feel like everything is represented to the best in this budget? Or I'd love to see a column of. I know we have Wish kind list. of yeah. I know we have some you know projects down the line, but what is it that we can work towards and make sure we're. Um, I think a lot of that work will come when when we complete the standards of coverage survey. That will really give us the lay of the land both now and what we would expect in the future and sort of any changes we might need to make to uh, infrastructure, staffing, and equipment. Uh, additionally, um, we've been pretty successful by way of this sort of emergency purchase of that Type 1 fire engine. Um, that got us back on schedule, on our apparatus replacement schedule. But I think what will be helpful, and I've been working with the city manager's office and Elizabeth in finance um, to basically fund that, that replacement schedule and you know sort of sock away some money so that when we do need them on that pre-established schedule, we can just buy that and it's not an emergent emergency issue or a CIP product. And so that's something that we'll be working on and obviously bringing to you guys down the road. Um, and I think I think, again, that standards of coverage survey will really answer a lot of those key questions um, for us on what we need. But I think, you know, one big one that will be helpful in terms of your questions about Narcan and medical responses is, you know, and, and again, we had that presentation from Ben Clymer on that mobile response unit. I think focusing on that and potentially allocating funds towards that effort that we take on either individually as a city by way of, you know, PD, fire, and city manager's office or in partnership with the county will be extremely helpful because what he found is basically that we would see a you know a 13 percent reduction in calls for service that really aren't fire or police specific but we just go to them because that's sort of how the system works at this point in time so that would be also obviously supportive as well right and then on the revenue side um if you are no longer um uh, after the training with capitola that's revenue you won't be getting anymore right right they will be on their own standing on their own after this season and i think um we're hopeful um they were they're being endorsed by the united states life saving association and approved um, after this year and so unless they come back and need assistance which we'll be on the ready to provide if needed um you know i think that's one of those things too we're looking at is regionalizing um lifeguarding operations here in the county because it's getting more and more difficult and we're both all the agencies state parks um, Capitola now, uh, Santa Cruz Fire are struggling to to um, recruit and retain that specific workforce. It's very unique. They're young and they are transient in the sense that they come in for a couple of years and obviously move on to greener pastures. So that's going to be a challenge for all of us. And so for us to do that together is going to be extremely beneficial. That's helpful. Um, let's see. Um, okay. I think that's it for now. Thank you so much, everybody and your whole team. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Watkins. Yes, yeah, thank you for the presentation. Mm -hmm. And certainly thank you to you all and your entire division for the work that you do day in and day out. I just had a quick question about the fire strike team budget item. Mm -hmm. I see that, um, well, I was just, I don't know, I'm, and I apologize if I over <coughs> didn't hear uh, an explanation, but. I was wondering in terms of what is budgeted versus what is actually expended. 
and and why? So that's un do, that's do. unique in a way because you you can't pre-plan that. Um, there's some years like 2020 throughout the state was one of the largest for obvious reasons. We had CZU in our backyard. They had other um, large complex fires throughout the state. And then since then, each year the, um, the, the incidents themselves have dropped off okay. as well as the amount of funding. And so again, when we go out, we get fully reimbursed for that. Um, both for the equipment, the personnel, and the admin that goes into supporting those operations. And that's not only for a fire engine, but we support that heavily with what we call it overhead. So we'll send various chiefs or people that are specially trained in supply, logistics, um, line paramedics, um, safety officers to these incidents to help support the overall mission for the state. Okay, got it. I just was curious where it fit within. So it's a preventative kind of planning yeah. thing. Yeah. Great. And then in terms of the um, fire truck, I know over the years there was also um, just the amount of higher development coming in and potential concern about being able to access the, the top floors. How are you feeling in terms of what's going on with that and your preparedness or what you might need in response? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and one that you know I hope to answer with that standards of cover survey. Uh -huh. um, now again, for all those larger metropolitan areas that have larger buildings, there is no truck that will reach to the top of anything, sure. right? I mean, that's where they sort of integrate building design and, and the fire, the fire prevention comes in for that piece. Um, but in terms of that growth, whether it's building size, access is always one of our key things. Water supply is huge. But then again, it really is the, along with the equipment and access, is the personnel to do so and making sure that we're not um, meeting our obligation both for medical emergencies and the variety of other services we provide. Um, and so that will be a challenge. And I'm really hopeful that it will, you know, that sort of information will be laid out for us in a very methodical way so that we can plan accordingly for the future. But I think another thing to bring up, and it's something that we've learned, we have our public safety impact fee. Um, that we do gain a small amount of um, revenue from. But unfortunately, what we found is, while we rightfully so have a tremendous focus on affordable housing, that sort of negates us collecting money on that. And we all know that affordable housing, the numbers are still going to be there. The buildings are still there, and the people within them are still there. But unfortunately, there's no revenue that's going towards allowing us to prepare um, for those those developments. And so something that we'll be working on, maybe asking for support, is how, how can we, with this development, um, and of course, not passing anything on to those that are qualified for these, these buildings, but to the developers, but obviously not make it cost prohibitive for them. But it's just something as we, we see the whole entire state moving in this direction, we need to be mindful of how are we going to fund that. And the public safety impact fee helps that, but we're just not sort of seeing that um, influx of money to support the equipment, the personnel, and the training um, as of at this point, just because affordable housing sort of has a loophole, so to speak. No, I really appreciate that insight. And I think, you know, definitely a thought for our um, advocacy and legislative um, lobbying that happens. And, um, you know, in terms of our sales tax dollars, I believe some of those dollars were what paid for the fire engine. So when we're thinking about revenue sources and what they could go towards, I mean, having that data will really help yep. us with that um, prioritization. So thank you. Thank you. Council member. <coughs> Excuse me, Council member Brown. Thank you. Um, I am really glad to hear about the conversations that are going on through this resource utilization group. Um, when I came on the council, there was some hope that um, we could move forward in addressing this question around medical calls and the role that the city um, fire department plays. It, it must be terribly frustrating for you all uh, to have that responsibility without a lot of control over how that, how those calls get answered and, and who shows up, <clears throat> um, the, the constraints there. So I hope that this, um, this group is a productive space for you to, um, to have those conversations and, and try to identify a way forward. And you did mention that um, when the uh, contract comes up that there may be some pot potential for uh, the city playing a, a maybe a, another role, and I know that that was something that was discussed from the, the time that I was uh, that I've been on the council. So, and if I can't remember, it was 2017 or 18. Um, decided to not um, move forward because there was a lot more work that needed to be done with trying to get the, the city um, <coughs> uh, to play that role. And so I'm just wondering, when does that contract come up? Um, do you think that there's 
Um, are you more hopeful about the potential as we move forward to make that happen? Um, it's, I'm glad to see it's on your radar, on your list. Um, I was really hopeful. I guess I'm asking because I was like, wow, this, we're going to do this and we're going to make the changes and it's going to be more cost effective and less frustrating. And, um, and then we got kind of, it didn't seem like it was possible. So I'm just wondering if you feel hopeful that there's some possibility there. And when you were referring to the contract, you're referring to the ambulance contract? Yeah. With the county? Oh. Yeah, I'm trying to be, I don't want to uh, yeah. disparage I, I, any, I understand. <laughs> any other um, entities. The, the Board of Supervisors did approve a two-year extension for AMR and that current contract as it stands, and I believe it expires 20, I believe 2026, 2027. Um, I believe they were going to be up in 25, and with that extension that they were granted. Um, there were a number of fire departments, I know, um, in terms of um, th those that are, I think, greatly impact just by sheer call volume was the city of Watsonville and Santa Cruz. We did ask for questions prior, you know, tried to scrutinize some of the numbers to make sure um, that, that the obligation was being met on their end. Um, and they were able to sort of uh, prove that, which allowed them to extend that contract for the two years. Um, we still work very collaboratively with them. It's a good relationship, but of course they are a for-profit where many of us are obviously public service. And so therein lies the inherent problem that we have. Um, I just was at a conference where we've looked at a couple different options of counties and city departments that have, um, they call it the alliance model. And you go in with a, a private provider and you bid that contract. That private provider basically provides that whole EMS infrastructure, the equipment, um, the whole payroll. They basically all wear the same uniform, have the same um, paint jobs and, and logos and whatnot. Um, but the paychecks for those individuals on the ambulance come from that, that private provider. But it's a partnership that has worked most closely. It's in Contra Costa County and San Bernardino County. So something that, um, again, I was at that conference with the chief of Central Fire. And we, of course, were networking and getting some information from those uh, fire chiefs and those companies as well. It, Santa Cruz is just very unique in its size and scope and what's expected. And so we'd have to find a good partner and, of course, um, really coalesce as uh, county fire chiefs to make sure that that's what's good because, again, what's unique about us, not only in our size, is um, we have the, the corridor that's made up of, of paid professional apartments, but we have a number of agencies up in the valley that are, are volunteer, and so um, how they are configured and what their requirements are are a little bit different, and so that therein lies a challenge, but it's not insurmountable. We can get there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And just because uh, Councilmember Bruner brought it up, uh, the question about, you know, what do you need? Um, and I know you were think talking more about operations, but I'll just remind us all that the, there's a huge unfunded CIP for, the, for fire. You have massive infrastructure investments that are needed, as well as some of that equipment. And um, so I... I want to say that here, <laughs> and I want to say that, uh, you know, I'm, as a council member, continue to be committed to trying to find uh, ways to help finance those projects because, well, for all the reasons you know, I, I, don't, I don't need to go on. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's daunting when you look at it. Um, your CIP in particular, I think, um, for a public safety operation uh, you're limping along, <laughs> and so well, I would agree. And you know that was our last year with um, sort of our five-year CIP plan of identifying projects, prioritizing them based on need and um, the financial requirement behind them. Um, but again, um, I think it'll we'll get additional support and guidance from that standards of coverage survey. And with that, you may, you may find that there may be something within the infrastructure that needs to be addressed. And I think there are opportunities out there when we talk about shared service. Um, annexation or consolidation with these other agencies um, in terms of uh, addressing the need for more people, more equipment uh, immediately versus a bond measure and trying to build new facilities throughout the city or in another area. So um, I think we're trying to go at it from a bunch of different ways and I think we'll come out successful. But again, we don't know, we don't know until we complete that survey and I think that'll help us even more in addressing those CIP needs. But thank you for recognizing that. Further questions, comments? Chief, thank you very, very much. Uh, thank please you, sir. Do, thank you, Council. Appreciate it. Please, please do pass on to all of the members of your department at all levels how much we appreciate it. We know that you suffered a 
a, a family loss in the fire department uh, very recently. Our hearts go out to all the members, to both to their families and to all the members of the department. We know that this is dangerous work. Uh, we know that it is selfless work. We deeply appreciate your role in keeping us safe in our community. Thank you. Please pass that on to all the members of the department. Thank Absolutely. you, Absolutely. I'll be sure to do so. Thank you all. We stand in, we stand in recess for one hour. Santa Cruz City Council meeting of May 24th, 2023 is back in session following an afternoon recess. Uh, we are continuing with the budget hearings regarding the city's 2023-2024 fiscal year budget uh, to alert uh, members uh, in discussions with the city manager uh, given uh, uh, timing here on our budget hearings. A uh, suggestion has been made that with respect to the capital improvement project budget, that that be continued to follow our next regular city council meeting. We would still have sufficient time, plenty of time, to review that, make comments on it prior to the beginning of the fiscal year and prior to our final action on budget in June. So without objection, uh, we may have to do this by motion. We're awaiting a response from the city attorney. But right now, what we know for sure is that we will not take up the capital improvement budget today. Mayor, if I can clarify just for the minutes. Yes. That would be continued to the 13th, June 13th, or to <laughs> another meeting? Uh, 13th. The next meeting. June 13th, and then uh, it's my understanding it's the meeting after that, that we take our final budget actions. Fine. So we would have sufficient time between hearing the CIP and taking final budget action. As I understand, it's yes, only um, Mayor Keeley, it would be appropriate oh, to continue Kandati. that by motion. Mr. So Kandati, uh, please repeat that, sir. Uh, it would be appropriate to continue the item by motion. By motion. Can we have such a motion? So moved. Second. Motion and a second to continue uh, consideration of the capital improvement budget for the 23-24 fiscal year until immediately following our meeting on June the 13th. Is that correct? June 13th? It's a continuation to June 13th. Continuation to June 13th. D debate or discussion? Did you have a question? Just a quick question. Um, because we initially had the adoption of the budget on the 13th, so are we going to bump that to the 27th? I would like I would like to do that, move it to that date. Unless the, uh, I'm looking at our I'm looking at Elizabeth, our finance director. I don't think there's a problem with that if that's the will of the council, and that would allow us to bring CIP on the 13th any potential tweaks that might need to be made and then final adoption at the at the following meeting. Ms. Cavill, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, so yes, technically we can go ahead and do it on the 27th, but it gives us three days to get everything, if, depending on if there's changes, that's a very short timeline for us to get things in there. So we want to make sure that that's understood which is why we usually do it at the first meeting in june Certainly. so that we can make sure just if i mean 
traditionally we don't have, there's not a huge number of changes, but you know, we want to make sure we have enough time to get all of that done. So, so uh, in order for us, for the council to be able, if it chooses to, to have an imprint on the capital improvement budget though, we would want to hold that separately from adoption of the budget, I would think. So what's your best advice on how to do this? Well, if we want to do, if I mean, we can do a separate meeting. I don't know if that, it's not a very, you know, I think what do we have on there, 30 minutes or an hour for the capital improvement program? Um, Mayor, it could also give us a chance to come back with answers to the questions that have come up yesterday and today. Okay, Councilmember uh, Brown. Could we have that portion of our meeting, have the CIP hearing at the beginning of our meeting on the 13th um, and then adopt the budget later in the day? I don't imagine for the CIP there are going to be major changes. Is that possible? Sir, yeah. It, it does come to, yeah, we can do that. I think that was the initial thought was we would do the CIP at the beginning and then we would have the adoption after that. That doesn't, so yeah, I. I we would like that. That, that would works. be ideal in that our works. world. <laughs> Councilman Brown, great suggestion. I'll amend my motion then to okay. continue the CIP uh, budget to the beginning of our June 13th meeting prior to budget adoption. Agreeable to the second. Agreeable. Yeah. Debate or discussion? Ms. Bruner? I missed the reason why we're doing this. Because we're running a few hours behind today, have, uh, the way our budget hearings have been going yesterday and today. Got it, thank you. Um, and one follow-up question, do we need it to be a, a two separate meetings at, on the same day or it can be the same meeting? I believe it can be the same meeting. Okay. We, That's we, correct. We okay, great, doing. thank you. So thank you very much. For the debate or discussion, clerk will, clerk will call the roll. <coughs> Council members Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Helen Tari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. <laughs> Motion carries and so ordered. We are on the Council and City Manager's budgets. This will be presented by our Assistant City Manager, Ms. Schmidt. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council members. I am happy to be here to give you an overview of our fiscal year 24 budget. Um, our agenda, my agenda has a pattern, as you have been able to figure out by now, all the departments. First off will be the who and the what of the city manager's office, our achievements for this current fiscal year 23 in process, and our goals for the next year in fiscal year 24, and the budget to be able to support those goals. So our services and who delivers them. Uh, when you look at our organizational chart and the functions and the services that we deliver. We start out with our amazing city clerk's office and you get to interact with Bonnie and Julia uh, at least twice a month and they do an amazing job. And I'll go over a little bit more detail of the different functions within each one of these areas in the next slide. We also have citywide communications within the city manager's office and all of you have been um, amazed and astounded by Erica's smart uh, communications and videos of late. We also have our homelessness response team, a very, another small but mighty team within the city. And you heard their um, specific budget, not just for the city manager's homelessness response, but for the broader city integrated work with public works and PD as well. We also serve various programs and projects Examples of those are climate action and sustainability, health and all policies, and Westcliff, which you saw last night. We also uh, support the city council and um, your business of creating policies for the city and ordinance and such. And then we also oversee the overall city operations and administration. This is a um, little bit more detail of each one of those vertical areas in citywide communications. We have, um, we do emergency and public information and media responses, digital, social, and other creative services, and press releases, ongoing media work, 
and then internal communications as well. So our employee all hands meetings and any of the work that we do to support any of our departments internally as well as externally. Homelessness response, you heard from them yesterday. Their major functions are shelter and care, outreach, and um, encampment response. Our city clerks division, you interact with them on the specific pieces of the way that they do uh, meeting conduct, but they also do um, records management, elections, and then um, community information, and they also do small things like public records requests. For the city council support and our overall city administration, on um, the right side, left side, left side, Laura, of that, <laughs> we have uh, commission and committee support, and we'll show you a smattering of who those commissions and committees are. Any council ad hoc committee work that you guys establish an ad hoc um, subset of the council to work on something, we'll help with staff that. We work on strategy and administration, like supporting the five-year strategic plan process that's in, uh, that we're working on right now. That'll come back to you in June, uh, in the independent police auditor and the legislative program. On the overall program and project management side on the city administration work, we also uh, do general ad hoc programs and projects. So things that come up that are big, like the Westcliff work, things that come up that are smaller, we'll deal with as well. If there is more than several city departments involved or it's citywide, chances are the city manager's office will deploy staff to help with that. Our amazing climate uh, sustainability uh, work from Tiffany Wise West there, and in her spare time, she's also picked up health and all policies and equity. She also helps with the citywide grant coordination. So we are uh, chasing a lot of grants out there to supplement our revenue streams, and um, Tiffany takes the citywide perspective and also helps facilitate our departments working with a um, certified list of grant writing firms that can help us if we need it. And we also sit on various joint powers authority boards on behalf of the city. The information below is the actual head count per job title. I'm not going to go into it in detail, but in the slide in fiscal year 24, uh, we do have one personnel ask and one reorganization, and that'll be reflected later in the fiscal year 24 portion of the presentation. This is a smattering of the commissions and committee work and other work from those verticals that we saw on the previous slide. On the standing committee side, we support and assist with things like the Children's Fund, the Climate Action Task Force, the Commission for the Prevention of Violence Against Women, Health and All Policies, and the Public Safety Committee. On the ad hoc and project side, uh, all in shaping our future, a effort to modernize our organization, as well as imbue a culture of continuous improvement in the way that we go about our business. That is what All In and Shaping Our Future is about. We also staff the Budget and Revenue Ad Hoc Committee, the Housing Ballot Measure Ad Hoc, Sugary Sweetened Beverage, and then other projects that come up like Tobacco Waste, the Water Street Bridge, and I've already mentioned Westcliff. The Joint Powers Authorities that we sit on and support um, on behalf of the city are the animal shelter, the library system, and Santa Cruz Regional 911, which takes care of our dispatch. Other ongoing work that we're involved in is sitting on the 3CE board. We collaborate and are the conduit to the county's core program and the county's homelessness coordination committee and the housing for health board as well. We also staff um, such um, groups such as the Monterey Bay Resources Group and the Monterey Bay Regional Climate Project Working Group. So Tiffany sits on both of those. And that's just to name a few of them. This is the organizational chart for us. Um, I'm not going to go at it in a grave amount of detail, but it gives you an idea in your agenda packet of who reports to whom in our organization and um, all of our different employees. I am happy to say that we are one person, one position shy of being fully staffed in the city manager's office, which is, I think, as close as we've gotten in the nine years I've, plus I've been at the city. So um, I 
M is our principal management analyst. She's a recent addition. Brittany over in the city clerk's office is another recent addition as well as Bernie. Um, he is a management analyst that is reporting to Tiffany. So we're very excited about our new folks. And then Susan Oki, Susie Oki started a year ago, but I don't know that she was around the last time we had the budget presentation, so I wanted to mention her as well. She's our half-time homelessness response community relations specialist. So what have we been up to in fiscal year 23? And keep in mind these achievements were a point in time and are reflected in the budget book as of about February, I believe. So the clerks um, in the November of 2024 coordinated our first district-based election and also helped with the paperwork and the signatures and everything else that goes along with two citizen-based initiatives. They administered 32 regular and special council meetings and they made sure that we hit the 98% deadline com um, compliance for statements of economic interest. That is your form 700. And if you haven't done it for this year, you might want to do that for Bonnie. Uh, they also managed uh, about 270 public records requests. So all of those filter through the clerk's office. On the climate action, sustainability, and equity front, they adopted an equity-based climate action 2030 plan. And they also uh, conducted a uh, 2023 city grant, citywide um, grants strategic roadmap. So they went through, Tiffany went through and worked with the departments and figured out all the different grant areas that we needed to go after for across all the departments. And we have a consolidated view for that now and have targeted areas of opportunity. Um, Health and all policies, that committee worked on a Santa Cruz Like Me study that has a lot of great recommendations and is part of our fiscal year 24 implementation goals. And then uh, we also de developed and delivered a 2023 ledge program and international sea level rise workshop. And then the beginnings of our West Cliff uh, integrated roadmap and coordination of that amazing team. On the city manager's office side, some highlights are we will complete by, uh, no, we won't. It'll be August. This will be the final adoption. So the city five-year strategic plan is in process, and I would anticipate we would have final adoption and begin to roll that out in August. We have started and launched our continuous improvement and modernization program. That's the all-in shaping our future. And then we also helped coordinate and will complete um, the homelessness lobbying one what was spoken about yesterday. That one is done and will be effective as of June 1st. And then we are in the process of completing a polling and public opinion research RFP, as well as a city branding and communications one. Uh, what did you guys achieve? You achieved a lot of time in meetings. So this is a comparison over time of the fiscal years of um, the meetings and if that were a heartbeat, it would be very erratic. Our longest meeting um, happened in fiscal year 21 at 15.7 hours, and our shortest meeting happened in fiscal year 22 on January the 11th at 3.55 hours. Average times. So rather than seeing the up and down, uh, it's you've gone from 9.9 .9 hours on average, and this is for regular meetings only in fiscal year 20, down to 7.31 hours in fiscal year 23. <laughs> so yeah, give you guys a pat on the back and the mayor a high five. So that's um, our accomplishments and targeted accomplishments for 23 and in fiscal year 24. I have not um, translated the two pages of goals that are in your budget book. I've put just a subset of them up here from our different divisions. So our five-year strategic plan will be get completed and we will champion and roll that out as well as deliver reoccurring re reporting in fiscal year 24 and beyond. Uh, the city clerk's office will be working with all the different departments and the staff leads for the various commissions to execute a universal onboarding process. 
And then it, the integrated West Cliff roadmap will deliver portions of that roadmap at the end of August. And then the 50 year plus and um, coalition partnership update to you by the end of the calendar year, year as directed. Was it just yesterday? Just yesterday. Um, it seems so long ago. And then we will also begin the execution of the related projects. But you also know that many of the public works and the post-disaster recovery projects are already in process. Santa Cruz, like me, is the one I've highlighted on the health and all policy side. There were various recommendations. Um, one of them that stood out is working with the county and with our internally with all of our commissions and committees to have more balanced representation on our groups. Not And then in order to be able to do that, to change the application process and the way that we go out and um, coordinate and get applicants to help us do the work that we do. We also will implement a coastal change monitoring network on the climate side and then execute various service improvements and organizational monetization projects. Budget numbers. So in order to be able to deliver these services, what does our budget look like? So for the city council, you have about 550,000, half a million dollars in your budget. 70%, uh, it's a 70-30 split between personnel for your stipends and, and, and such and your services and supplies budget. You always carry a baseline for facilitations and meeting and meeting support for things like strategic plan updates. The employee appreciation event, which usually occurs annually in the winter time, you have training and travel budget. And then also included in fiscal year 24 is an update to the expense accounts that was recently adopted with the new district engagement um, policy and that equates to a little bit over $12,000. We also fund any mobile technology needs and updates to your iPads and other accessories and recommended from the council revenue and budget ad hoc committee is an additional $20,000 for tenant sanctuary and their work to help renters in our community and that uh, total would go up to $50,000. So it's currently 30, the recommended increase of 20 would take it to 50. The city manager's office budget, uh, the city manager's office coordinates something like 13 activity codes technically. So those are the little four digit codes in Eden. So I've tried to break this up so that it makes more sense functionally. In this pie, you have the city manager's office, um, the membership and dues that we participate in, things like the League of California Cities, our climate action work, and that includes health and all policies, the city clerk's division, as well as our independent police auditor. So this is the breakup of those different areas. We have included some inflationary increases in the dues and memberships because those increase and we don't really have control over that. We also have some additional administrative temp dollars in there for the mayor and council for us to be able to bring additional bandwidth as needed. We have a one-time project for citywide branding and communications updates. We also have added ongoing funds for ballot measure consulting for both the poll side and the consulting side. We usually just deal with those on an ad hoc basis, but over the years it's been reoccurring, so we asked finance to um, get that taken into account in our budget. Uh, ongoing health and all policies, we've retained the $15,000 uh, that we commit to that program every year, and that is most often used for meeting facilitation and plan development for health and all policies. Uh, we have a $50,000 grant pool of money, and that helps departments hire from our pool of grant writing firms that we got through an RFP process. And what happens there is you take money from the pool to hire one of the uh, consulting firms from the pool. And then if you win the grant, then you'll be able to put the money back from the administrative overhead charges of that grant. So it's just kind of an ongoing pool. And then in some cases where we don't get the grant, then um, that money just becomes an expenditure instead of being replenished. In the city manager's office, overall for the city manager's office and the homelessness response team, 
Our personnel asked for the fiscal year is a principal management analyst, half of which is for the city manager's office, and I'll go into that a little bit more in detail at the end of all the pie charts. On the city manager's office side, the community programs work. Lisa covered a fair amount of this yesterday, but this represents the entirety of our investment in community-related services and programming. Uh, the animal shelter, we participate in the Joint Powers Authority, so they basically are our designated animal shelter and animal control function. They have asked for a 10% increase, and I think that's reasonable during the COVID years. We took a couple of budget cuts, and they were able to stay really lean, and now they are ramping back up to the pre-pandemic levels. Ongoing core programs, so we will be next fiscal year in year two of a three-year investment cycle, and that's the $1.03 million. We also have in the gray slice of the pie, Lisa mentioned this yesterday, the downtown outreach worker program, the mental health liaisons that work with our police department and the county hopes team that helps connect homeless individuals to services. CPVAW is also in here, and the Ad Hoc Budget and Revenue Committee asked for an additional $15,000 for reinstituting self-defense classes, so that is in, in the budget proposed to you. And then on the City Manager's Office Homelessness Response Team, the blue pie represents uh, Lisa, Larry, and all of our homelessness outreach specialists, and then the orange pie is the 1.48 or so million dollars that she spoke about yesterday. Also in that blue pie is the addition of the half principal management analyst. So we're looking to hire one person who would split their time between the two functions. The other part of the personnel changes for the city manager's office on fiscal year 23, 24 is a consolidation of our community relations specialist. Right now, we have Erica Smart in our communications area, and we have half time of Susie for homelessness response. We have three separate community relations specialists. One of them is in the police department, one is in public works, and one in, is water. Organizationally, we are asking to consolidate those three underneath the city manager's office and Erica so that we can get some synergies of skills as well as leverage across our organization. So a for instance would be if there were 25% up down capacity available at any given point, how do we harness that more effectively for the entire city? If we have five projects going on in this department and three projects going on in this department, instead of just working on the three projects in this department because they have a dedicated community relations specialist, how do we prioritize across those eight projects? And what is the biggest bang for the buck for the city that helps our community, that helps us deliver services or a project that means um, that has a higher priority than something else? So those are the types of things that we are hoping to get out of this. It's going to be a new world for us. So we haven't asked for anything additional. We want to consolidate the folks, see how it goes, create the operational support model, and then um, take a good pulse of what's working well and what is not working well. And then in the spirit of continuous improvement, make adjustments as we need to and get it all figured out. In the homelessness response silo, you'll see highlighted in orange a half-time PMA. And then in the city manager's office, you'll see another half-time PMA. So we would like to hire one PMA and have them split their time. That'll give them some flexibility of sometimes they may be working more on homelessness response things, sometimes more on the city manager's office work. But as Lisa alluded to yesterday, things like being able to develop the lobbying, the federal or the state lobbyist RFP for homelessness response, that's something that we had to jump in on to help the homelessness response team because they don't have a PMA looking into and beating the bushes for additional uh, vendors in the sheltering space, that takes a lot of time. And if you think of the world that Larry and Megan and Jeremy and Chris 
and Lisa live in, they don't have that capacity. So how do we supplement their capacity, even doing quarterly fiscal updates on the homelessness response with the rest of the team and with the council? It's a lot of lift, and so we're asking to be able to supplement them. Additionally, on the city manager's office side, you saw the list of standing committees and the potential list of the ad hocs that come up and then the projects that come up. It takes a lot of work to do that right now, and that's pretty much entirely resting at this point on some help from me, depending upon the subject, but mostly on M. So we would like to get some additional capacity there. And this is our um, first attempt to supplement that, get some help, and hopefully be able to um, get some of this covered a little bit more without burning out our staff. And with that, I am done. And what questions do you have? Ms. Schmidt, thank you very much for your presentation. And Mr. Huffaker, thank you to you and your staff who provide such great uh, leadership in our councilmanic form of government. And we appreciate that every single day and the support that you provide uh, to help us get our work done as well. It's very much appreciated. Uh, everyone in your department, as far as I'm concerned, is, is, a, is a star who uh, perform uh, every day at, at a great and high level. Very much appreciate it. Let me see if there are questions or comments for the city manager. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Laura, for the presentation. And as Mayor Keeley said, all the great work. Um, I wanted to note that the uh, Children and Youth Bill of Rights work that, that the city manager's department has done a great job of picking up and um, I know we'll be continuing to do, that wasn't noted in the accomplishments or goals for FY24 and I think it should be because um, you know, we held our first State of the Youth Community meeting with our first youth liaison and we'll be bringing the first State of the Youth report um, hopefully at the end of the summer. So. Just to note that the work has been great. It's new to that to the city manager's office, and um, I'd like yeah. to see that reflected. Thank you. Um, that, that was one of those timing things with the deadlines and totally. Yep, thanks. I got it. Um, and I think similarly, um, district engagement I didn't see uh, reflected in sort of the work moving forward. And, and I and I know that there is that commitment as we passed a, an agenda item prior. So. Those were just my comments, no, not really questions, but thank you for all of the great work. that You do, the city manager's office does um, carry a lot of balls and um, isn't necessarily topic specific. So I just wanna acknowledge that and, and thank you for that because it's, it's difficult to kind of switch hats and, and you do it really well. Um, I'll just, I'll let my colleague comment on the health and all policies. Mm -hmm. Madam Health and All Policy. Oh. Right <laughs> well, I'll, take, yeah. I'll take the baton. Yeah. Um, thank you. Yes, I appreciate, I know you guys do a lot in the city manager's office, so I too just, that goes very recognized and I know we put a lot of pressure and also on our city clerks, so thank you. Um, I guess I have one question and it was around the communications. Are those folks going to be shifting over to the city manager's off physical office space there? Okay. Yep. And so, and then sharing their kind of roles or how does, right. it, okay. They will be moving. Um, we've consolidated the city clerk's staff together in anticipation of that. We're working on um, various moves and furniture buys and things like that. So they will come over and be as close together as we can get given the office space situation. And um, the operating model still needs to be finalized, but what we're envisioning is aligning the various community relations specialists with the, where the, the departments with whom they have affinity and deep knowledge of right now, and then additionally aligning all of them across the board with other departments. So if you think of planning and community development, economic development and housing, parks and rec, who don't have community relations specialists, so how do we have a model where those departments have somebody to go to as well, but then also we have flexibility to assign based upon subject expertise and skill set, as well as um, capacity, Great. depending upon the project. I mean, at some point, I would just be curious, like the communications plan, I think part of what I've observed my time on the council is a very um, just challenging 
environment for communications and how can we be not so reactive or put on a defense and defending you know facts essentially or strategy but also thinking holistically about how um, you know we can have a proactive approach especially with so many really big things that we have here really outlined today in our budget and I see Erica. Erica has popped on I think she she has um, she has some great thoughts and direction that sure she's taking us in so I'm going to hand that over to her. Thanks, Ms. Laura, Martin, and thank you, everyone, uh, for the questions about our new communications team. It's super exciting, and I obviously have had my hands full over the last six months of getting to know all of our different departments and all the really just great work that everyone's doing. It really is just an incredible team citywide, and I'm looking forward to bringing in this skill set. We have these great community relations folks already on board that have that a uh, special interest in public works, PD, and uh, uh, water, and being able to leverage their skill set to serve our other departments, I think is going to be really crucial for um, modernizing our communication strategy and also leveraging their skill set so that we can serve the community in a more proactive way. And I have lots of different ideas that I could give you a whole presentation on at some point uh, to talk in more depth about our communication strategy. But the big things I'm looking at are one, being able to uh, provide better support for our departments, streamline our communications policies, and really modernize what we're doing and how we're doing it so that we can better serve uh, the community and from an internal and external approach. Right, that sounds really good. Yeah, thanks, Erica. I appreciate that. Um, and then in terms of the health and all policies that Council Member Shebra Kalantari Johnson referenced, <laughs> um, you know, one of the things that I mean, I'll just I'll just say it. I'd like to see more funding personally in that in that budget area. I think Tiffany is really um, doing an exceptional job, and she's got many hats that she wears. Um, and I think from when it first took off, it was in you know, in response to a community-wide um, listening session and ordinance passing and then operationalizing. And then now it's really integrated even more so in a way that's, um, you know, written into our, our budget, right? And so for me, I personally feel like one of the things that it offers, and if you look at kind of the budget and that, you know, we're, we're looking at end of the line response with our funding for homelessness services particularly. So if you look at it in comparison to that, you're now dealing with people after they're in crisis and having challenge. But the health and all policies framework in many ways is about a preventative upstream approach in terms of how we're trying to build healthy people, healthy community and sustainability. And we have all of these also focus areas within the budget that I feel um, you know would be really great to see how we're meeting those performance measures and having more System, you know, systems in place to to track, um, you know, what we're doing to achieve these these goals, um, amongst many other things that I think could be possible with with health and all policies. From working with, for example, a point that I referenced earlier, which was the um, workforce development, right? So working with our knowing that the city is uh, isn't alone, able to accomplish all the elements that go into place, the, the recipe for a, a healthy and thriving community. It takes business engagement, it takes workforce development, it takes education. We see that you know enrollment's going down, um, workforce housing in terms of teacher housing, et cetera. So I think as we're also really being um, strategic about some of these initiatives that we're, we're really wanting to embark on or continue our journey on, um, to have some of, some kind of support behind that, and I and I don't want to say I hasn't been enough with Tiffany. I think she's fantastic in doing the best she can, but I think she could use more support. And I, so, however that looks in terms of, um, you know, I don't know what the council feels about that or has thoughts on, but in terms of coming back and helping me understand how that could be potentially integrated or shown in other ways with throughout the the budget would be helpful for me. I'll leave it there. <laughs> Very good. Ms. Collintari Johnson. Sorry, I know I've already spoken. I just want to right. add to that, um, to note that the Health and All Policies has now taken the Community Programs Committee, as you all know. And um, oftentimes when we have great ideas, like exploring tobacco waste product, it falls under Health and All Policies. So the work of the committee mm -hmm. um, and the staff to the committee has expanded since it was first brought to the council six years ago, whenever it was. Yeah. That was it. 
And just real quickly, I'll chime in on that. And Laura may have thoughts too, but I appreciate those comments, Councilmember Watkins and Kalantari Johnson. Um, it is true that health and all policies has grown in scale since its inception. And I appreciate the sensitivity around the full plate that Tiffany has as well as she's inherited um, a number of really important programs that she manages out of our office. Um, one of the halftime, the full-time uh, analysts that uh, Laura had mentioned earlier, part of that was um, in the spirit of providing her with some additional support. Also acknowledging that I think we're gonna to need to continue thinking through and troubleshooting how, how we can best, um, from a sustainability standpoint, support those programs. And you know we're gonna be pursuing other revenue opportunities. Um, I think that's something that, that, that is another element we can consider as part of those opportunities as well. So more to come. Okay. I think long-term, one of the things that Tiffany and I, and Matt and I have talked about is with Bernie coming on board as a management analyst to see how what what type of capacity that we garner from there and then what how that is helping with Tiffany's workload and then the entirety of health and all policies climate action grants and legislative program right so and keep an eye on that see how it goes what kind of bandwidth capacity that we get from that because the other thing we need, there's a lot of different things that we need to consider moving forward, whether it's funding for um, professional services consulting help, whether it's internal staffing. Do, do we need, for instance, a grants management, grants writer person? How does that help the capacity for Tiffany and this whole division that we are now standing up within the city manager's office? Is it a principal management analyst? Is it a project manager? Because you need somebody with integrated, part of the magic formula for Westcliff is an integrating project manager who has overall project management superstar like skills to be able to work with all the departments and build the bridges. So that's part of the secret sauce, right? So we're trying to figure all of that out, but I don't think we've landed anywhere. So we wanna definitely let that percolate, marinate, whatever the word is, um, and be able to come back to you all with a, with a recommendation and a conversation. I think that sounds, that sounds really great. And I, I recognize that she, yes, I really appreciated seeing her having that support. I think our climate needs clearly are gonna be um, more pressing and requiring a lot more. And a project manager to help across departments I think is really great for any organization and particularly for an initiative like Health and All Policies when it touches really essentially all of the divisions and departments. So however that's part of that strategy I think really fits with the intention and as something that we're seeing show up within every area of our, of our city too. So I would love to hear back um, at some point if possible. We will definitely come back to you. Thanks, Laura. <laughs> Council Member Brown. I think my question is uh, for us and, and a little, maybe a little rhetorical, but I, um, where are goals and accomplishments? The city councils. <laughs> I, um, it, you know, it occurs to me and, and somebody else mentioned it and I thought, well, I'll just say it here. Um, I, I recognize that a lot of what we do cuts across. I mean, we are here to, um, you know, theoretically provide oversight for, um, you know, public funds as they are spent in city operations. And um, so we're kind of in, involved, we touch all of it in some way, a lot of it very indirectly, I would say. Um, but there are things that we do that um, perhaps we could think about highlighting. And it seems like now with uh, having a, a four-year mayor, someone who's gonna be um, on board and really at the helm that we could think about for next year, uh, putting together a, a little bit more from from our end. My hope is your goals are, are going to be the five-year strategic plan and the format that we come back to you with a recommendation of how we keep that updated, the measures we track and the reporting that we do on a consistent basis. I would like to have that at the front part of a future budget books and because that's that's the vision for the city that you developed for the next five years. Take that vision, take those focus areas and the strategies and report on that and how we're doing because you all spent a, a lot of time in interviews, 
talking with community members in a workshop. You'll spend more time at a next couple, of, uh, two more council meetings. And we need to like embed that into our organization. And I think that you, you have expressed your goals for the city through the strategic plan and that's the way it should be. I could just say thank you for that. I, I absolutely agree and um, really was just thinking about it in the context of this document and you know the, the continuity here. But I, so I hope that we really can, um, and I'm glad to hear you're thinking in, about it in that way that we can integrate that into everything and make it clear these are citywide goals, these are the council's goals and um, I'm we're measuring. At, I'm looking at M because she's like combing the internet for and we're gonna, we're gonna create something better and more spiffy than any other city has. <laughs> uh, thank you again, Ms. Schmidt, and thank you, Mr. Huffaker, and all of the folks in the city manager's office. Uh, I have a few questions. I, I do think in the spirit of council members, council member Brown's sentiment or the direction she was working, and I, I think that on the city manager's list of accomplishments uh, on page 98. I think there's three, six, seven, eight, and on 99, two more. I think there's, a, there's at least 10 which are there as a function of council direction and leadership. And I don't uh, resent at all the city manager putting those in as an accomplishment because they were activities that were directed by the city council and that's the city manager's job. We're the policy makers, we are as to what you are as to how. And uh, we don't try to do your job, you're kind enough not to try to do ours. So, and we work very cooperatively, I think, uh, day in and day out uh, with each other, but I, I associate myself with the comments there. As to whether or not the strategic plan reflects uh, any kind of five-year, multi-year uh, uh, policy direction of the city, I think there's some, tr some truth to that, but it is not entirely true. We have elections every two years. Elections are the way uh, we establish priorities in, in the democracy by who we elect and send here. And so I think that uh, the strategic plan is a helpful document. I think it is quite valuable. The exercise is enormously helpful in terms of coordination, prioritizing where we focus our resources and so on. Uh, I don't think it is the only way to read what are the policy objectives of the city council. I have another issue uh, here and that is, I think that it is fair anyway, and the city manager and I had this conversation briefly when, when I first had the the good fortune to take this office. And that is that when we look at issues around diversity and equity and inclusion, as it relates to the city council, I think that a way to address at least some issues around that has to do with who can literally run for office, uh, who can uh, either with a relatively low paying job decide they're going to run for city council and get another low paying part time job and whether that is a barrier to entry for people to even choose, even dream, even think about running for city council. I think also there is a question of the staffing support for council members. I want to make this absolutely 100% clear. There's not one thing that I have asked for or tried to do with the city manager's office where there was any resistance or pushback. It's always, yes, let us help you try to do that, even if you don't agree with it, that you would that you provide the support to help us uh, advance our, our, our policy goals and objectives. And for that, I am, I am very grateful to you. I think there is, having served in two capacities as a staff member and now four capacities as an elected official, uh, the role of staff to an elected official is very different than uh, the kindness that is extended to the council by the city manager's office. Again, 
I've, I've yet to encounter and suspect I never will uh, a lack of willingness on the part of the city manager's office to provide assistance. It is a different relationship between an elected official and a staff member, however, uh, in helping formulate that, uh, those policies, in executing those policies from a response to constituent point of view and elsewise. Uh, I think it would be useful, and I don't think we ought to do this in conjunction with this budget. Do not think we should do it. But I do think we should consider at the mid-year budget review I think we should consider a multi-year plan to step up the city council salaries and city council staffing directly uh, uh, hired by each city council member. If that's a 0.25 to start with, whatever the number, the number is not important to me at this stage. What is important is uh, these local governments, and this one in particular, overperforms uh, for a city its size. Uh, we see that in the administration. We see that in departments. We're a very aggressive, creative, engaged city, and so are our constituents. And I think that it would be helpful to take a look at a possible three- or four-year plan uh, for doing that, which primarily, from my point of view, uh, it would be designed to take down what I think is the single largest barrier. I think going to district elections was enormously helpful in terms of knocking down a barrier to entry running for city council, the cost of a campaign. Uh, this, I think, is the service in office equivalent of that, which is how can we best do that? How can we make sure that a very, very wide range of folks in the community can have it even enter their mind that they could run for city council. So I would hope that uh, that, that would be something, Mr. Huffaker, that we could discuss six or so months from now and think <clears throat> about a two or three or more year plan for doing that. I appreciate the comments, Mayor, and as you stated, you and I have had a few conversations about this off and on over the course of the last uh, several months. Um, we would certainly defer to the will of the council if there was interest in doing so. Uh, we received direction uh, a few months back uh, to do a, a compensation analysis in terms of how the council and mayor's salary stack up against other comparable cities of our size and and a full service operation, that work is underway. And so if there is inter interest amongst the council, we could certainly expand that scope uh, to also look at options for uh, directly hired staff and what the process for that would be. There's a number of things we would need to look at, in yes. including potential, uh, potential updates to the city charter with regards to authority the council has over hiring of positions. Um, and I think we would wanna take a look at, again, what models are out there that would reflect what you're suggesting, so. Just some initial thoughts, but certainly defer to the will of the council. And I, my guess, thank you for that. My guess would be that there, there isn't unanimity on this body right now about what to do on that, but the opportunity to examine it, uh, not in the budget hearings, uh, not under that kind of pressure, uh, but in the mid-year review, uh, where you've got time to examine that, and uh, and we could uh, we could discuss it at that point and that would then give us plenty of runway uh, to actually start effectuating if it was a desire of the body to move in that direction what would be the step and the time period in which to do that so thank you very much sir. yeah we can certainly run that to ground and bring something back for the council's consideration okay with that please do uh, on this topic mm -hmm. in terms of the um Maybe it's for the city attorney, but if there were an interest in having increased salaries for the council members, does that need to go to a vote of the community? Mm -hmm. I just wanted to make sure in terms of, no. The, the muni code dollars. provides some flexibility in that regard. I'm sorry, what's that? There is a provision in the muni code that allows the council to increase compensation uh, within a certain parameters, which I can look up real quick, but uh, Otherwise, it would require a charter amendment. Okay. Okay. 
Yeah, I'm just trying to wrap my brain around. I mean, because what I hear is sort of two things. One is the, the sort of the council salaries and elevation yes. there, as well as staff. And so what mm -hmm. types of processes are in place or needed in, in response to options? But we can fit no, I would That's imagine. right, two, two moving parts. Yeah. yeah, okay. I would imagine all of that would come back. Mr. Huffaker, would you like us to direct or is this sufficient and you'll come back during that period of time, during, during the mid-year? Are you okay with that? Unless there are objections. Is there any objection to doing that? Seeing, hearing no objection, we'll, we'll see you. We'll, uh, we'll at, make it so. At mid-year budget hearings, uh, among other reports that you'll provide. Thank you very much for that. I have no further questions. Are there other questions, comments? Thank you. Mr. Huffaker. Thank you and all of your staff, thank you very, very much. I, speaking for myself, I suspect I might be speaking for the council. Um, this is not a doable job on our part without the level of cooperation and kindness that you extend to us every day. There is no tension between us. There are no games being played. Uh, seriously, you don't find that in every government. I've worked in a few. And I think one of, the, one of the great values of this small government is that uh, council members can disagree without being disagreeable. The administration and the council can work together cooperatively. Uh, your team, uh, senior and executive management team, are terribly responsible to us. Uh, uh, when we have d uh, needs and wants uh, during the calendar year, at a moment's notice, they are very responsive and responsible. I love the way you, sir, have developed this teamwork approach uh, among the departments. The department heads seem genuinely enthused about their work. They genuinely seem to like each other. Uh, which you also don't find in every government. And that begins at the top, that kind of spirit and ethic and value. And I want to thank you, Mr. Huffaker, for doing for that and for that leadership. Thank you. We're going to Mr. Mayor, on. I can respond to your question now if you like. I would like. So pursuant to uh, section one eighteen twenty of the municipal code. Uh, effective January 1st of 2010, each council member shall receive a salary of $1,710.35 per month. That 35 cents comes in handy. And the mayor shall receive a salary of $3,420.68 per month. Uh, the charter also contains a provision that allows the council to amend council member compensation by ordinance, but you cannot increase it beyond 5% since the last adjustment without an amendment to the charter. So you could um, adjust from 5%, uh, I believe it says 5% per, an, per annum, but uh, in any event, you could make an adjustment within those parameters, uh, otherwise it would require a charter amendment. Thank you, Mr. City Attorney. We appreciate that. We are on the Public Works budget. Uh, Mr. Nathan Nguyen, who is the director of the Public Works Department, is here to present the department's budget. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Mayor Keeley, council members, Nathan Nguyen, director of Public Works. Today I'll be presenting the Public Works budget for fiscal 24. Okay, so similar to the other departments, I'll be going over the organizational um, overview, as well as going through our core services. Um, I'll discuss some of the uh, highlights that we had this past year in fiscal 23, um, as well as diving into the actual budget itself. Um, and then I'll end with the, the challenges that we foresee ahead in this upcoming year. All right, so starting off with our <clears throat> organization. So Public Works is the largest department within the city of Santa Cruz. You can see that we have, uh, there's actually seven divisions here uh, that we oversee. And we put the FTEs under each one of those so you can see how many staff members are within each one of those um, divisions. Okay, so I'm gonna go, I'll dive into each one of the divisions and talk about our core services. And so first up is uh, our wastewater division. 
So our collection system, we manage uh, over 150 miles of underground sewer pipe, as well as 29 lift stations. Uh, we place about up to a mile of pipe each year as part of our maintenance program. Um, what's interesting about our city tubes and wastewater division is that we also clean and maintain our, our storm drain network. And so um, we also do the flood control uh, uh, system uh, support as well within the wastewater division. Uh, we have our wastewater treatment facility. It's a regional uh, facility that serves over 130,000 residents. So all of the city of Santa Cruz as well as an additional about 65,000 residents in the county. Uh, we generate in excess of about 70% of energy on site. And so we were able to, that's through our digester gas as well as our solar um, arrays that we have out there, you know, again, saving customers money and reducing our, our imprint. We also at the treatment facility have partnered, as you guys were probably well aware, with Soquel Creek Water District on the recycled water program. Um, that's going well, and we hope to see that launch uh, early uh, sometime next year. Uh, the, the facility itself treats about 7 million gallons per day. Um, and so, and let's see, what's also housed there is our environmental compliance lab. So environmental compliance provides uh, performs inspections, uh, does monitoring and guidance to our local businesses, as well as uh, discharges into our uh, sewer system. Um, our local limits, uh, it will be coming back to you guys later this June. We've done a lot of work. It's going to be one of our achievements I'll, I'll highlight later uh, that we've performed this year as we're trying to keep up with future mandates as we work towards uh, more recycled water. Uh, issue, we also issue discharge permits to individual dischargers um, and liquid waste haulers. Let's see, okay, our next division is resource recovery. Resource recovery system, uh, has a collections uh, um, subdivision. We provide refuse, being a full service city. We do recycling. We also do green waste. And as a part of our Senate Bill 1383, we're also doing food scrap waste as well. And so we're doing the collections now, but we're also working with, as I mentioned, in a, or I didn't mention earlier, but in a wastewater treatment facility that will be uh, potentially bringing our food scraps down there to help feed our digesters and completing that cycle. Uh, we also do street sweeping. We, we remove about 500 tons a year uh, of debris in our city streets. Uh, and this is, again, separate outside of the um, homelessness response field crew, which I'll mention in, a, in, a, in another division here in a minute. Um, at the resource recovery facility itself, um, we, you know, we process, we market, and sell our recyclable materials. Uh, we work with the county to accept hazardous waste materials at this site. Um, we also have methane gas um, that we collect there to help produce and reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and then waste reduction. So waste reduction is another core piece to our uh, resource recovery division. Um, we do waste reduction program to help us meet the city and state uh, mandates and goals. Uh, we go out there and educate both the public and businesses on reduction, reuse, recycling, you know, hazardous, house waste, uh, composting, and pollution prevention. Uh, the city, uh, the waste reduction team also provides, uh, does the city green business certification program, which is really popular. Funny that I had it. Got it. Okay. Our next division in public works operations. So, operations, we have a few different subdivisions in there. We have streets, maintenance. They do all of our, a lot of the minor work with regards to the sidewalk, curb, and gutter repairs, a lot of our striping, um, signs, um, uh, as well as repair and replace our street lights that you see on our roadways. Uh, they also do some vegetation management and some sediment control, debris removal along our creeks and rivers as well. Uh, the mechanical maintenance, that's housed over at our corp yard. So that's a team of about six mechanics who manage over 600 vehicles. That's roughly, that we roughly see about 4,000 work orders a year on. So those vehicles are citywide, so they include police, parks and rec, public works, um, so, and also heavy machinery as well. Uh, the city fleet um, also administers our replacement vehicle program. So again, we work with the other city departments on managing um, their fleet. And it's, we also have the 24-hour uh, fueling services at our corp yard that uh, mechanical maintenance oversees. OK, so facility maintenance. So facility maintenance, there's only four folks in, the, in this group. Um, they are the ones that do a 24-hour response to our facility emergencies. So that's a citywide uh, maintenance facilities uh, team. But that's housed within public works. 
Uh, they also provide safety inspections to all of our facilities. And then we also house in the uh, energy management uh, team within the operations. So we have a staff member who works on energy projects, works with Tiffany Wise West, as well as other engineers and other folks in other departments to help create energy efficiency. Um, you, you'll see some solar panels and so forth, as you guys may recall, were approved at our, our garages and, and, and um, at our, our uh, corp yard. Parking division. So the parking division, so we own and manage both uh, on-street and off-street facilities. We have four parking garages within our downtown core, as well as 19 surface lots citywide. Uh, they, we're a full-service city, so we do our own parking enforcement, as you may know. Um, and then we also manage the residential and business permit parking program. Um, within the downtown district, we only have one parking district. Um, those funds also go towards sidewalk maintenance, so you'll see a lot of street scrubbing. Um, and then we have public restrooms at our facilities and our garages, and so they help maintain those as well. I'm going to go through this quickly here for you guys. You know, it's a long day. <laughs> All right, so engineering division here. So engineering works uh, to manage our five-year capital investment program that you'll hear a little bit more about, uh, I guess, at the next meeting. I'll touch on it a little bit later today. Um, you know, this work, they work on um, a variety of projects in our capital, in our capital projects, including repair and improvement of uh, transportation projects, street and design, reconstruction, sloped stability, um, utility undergrounding, sewer, uh, sanitary sewer collection and treatment, uh, stormwater collections, refuse and recycling, as well as uh, city facilities that I mentioned earlier. Um, Another important function that we do within the engineering division is doing a lot of development review for both uh, residential and commercial projects. Uh, we issue over-the-counter permits for uh, street openings, uh, concrete work, utility installation, things of that nature. Um, we also do, uh, we also, the engineering team also has to do um, its own environmental work. So we also work towards getting uh, IMSMDs, notice of exemptions, um, and EIRs for our projects. Um, Within that development review, too, is that we also do review uh, traffic impact studies. So we work with developers on setting up those parameters and making sure that those uh, studies are complete uh, when those development projects come to you guys for approval. OK, so roads, our roads and sewer systems, storm drain and refuse. So the funding behind these uh, uh, is in several forms. So we have some that are gas, uh, that are enterprise fund and some that are uh, through grants. So some of the pass-through funding that we get is like SB1 gas tax funding, which is an important resource. Um, we also have, uh, as a community, has a pass Measure D as well as Measure H to help support our roadway reconstruction and funding alternative transportation projects. We have also have Measure E that was passed, uh, which also provides funding towards clean water uh, and clean beaches and rivers. Um, and en engineering does an overall excellent job, coupled, and I'll talk about traffic engineering in a minute, uh, with getting grants to implement our CIP projects. So traffic engineering, uh, if similar to the engineering division, uh, there's about six folks in this group, so it's a small but mighty team. You're going to hear that quite often. But they do a lot of projects uh, related to uh, active transportation. The division really works closely with the parking team as well on analyzing traffic patterns, managing our traffic signal system. Um, a big part of what they have to do is also responding to a lot of citizen requests that we receive, whether it's traffic calming or, or lighting or anything of that nature. They've developed uh, the traffic demand management uh, program as well, which is also known as Go Santa Cruz. Uh, you may have heard of that and it's active in the downtown core. Uh, we hope to expand some of that maybe potentially later um, in other areas. Um, they also do, I mentioned earlier about the development review and the traffic impact studies that they also are, are responsible for. On the transportation planning side, um, we've done several different plans. Um, we have the active transportation plan, which is, uh, was completed in 2017. And we're working towards getting a revision, getting a grant to revise that. Uh, we also did the local roadway safety program. That's a highway safety improvement program grant that we recently completed. And I'll touch on that about, about some meetings in a minute uh, with that. Um, <clears throat> we also assist with the climate action plan. So obviously, or as you guys may know, that transportation is a really big contributor to the greenhouse gas emissions in our county. And so we work closely again with Tiffany Wise West on the climate action plan, climate adaptation plan as well. Um, and as I mentioned earlier about the grants, we've been really successful. You may recall 
Uh, earlier this year, we received a $36 million grant for rail trail segments 8 and 9 construction, and you know, hopefully we can get uh, that groundbreaking in 2025. Uh, another component is our education and outreach arm. So uh, while well, I mentioned Go Santa Cruz being a really successful TDM program, we also have a Street Smarts program that you may recall. It's really successful in our schools. We really try to get the walking school bus program, teaching and educating kids how to walk and ride bikes uh, to school, to and from school. Um, it's actually so successful that I believe that the county is now taking that on as a regional program. So uh, Street Smarts is now going to be a countywide, uh, working with our regional partners. So we're helping uh, implement that. Um, I believe there was some mention earlier, too, about um, a bike share program. And so the bike share regional bike, uh, bike share program is coming back. It is going to be called B-Cycle, and we'll have a, a uh, ribbon cutting uh, groundbreaking ceremony for that hopefully next month. We'll, we'll definitely give you guys an update on that. Um, again, it's going to be beyond just the city. We'll be working with UCSC, uh, Cabrillo, County, uh, City of Capitola, uh, and Watsonville. So on to our achievements this past year. So I've got a couple slides here and some of the images of the major projects uh, and programs that were completed this year. Um, you know, up on the top left-hand corner, I'm really proud to say that I felt like our team really uh, was in good response to the storms that happened in January. So, so you can see over there that the, uh, some of the early uh, traffic calming measures that we put out there and that we've made some adjustments and continue to make adjustments, as you well know. Um, on the bottom left, our Trevithin storm drain project, as well as the middle bottom one, their chestnut storm drain and paving project, those were completed in this past year, and quite frankly, those completed just, just in the right time uh, prior to our January storms, because those of those streets uh, sustained a lot of flooding or localized flooding over the years, and so we're really happy to get those two projects completed just before the uh, bomb cyclones happened. Fortunately, you'll see the FEMA levy certification, that image actually is of the bomb cyclones, <laughs> that actually displays some of the riprap that we had on our levy. But we are making a lot of progress towards our levy certification. We, we hope to have that complete uh, in the next month or so as far as submitting the work that we have to FEMA. And then we'll have to wait to hear back as far as the formal certification from them. Uh, the San Lorenzo River, uh, River uh, Lagoon Culvert Project, where, you know, we really we were this close to getting it in, in before this year's uh, storms, but um, this year's the summer, but we're going to actually have to wait now until the river levels subside until, before we can actually fully complete that project. But that should happen very, very shortly. And then our landfill project, it's about a $6 million project. All the landfill <clears throat> uh, debris and stuff that goes there, that, that's, that life of that cell should be about another six years. Um, so before we have to work on that next, next project. Okay, and then a few more projects that I um, just wanted to highlight. The groundbreaking of Rail Trail Segment 7 Phase 2. Hopefully that will be in operation by the end of this year, the completion of the Highway 19 project. Um, really happy uh, to say that the Homelessness Response Fuel Crew is operating really well. Um, and I'll touch that on that in a minute about, um, about staffing, but um, they seem to be doing really well now. Um, there are parking access revenue control. So we've replaced most of that equipment in our downtown garages, and we're working on finalizing the equipment down at the wharf right now. And of course, we had our first um, electric refuse vehicle truck um, that we're proud to say that we're the first leading ones in the county. And then our local limits update, again, I, I kind of touched on it earlier. So this is going to be some work that's going to be actually presented to you guys next month as far as updating those local limits. The team has been really uh, proactive on trying to stay up to date with all the um, regulations and requirements as we move towards um, recycled water use. Okay, now for the budget. <clears throat> so here's a, a pie chart basically showing our expenditures. You can roughly see that two-thirds uh, of our budget is in resource recovery and in wastewater. And then you'll see that a lot of the, the work that happens, um, I just wanted to point out where we talk about traffic engine, transportation engineering and engineering is about two and a half percent of that. but when we talk about the capital improvement work that they do is, 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 uh, is um, quite large, right, as far as the overall um, improvements that they make throughout the city. And you'll see there that we have the mechanical maintenance. So that's basically fleet. That's our uh, 600 or so vehicles that I mentioned earlier that we help manage for, for across the city. Um, homelessness response, it's a small portion up there as well. That's our homelessness response field crew. Um, and then a couple of these other items up there, stormwater, um, and I'll go into a little bit more too. It's more of a challenged um, uh, part of our, our budget, and, and I'll talk about that in a minute. 
Okay, and so here are the revenues that come in within to our through our department. Again, refuse and wastewater, those are enterprise funds fee generated, so those are consistent, the roughly two thirds. And then there's a little bit of adjustments between the different um, uh, other uh, f sources that you see up there. Um, a small piece of that, though, is the general fund, which I'll go into you in a little bit in a minute. Okay, so general fund costs. So roughly our department um, has about a 10 million, or this is in fiscal 23, was about a $10 million hit within, onto the general fund. R a relatively small portion when you think about the overall uh, a pie of the general fund and then how much the actual department does with those general funds. So that traffic engineering, engineering, admin, those staff, that's, ma that's a majority of those costs. Now, um, the increase that you see between fiscal 23 and the 24 budget there um, is, a, is attributed to a few different things. Um, one is the homelessness response field crew. So now that we have a division, another division, who has four staff members, and I'm gonna uh, talk about asking for five staff members here in a second, um, is a part of that, as well as some of the operations side that we're adding to the budget this year that wasn't um, originally anticipated in the, f in the adoption of the 23 budget. We, again, it was a mid-year budget adjustment when we, when we were able to get some, some of the staffing going on, on the homelessness response field crew. And then uh, some of the other differences, too, is with regards to just salary increases. Um, we are a large department, but um, that's essentially what's showing up there. Okay. So some of the staffing changes here that we have in public works. So I mentioned the homelessness response field crew. Uh, we had uh, two, two workers, a senior and a supervisor. Uh, what we're asking for is to actually increase that to actually have a, an additional worker so that the teams can work in pairs while having a supervisor. Um, that, in conjunction with the approval of the um, mini trash compactor recently, should just substantially improve the services through the home or response from the homeless response field crew. So really excited and appreciate your guys' support on that. On the admin side, <clears throat> we have a couple different adjustments that we're proposing here. Uh, wastewater, uh, again, an enterprise fund is asking for an additional half person to work down at the treatment facility as they manage a lot more of that construction. There's a lot of POs being issued down there, things of that nature. Um, and then the um, communications relations specialist, as Laura mentioned earlier, so that, that is being removed out of this budget at this time, but then we're working on structuring the funding so that we can help us continue to support the um, new format for the um, communications team. Overall, only a net change of one, one uh, FTE. Okay, so now I'll go into the challenges. Um, we thought it would be best to start going into daylight some of the um, upcoming challenges that we see for some of the work that we're working to implement. Uh, stormwater financing, um, refuse rates, and wastewater. So on the stormwater funding side, uh, I mentioned to you earlier that we have a Measure E bond that was passed, I think, in about 2006, somewhere around that range. Um, generates about $600, $630,000 annually and goes towards um, a lot of monitoring, a lot of um, clean, clean beach activities, um, but it is woefully underfunded. It is not a significant source towards uh, implementation for CIP projects. It really is a status quo to just help us maintain the beaches and the rivers that we are currently uh, trying to do. Now, Fund 751, that's a, a utility fee, citywide utility fee, and so that generates, I think that comes in on your, your, um, your property taxes. And that generates about 570,000 annually. Um, but the, our stormwater projects, I was gonna mention a little bit earlier when we talked about this um, chestnut storm drain project, that was about a $2.1 million project. The Trevithin storm drain project was, um, I think roughly about a million. There's lots of other storm drain improvement projects that we wanna work towards um, that do not have a dedicated funding source. And so, um, 751, we, we, we just are already tapped out. And that's really similar to happening with 752, so the floodplain utility fee. Um, again, that's more of the San Lorenzo River levy in the surrounding area. The fund, the amount of money it generates is about 320,000 annually, but the maintenance of just the inboard side of the levy that we perform every year is roughly 300,000. And so you can see that that's not very much money left over to do anything else on the levy. And now, we had the FEMA accreditation process, process that we're in right now, so that we had some an injection from the Army Corps where we're uh, paying for the vegetation management on the outboard side as well as the rodent control measures. But 
Um, we're also woefully underfunded in that area as well. And so we'll bring, I'll be bringing back something to you guys with regards to a CIP in the next, um, I guess, in the next meeting. Some of these other items that were also within the stormwater fund that, uh, that I, I mentioned, so the levy maintenance, um, our upgrade to our pump station. While our pump stations worked well during our, uh, the, this last winter, uh, they are antiquated and we are needing to upgrade uh, both the Laurel Street pump station number one as well as add an additional pump station at, um, on SoCal. Um, and then there's a few other projects on there that you can see that are also lining up that, again, we do not have funding for at this moment. Okay, and then I'll move on to refuse rates. So this is something that we wanted to daylight with you guys at this budget hearing. Uh, this is actually something that we'll be proposing uh, to you guys uh, at the next council meeting. So in refuse, um, our rates right now, we're, uh, they haven't been increased since uh, 2018. And so it's been you know, almost five, five plus years here where we haven't had a revenue uh, or fee increase while our cost of doing business is, is continuing to rise. You know, things like the food scrap program, that wasn't something that was always something that we had to do. Um, as well as, uh, you can kind of see this chart right here where there's a, a dotted line if we make, if we increase our rates and then it, it, it uh, drops sharply, sharply towards the end. And that's because we're planning for um, a finance uh, Eden upgrade, which is about $4 million, as well as preparing for our next cell three, or our next cell project at the end of, um, at the end of the decade. Now, our operating budget, uh, we want to be able to have about six months of reserve in there, and that's, that's where that blue line of $14 million is set right now. So just daylighting that with you guys right now is one of the challenges, but something that you guys will see um, here very shortly. And then lastly, the wastewater rates. So wastewater also hasn't been upgrade, updated uh, in quite some, or I apologize, it's going through its uh, last rate increase later this upcoming uh, fiscal year. But at the wastewater treatment facility, um, we've kind of run through the honeymoon period down there where the last major upgrade we did was in the 90s. And as we worked towards additional mandates with um, um, uh, recycled water, I'm forgetting the state bill off the top of my head. But um, as we do that type of work, we need to upgrade our facility as well as some of the electrical. And so I'll, I'll touch base, I'll touch on that in a minute as far as um, the electrical upgrade, which is about a $40 million project that we're looking at that we need funding for. And then these are the, some of the other additional challenges. Um, again, some of them I've kind of already mentioned with the food scraps. I think you guys are well aware of the West Cliff repairs that we're all uh, working towards. Uh, we also have a project for an electrification roadmap that we'll be bringing back um, later this year. I believe that's working with Tiffany Wise West and our operations team to help look at our facilities and uh, how we get towards improving our net, uh, electrification network. I also put a, a bullet point on here about recruitment and retention. Um, while staffing levels, I'm proud to say that we're moving towards getting a lot of our uh, key critical positions filled. Uh, it still becomes a challenge as a lot of folks are retiring out and we're trying to bring in new staff and get them up to speed and a lot of these um, uh, critical and critical knowledge positions, especially at the treatment facility. You know, you, you can't just hire somebody new and then expect them to run at the same level. And so, uh, we, we are trying to work on towards a, um, a, a a better plan towards that. And then our major CIP projects, where uh, again, I don't, I won't go into the projects here. I'll be presenting some of those projects in the in the next meeting. And I thought I'd throw in this last slide after um, thank you, Mayor Keeley, for the reminder on the medians. So I put a, sh a short list here together. There's other intersections that have medians, but really these are the critical ones that I would mention that end up having a little bit more um, folks that are hanging out in the median or people are jaywalking and things of that nature. And so um, there, those are the listed on the left. And I wanted to also just reiterate the work that we're um, collaborating with, with economic development, um, as well as the planning department as, um, on this Ocean Street beautification uh, project. It's really at the initial stage right now, as you guys know, there's a survey out for the community to make some comments, but I also added an image there to the right as a striping plan that you guys approved um, earlier this year. So the Ocean Street paving project is proceeding, and so that is gonna happen this fall. We'll work on uh, either striping the median wider or potentially, depending on what comes out of the survey work, um, we may be able to do some hard improvements and actually widen the median at the beginning of Plymouth there. Uh, the goal, though, is to uh, potentially look at adding some other future improvements, whether it be um, maybe um, some type of fencing or artwork to also help deter people from being on, on our medians. Um, you know, looking at hardscape, potentially some landscape, but we know that our parks rec crews are limited 
as far as the, being able to maintain that type of work. So um, in the future, uh, next year, we could look at potentially doing like a pilot program, uh, do through an RFP process to really identify some of the improvements that could be proposed in, these, in some of these locations that are shown here. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Nguyen. Thank you to all of your staff who work across a range of very important public services, and we very much appreciate that. Ms. Brown. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you for all of your incredible work managing a very, very hectic, hectic being an understatement, uh, winter and moving through recovery now, along with all of the incredible work you've done to get funding for the rail trail, um, Segments eight and nine, segment seven. I mean, we're we're just doing wonderfully, and I want to acknowledge that and your team for for all of that work, that planning work, and then the work that happens um, on the ground in in real time. We were. Uh, I was with the mayor. Uh, we had a conversation. You were there, um, but I want to say this to everybody um, while we have the opportunity uh, with uh, some staff from the California Transportation Commission and the vice chair. Uh, to be chair of the Transportation State Transportation Commission, and universally, uh, the staff there lauded Santa Cruz, City of Santa Cruz, Public Works for um, here just being an incredible partner, um, hands down. They said over and over, and so um, and it really shows. It really shows. Uh, <clears throat> so and now I'm going to ask you the questions that. Um, Actually, I'll ask one question about, I did have, what, was wondering about segments eight and nine not being on the 2024 goals um, at, to, as a part, because that work is gonna be moving forward, but it sounds like you're talking about 25 for groundbreaking. So are you intending to save that for the that, that's big accomplishment? That's correct, yeah. Okay. I mean, I, I probably should have added actually just the uh, approval of the EIR was significant. And so thank you, that was a really big achievement on that project. Uh, the next phase, though, towards uh, right away and getting mitigations and permits in place, uh, we anticipate that to take another 12 to 24 months. And so I didn't necessarily think that uh, as we work towards also final design over the next year, uh, there is a potential that it could move into 24, but uh, I decided to keep it uh, into 25, and that's actually the way our grant uh, construction is set up right now as well. Got it. Thank you. Uh, and, and now I do have, I want to ask some questions that were brought to us earlier today um, just to, because I think this is something that uh, consistently people are interested in, and I want to make sure the public hears from you on this. So I, um, I'll just ask, uh, related to the Parking Enterprise Fund, the, the Downtown Parking District, that fund, ba there's no fund balance listed here, um, and so just wondering about that, is, there are people wondering about that fund balance, um, recognizing that in previous years it has been negative. Um, how do we fill those gaps? You know, how do we manage that uh, parking fund? And does the general fund end up covering some of those costs? Yeah, I'm happy to take that question. Thank you, Council Thank Member you. Brown. Thank you for the kind words, too, for the department. Um, when it comes to the parking fund, uh, it did take a significant hit due to COVID in the past few years. Uh, we worked with the business owners in the areas that help uh, maintain their businesses as well as keep our staffing uh, as well, not letting go people. Um, as you may recall, uh, we actually br uh, brought back the um, rate increase for the parking district. And so with those uh, approval, which is, I believe, going to happen on July 1st of this upcoming year, um, the fund is looking, the fund should be solvent in this upcoming year, uh, moving in towards the black and then allowing us to uh, hopefully expand some of the services within the downtown core. Um, but uh, the fund itself, as far as the general fund and parking fund, those do not intermix. There's no general fund dollars that are, that are going towards the parking fund. Thank you for clarifying that. I think that's the, um, my only set of questions here. For now. Thanks. Further on this? Ms. Kalantari Johnson. Sure, thank you. It's already been said, but thank you. Thank you for the great work and um, the presentation. Just a couple of questions. You mentioned the food scraps program is one of the challenges. Could you elaborate um, where the challenges are? Yeah, with that food scrap program right now, um, we launched the, the collection system uh, commercially initially last year, or maybe it was early the year before that. 
and then we've moved towards into the residential portion. And so I know there were there's some little bit of grumblings that have happened over, over this time, and so I think we're still working out some of those kinks. But now the actual uh, material itself, where, would, where do we process it? So currently we collect it and we bring it all the way back up to the resource recovery facility, and then it gets transported to another site out of our county to um, uh, dispose of or to, um, you know, uh, yeah, dispose of that, that material. Ideally, though, what we want to do is we want to be able to take it into our wastewater treatment facility. Mm -hmm. So we have another major CIP project, again, where there's a lot of them stacking up down there, um, that we need to, uh, that we are currently embarking upon right now. I say that it's a challenge because we don't really know where it's going to fit or how it's going to operate quite yet, but we do know that we want to be able to keep that, um, that source in-house and to, uh, to help power our, our treatment facility. Okay, great. I've heard some of the grumblings too. <laughs> um, so just getting into the budget, um, I just wanted to ask if you could comment on, it's a slight decrease, but the decrease in the street lighting budget, um, is it just that we've met the street lighting needs of the community, so we don't need as much? Why the like 60 or so thousand decrease? I, I believe when we were meeting with the operations team that they felt they could we were trying to uh, move different, uh, keep the uh, fund itself at the same level, not increase or decrease it. And so we were shifting some funds around. And so our streets team thought we could take some funding from the street light budget uh, while maintaining our, our services. OK, as long as we're lit up, that's a safety issue, as you know. Um, OK, just last comment is um, given the actions of yesterday's uh, Westcliff um, Item, I'm hoping we can see that reflected in the FY24 goals, specifically the completion of the zero to three year plan and implementation of those components, and then the development and completion of the uh, three plus 50 year plan. I appreciate the comment, and we can definitely, after based on yesterday's um, uh, decisions, that we can incorporate that into our work. Thank you so much. Ms. Watkins is recognized. Yes, thank you for the presentation, for the work, and it's nice to hear that you were recognized and celebrated, so I appreciated you sharing that, Councilmember Brown. Um, so you mentioned the Highway 1, Highway 9, and I just because I am involved in that intersection on a regular basis, I drive, that's part of my commute, um, so I just want to applaud the work that has gone. I know there's also some transition, I think. I just, I'm wondering your thoughts on how it's going so far in terms of the three lanes now. And I've witnessed certain things where I'm like, oh my gosh, like people aren't realizing, especially when you're turning from the nine onto the one southbound, that there's actually a third lane that can come and turn in that way too. So, how, I mean, I guess maybe it's a, a PD question too, is just how do you think that's going in terms of flow? Uh, I think my initial take is that the increased capacity, as though that was a part of this uh -huh. project and some of the safety improvements um, have been beneficial to that intersection. Um, I can't speak specifically to the um, actual increase in uh, efficiency through there, sure. but I do think that overall, the additional lane, the, 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 the third left turn lane, as well as the uh, second through lane going northbound on River towards Highway 9, um, has increased that capacity. And I know that we have some additional signage that maybe potentially could be discussed as you merge uh, on the north side of Highway 9 there, yeah. uh, going continuing northbound. But overall, I think it's, a, it's been a successful project by all accounts. I agree. I agree um, for those for those reasons, and then for the um, Ocean Street exit in terms of some of the backup there is that part of that inner you know is that part of the discussions for um, that intersection or not really? I, I don't believe so. Are you talking about the off ramp of yes. Southbound Highway One onto Ocean? Yes. That's currently not in the scope of work uh, as far as looking at potential improvements on Highway One Nine intersection. Okay. Uh, there is a future project that we have in our CIP that we're looking towards widening those bridges across the San Lorenzo River. And uh, maybe at that time we can incorporate uh, working with, again, both of these projects, no matter what we do, is going to be working with Caltrans. Uh -huh. And so making sure they can get on board with some potential improvements um, off both on the on-ramp and even on the on-ramp side as well. Yeah, no problem. No, I just, I see it backed up too. So it just seems, it just, I didn't know if it was part of that thought process. Um, and then I guess in terms of the Ocean Street, planning and you know one of the things i think it's important to revisit it's our entry to our our city it's really important to have that be a priority area it's also an area that's very dangerous with people literally running across the street it freaks me out all the time um, and i know there's fencing currently up right now um, which is 
you know, it is what it is, I guess. So in terms of the timeline associated with the plans for that, can you remind us when, you know, when we could start to see things happening around? I think the initial work that's going to be performed will be uh, part of the um, Ocean Street paving project. So you'll see that paving all the way through Plymouth, all the way down to Water Street. And so we'll see a lot of striping improvements, a little bit of media improvements as well. The work that's happening in conjunction with an economic development um, will we'll lag behind most likely as we parse through the survey, try to get ideas of what we can actually implement now. Um, and then I think a subsequent will have a bigger project because uh, the Ocean Street Beautification Project, as Bonnie mentioned yesterday, is, is I think, all along the a business district, so all the way down to SoCal Avenue. And so it's going to be a much larger effort when we talk about looking at making improvements along um, Ocean Street. Great. Yeah, I think it's important to prioritize that. It is the entry to our city, and I think we want to make sure that we're really reflecting who we are as best we can. So um, I look forward to seeing that coming. And then in terms of the fee increases, and um, when do you as assume, or what are your thoughts on timeline associated with that as well? Yeah, so for refuse, we're looking at trying to propose, and again, we'll daylight more of this next month, but trying to propose those rate increases for this fall okay. to help keep that fund going, and then as again, preparing for some of the work that's gonna happen over at the um, resource recovery facility. On the um, stormwater side, that's still one of our biggest question marks. It's always been a challenge to figure out where we get funding for stormwater. Again, there's no direct um, funding source, so we do apply for grants, and that's typically how we've done a lot of that work. And then on the wastewater facility side, the work is going to begin this year on a long-range financial plan. Um, that will go. That will probably go into um, fiscal 24 as well, and then or 25 as well. And then we'll probably be looking at a rate increase at the end of fiscal 25. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. For the questions or comments, Madam Vice Mayor. Um, I just quickly wanted to highlight. Um, I was shocked at the that the um, amount of illegal encampment debris removed. That's astonishing. Um, and thank you. Otherwise, that would end up in our watershed and at our beaches and out in our open spaces. Um, and then, the, and I don't know if this is possible, but with the rail trail, we've had. Both of us have had some people reaching out to us about the segments that have been completed, about the possibility of installing any trees. And I know that might be more of an RTC thing, and I don't need an answer, but I just wanted. I'm happy to speak to that yeah, as okay. well, actually. So as we developed the Segment 7 project starting in 2016, we did work with RTC on developing the plans and where we could actually locate and plant trees on their actual right-of-way. And so uh, in segment seven, phase one, I think we only removed one or two heritage trees. So the replacement was only, I think, four or five. But we ended up planting roughly 35 trees uh, in, in segment seven, phase one. And again, that's working with Cal or, uh, RTC staff on where, the, where that would be allowed. Um, we're working within a really tight, narrow right of way, of course. And then anything outside on the other side of the trail itself um, would be directly through the RTC as far as being able to plant additional trees, and then some of the private businesses that are on the south, especially between um, Swift and uh, Natural Bridges. And so we, we, I know that the economic team, economic development team, has worked with us and has worked with RTC, um, and we are embarking upon a art installation over off of Swift Street. So there is some, uh, but they did have to get some uh, an easement, I believe, for the art installation itself. And so there is a potential, but it is working with our, our partners and some of the private right-of-way owners that are out there. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions or comments? Mr. Nguyen, thank you uh, very much. I am... Oh, of course you can. I, I just want to say, I forgot about this um, in my zeal to talk about the... Um, <clears throat> The funding and uh, for active transportation and and rail trail, um, I see in your goals uh, furthering our our food too good to waste program, and I I don't have a lot of questions about it in particular, but I just wanted to highlight it here that it's it's listed in your goals. I mean, you're, we're talking about some you know major projects. We're talking and and this is a really important one, and it's sort of um, it's not your, part of your core. <laughs> um, activities, but it's something that I have found your department of uh, staff to be really proactive about, and I'm um, just really gl glad to see it here. So, so folks know, we are, we are really, we're in on a food too good to waste um, effort. Thank you. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Take a look at page 190. 
would in our binder is 196 and 197. That would be public works summary, budget summary, public works, budget summary, public works. Essentially, your money out, money in. Thank you. Yep. Would I be right in assuming the following, that on page 196, wastewater collection, wastewater treatment, wastewater source control, wastewater pump house, wastewater admin charges, and wastewater lab are all the wastewater function. They're separated out there, but when put together, that's the wastewater function, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Look across the page, and it uh, under resources by fund, it says wastewater. So I'm going to assume this is now how we pay for the expenses in the category I just mentioned. Would that be right? I'm not sure if I follow that, looking okay. across. I mentioned a number of wastewater yep. uh, 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 expense items that are designated with at least the first word is wastewater and I read those to you and you said yes that's the that's the wastewater in its entirety uh, do, we, do I have that about right yeah I'm hoping that I'm looking at the same um, budget summary page I have, I have printouts right here and I do see the wastewater control wastewater treatment facility um, I have secondary plant parks mitigation wastewater source control wastewater pump house wastewater admin charges and that's um, while they're different object numbers there, they all come out of the same fund. Okay. Yeah. There, so generally, uh, there might be a dog or a cat or a knit or a gnat that's out of place, but in the main, I've got it right. That's mm -hmm. wastewater. And then over on page 197, where it says about halfway down, wastewater, there's a number of $23,272,000. This is on the revenue side. Thank you so much for pulling that up. Okay, apologize. I'm following now, Mayor Keeley. We're following? Mm -hmm. okay. okay, good enough. So here, here comes my question. Uh, as I understand it, uh, we can fully cost recover because this is a service that we can fully cost recover if we choose to the cost of our wa wastewater activities. Is that correct? I believe so. Okay. So now let me go to another, another issue here. Go back to the expense page, and we're going to look at refuse. As I see it, I see resource recovery, collection, refuse disposal, recycling program. Would I be right in thinking uh, uh, and uh, uh, resource recovery collection cart, that that is everything under refuse? Would that be correct? Or are there any other items that would go under refuse? I, I believe that's correct. I'm pulling up the actual budget right now. But, okay, mm -hmm. okay. And then when we go over again to the revenue page, there's one line for refuse, which I am assuming includes all those expenditure categories on the other page. And so what we're doing there is 21,000, excuse me, 21,570,000 there. Am I okay so far on those two? I'm gonna make the assumption yes at this point, but yeah, okay. following. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. Um, then let's go back over to that expense page and look at Stormwater management, stormwater overlay debt service. Are those two, uh, the, uh, those two have corresponding revenue items on the right hand page. Stormwater is a $320,000 item, but stormwater overlay is two and a half million dollars. Do I have everything now that's under? Under stormwater? Yes, I believe so. Okay. Now, with regard to those three categories, wastewater, refuse, and, and, and uh, stormwater, 
it's my understanding that those are eligible for full cost recovery in a fee system, that the law allows us to recover full cost recovery in a fee system for those enterprises. They're, they are enterprise activities, is that correct? Uh, no, I would, not, I would not classify stormwater or stormwater overlay as an enterprise fund. What well, would you characterize? The utility, well, there is a utility fee associated with those, uh, with those um, services. It is not a, a direct fee like our refuse funds where, or where you're paying a monthly fee for that service. This is a, it's almost similar to more of a tax, I, I would almost call that utility fee. It's, it kind of straddles the line between both of those on the stormwater. And so when we talk about full cost recovery for stormwater overlay and stormwater, um, those two funds, 751 and 752, um, we don't have a, um, a full cost recovery for the maintenance efforts on the levy itself or repairs or, or our pump station upgrades. So I wouldn't uh, classify that as an enterprise funds typically like you have with wastewater and refuse or, or water. Could it be? Uh, I, that's an interesting question. Um, I, I would imagine that we could try to create some type of fee. Um, I, I, be a, I don't know if it'd be a tax and we'd go to the voters or if it would be something that is similar to um, our wastewater. Well, in principle is what I'm really looking at. How, how, we, how we get there is maybe a subsequent question I'll have, but, but in principle, under law, will we be able, following a, a study that would identify the costs and so on and <coughs> what is in there, it's my understanding, whether we call it an enterprise fund or an elephant, it doesn't matter. <laughs> the point is, is that it's an activity undertaken by the city for which we could, we could attempt through a fee system to have full cost recovery. That's my question. Uh, I, I think I'd have to, it looks like I'd refer to the city attorney right there to respond. Okay. Mr. And I'd be happy to weigh in. Um, so you're, you're familiar with the requirements of Proposition 218 for property related fees and charges. Uh, in essence, you have to provide certain notice requirements. There's a majority protest hearing and the fee or charge has to be proportionate to the cost of the property related service attributed to the parcel and whether or not um, storm water charges are charges for water service is sort of a gray area under Prop 218. Uh, and so I, I think Nathan is right that it's sort of somewhere in between a property related fee or charge and a, and a tax and, and we can certainly explore ways of increasing the cost recovery for those types of fees or charges and it may entail having a a, a prop 218 style hearing process or it may entail uh, asking the voters to approve a tax so, so we would have to analyze that and report back to the council thank you mr condotti for that answer the reason i ask and i and i go through this sir is because um at the two levels of local government at which i've had the great privilege of getting to serve. Uh, public works, uh, to a great extent, uh, is a target-rich environment, in my view, for full cost recovery. It's, it's very clear. I think it might be harder, you know, police services or fire services or this or that. It might, might be a different, you know, I, I see that's general fund support and pretty hard to say your property gets this and yours gets this. But you send out about a hundred, not you personally, but the city sends out about, um, and thank you for that information, your assistant provided this to me uh, offline a minute ago, uh, roughly 100,000 utility bills a month. And we're underwriting the department with general fund money to the tune of about five point eight million dollars a year um, now I'm going to do arithmetic about which you should object strenuously okay uh, and that is if we took five point eight million dollars and we divided it by a hundred thousand customers who get 12 bills a year the average bill would go up four dollars and 83 cents and we wouldn't be subsidizing the department with $5.8 million, but you would experience no change in your revenue. 
That would just be for the normal operations that we have going on today. When we look at the CIP and some of the other improvements that we need to make, and I kind of talked about that in the challenges, these are going to be significant um, cost increases. Maybe some of them are one time, and then some of them will add to our maintenance efforts as well. Um, and so it's a, while our budget or while the department has a, a, a portion of the general fund that supports uh, our department, uh, overall the revenues that we do bring in through our grants and through um, our other fees with like building permit fees per, and, and uh, over-the-counter fees, et cetera, helps, does help offset some of those uh, costs that you're seeing on the general fund side. Well, m my interest is to uh, jealously guard every penny of the general fund because that's the only discretion we have is it, when we want to do something, we have to go find the money. We have to find the money in the general fund. The degree to which the general fund is subsidizing departments is a totally legitimate issue. But the degree to which it is, I want to examine it closely and see if what we can do in, is engage in more 100% cost recovery in these, in these three areas. Uh, so I am wondering, and this may go to Mr. Huffaker or Ms. Cablo or yourself, and that is uh, whether we could, should, or have conducted a, a cost, full cost recovery study on these three areas of the Public Works Department. So, uh, Mayor, I appreciate the questions. Um, and as Elizabeth has also alluded to in many of her presentations and initial financial overview, principally speaking, we completely agree that to the extent appropriate and legally permissible, we want to achieve full cost recovery in all of our uh, enterprise and utility operations, particularly where we can draw a direct benefit for the services being provided, just as you're describing. As Nathan had mentioned earlier at the onset of his presentation, there are also functions within the Public Works Department, uh, you know, our transportation team comes to mind that are providing services in a more general nature uh, in which would not be appropriate to draw to try to draw a more direct connection from a cost recovery standpoint. That's why there will always be an element uh, of the public works operations that will need to be appropriately general, general fund supported. Uh, but we have been um, having conversations and part of, part of the fee increases is a reflection of this as well, of, of trying to be uh, um, good shepherds of, of that funding, uh, acknowledging the scarcity of resources we have on the general fund side, and ensure we're looking at that uh, critically uh, as we have those opportunities for, for all three of the functions that we're talking about today. Let me ask a question very directly then, uh, whether, uh, well, let me do it this way. How often does your department conduct a full cost recovery analysis of the elements of your department that are that could be subject to full cost recovery? I understand what the city manager just said. Yeah, I, I talk, if we're talking about refuse and wastewater, um, well, let's stick with refuse first. Is that there is full cost? There is. We're on a great trajectory in the sense that we've we've been able to perform the CIP work, uh, perform our operations under our current structure, but we are looking at keeping a six-month operation reserve in place, and so we're, we are embarking on the work towards increasing that fee, again, that will come up to you uh, next month. And so that would be a full cost recovery plan for that service that we, pro for that we provide in pu through Public Works, and that is refuse. And similarly, Waste Waterway is gonna be doing the same thing. While we have um, a good fund balance right now, we do know we have some large looming improvements, infrastructure projects, both at the treatment facility and uh, around the city. And so we're embarking upon a long-range financial plan, as well as doing a cost service analysis, a full cost of service uh, analysis, and that'll be presented to you guys most likely in, in 2025 uh, for that increase. And so between those two services, we are embarking upon a full cost recovery plan for those. But when it comes to stormwater and stormwater, that, that's the big challenge for us, where it's not a direct service that's going, uh, a fee that goes directly into um, a direct connection that you can make uh, towards that effort. And so those are the grants we're going after. Some, we don't really use general fund for, for the stormwater. Uh, we do ask for that though. We come back uh, as an appropriation, but it's not necessarily a, a year over year uh, take from the general fund. 
I want to make sure I understand the last thing you said. I'm not sure I tracked it. Did you say that there's no general fund money going into waste in, into the stormwater? Currently, right now, we don't have general fund dollars. We're using our 751 as well as our 752 funds to help support the wastewater or the stormwater uh, work that we're on. And which funds are those? Those are. That's the 751 is the stormwater, and then the uh, 752 is the stormwater overlay. And it's basically the flood control system within the downtown core is the overlay, right. and then, then the uh, 751 stormwater is general for citywide. Citywide. So what are you saying about how those are paid for? The, that's what we had in the earlier discussion about being, is it a tax or is it a fee? Um, it kind of straddles both of those. And then trying it now? It's... I believe again it's in the, in the property um, your property tax bill that you receive, and I want to say that it shows up as a utility tax, but I don't know, recall if it's exactly specifically a tax. I'd have to uh, check in with the city attorney on that. But but not general fund. And if I may, Mayor Chime in, I see we have one of uh, our directors of another important utility oh. with her hand up, wanting to chime in. Rosemary uh, has some thoughts on the matter. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I'll be over there in just a little bit to um, give you my spiel, but um, I wanted to say a couple of things. One is the uh, number of 100,000 um, customers is the population we serve. It's not the number of accounts we bill. That's a number more like about 27,000 per month, but that also includes about 30% of those are outside city customers. So I have to sort of do a couple of, um, of things about to reduce that. The, um, I guess the other comment I want to make with respect to a property related fee to sort of uh, talk about um, talk to follow up on some comments that the city attorney made the only place I've seen a stormwater utility sort of get created and this is a while ago so there might have been some changes was in Portland Oregon where they actually did um, property sizing and determined for each property how much stormwater was retained on the property versus how much went over into the, you know, sort of the streets or into the storm drains. Uh, and that was um, obviously one side of Portland is quite flat. The other side of Portland is quite hilly and topography was taken into account as well. It's a very onerous uh, a sort of mechanism in order to establish that connection between the cost of service and what the contribution is. So I just would put that out there as I'm not saying you can't do it. I'm just saying it's complicated. If I could just add on to Rosemary's comment. Mr. City Attorney. What what um, the water di director is describing is, is an assessment. And while I'm not sure what the procedure is for adopting an assessment in Oregon law under California law that is there is required to be an engineering study that um, yes. identifies the impact of the activity. In this case, it's stormwater runoff yeah. on the entire system and then attributes a cost associated with that for each and every parcel in the yeah. in the city. And then it's put to a vote and the vote is weighted according to the proportionate impact of the of the assessment on the on the property. So. If you have a couple of large landowners like uh, big ag users in the Pajaro Valley, for instance, the vote is heavily weighted in favor of the larger landowners and, and it receives a simple majority based on that weighted vote. Thank you for that. Uh, the risk of belaboring the point, so I won't, is uh, to say this, that uh, the general fund, I believe, should be jealously guarded. I don't think there's anything that's being done with the general fund that is uh, frivolous, <laughs> certainly. We're very good at, at watching our money. Uh, however, having said that, uh, complexity of, uh, the, like the city attorney was just describing to me is not a reason not to do, is not a reason to say well we won't do this uh, I would like to see uh, in the spirit of uh, protection protecting the general fund and preserving as much discretion to the policymakers as possible 
I would like to see uh, a report back. It does not have to be uh, for next week, but I would like to see, if, unless there is objection, perhaps, Mr. Huffaker, this is something that you and uh, Mr. Nguyen and Ms. Cabell and whoever else you want to bring into the fold on this could examine this because it, it does seem to me that uh, we should have legal options available to us and then whether or not we take those is a separate question. It's absolutely something we need to run to ground. And as Nathan has shared, it's been an ongoing challenge with having these assets under resourced, under invested in for quite some time. So, um, you know, what the city attorney described is a special benefit assessment, something very similar to what we had worked on for the Pajo River, River Levy Network. Um, there are other mechanisms as well, and uh, we're certainly interested and we'll need to explore uh, options going forward. I wonder if what you could do, sir, is we do have the budget and revenue subcommittee, and perhaps uh, in the new fiscal year, uh, that could be one of the items that uh, we would entertain at that committee. Happy to do that and appreciate the interest in wanting to pursue it, something that we need to work on. Very good. Mr. Nguyen, let me, I believe we're finished with questions. Thank you very, very much. Your department does extraordinary work all the time. Uh, I would say that a lot of it is, how would I say this, taken for granted. Uh, taken for granted, my streets paved, that the stormwater system works, that all of the work that you're engaged in, we don't even think about it. That's the evidence, I think, the proof positive that you're doing a very, very good job. Thank you on behalf of the council, and I think I, 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 I take no risk at thanking you on behalf of the public. Thank, Thank you, you Mayor. Thank you, council members. We are on the Parks and Recreation Commission budget. I invite Mr. Elliott. Good morning. Good afternoon, Mayor, City Council. Good afternoon, sir. How are you? Doing well. Thank you. Good. Good. We welcome you. And who have you brought with you? All right, I've got uh, Lindsay Bass, our principal management analyst with Good Parks and Recreation you. here. And uh, if the council is ready, we will go through our presentation. We Thumbs up. All right. No seventh inning stretch here. or, okay, we're, we we're, go. we'll jump right in. All right. Yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity to present our fiscal year 24 budget uh, this afternoon to the city council. Um, introduce Lindsay Bass, our principal management analyst, who will join me in the presentation today. Uh, we also have our park superintendent, Travis Beck, in the audience here. Uh, and one of our two acting recreation superintendents, DC Lawson Thomas is back here as well to answer any questions uh, once we get to that point. Uh, so as uh, the uh, library uh, director, Yolanda Wilburn said early this morning um, about the libraries, libraries aren't just singing and dancing and having fun. And I would say the same with parks and recreation. There, there's a little bit of that in parks and recreation certainly, but there's a lot of great work that's happening. A lot of hard work, a lot of tough work that's out there, but really as an investment, and the quality of life that we enjoy here in Santa Cruz. So we'll talk about that a little bit through this presentation. Um, want to just give a brief outline, very similar format to the other departments that the council has heard from today. So we'll go through uh, just briefly our core services um, and then into our general fund budget for fiscal year 24, uh, including uh, both personnel and supplies and services in our operating budget. Uh, and we'll talk about uh, some of our operational and strategic priorities as we come into this new fiscal year and then welcome uh, feedback and questions. But again, just to start to kind of ground uh, us in terms of our mission in Parks and Recreation, our mission is to provide quality public spaces and experiences that build a healthy community, foster equity, and better the environment. So just kind of grounding uh, that as we head into our budget. All right, so I'll go through our core services quickly here. So Parks and Recreation uh, is the steward on behalf of the city of approximately 1,700 acres of open spaces, parks, beaches, wharf, and urban forest. Uh, we maintain 75 buildings. Some of these are very well known, like the Civic Auditorium and London Nelson Community Center, Market Street Senior Center, 
but a lot of smaller buildings, uh, a lot just over at Harvey West, for example. So we maintain about 170,000 square feet of facility space throughout the park system. All right, we create unique places that foster relationships with people and nature. So this uh, image here is actually from uh, our outreach material as part of the San Lorenzo Park redesign process that we're going through right now. So connecting uh, our neighborhoods, our community members, connecting our downtown uh, with these unique places that we have and really trying to activate these and bring these to life. Uh, through our programs, um, these are really our registered programs. We serve about 100,000 youth and teens, adults and seniors through those programs. Uh, in addition to that, our parks and beaches, as we heard, I think, from the fire department earlier today, uh, around a million visitors to our beach each year, about two million visitors to the wharf each year. And so we serve millions of people through uh, this incredible park system here in Santa Cruz. I wanted to just use this slide quickly just to talk about the sort of value proposition of parks and recreation. So we really try to balance, um, we have things like a revenue policy and we do operations plans and business plans to really make sure that the community is getting the, the best bang for the buck in terms of value. So Parks and Rec is, um, is supported through the general fund, but we try to be really smart and thoughtful about balancing accessibility and affordability to our programs and services with smart revenue generation as well. Uh, Parks and Rec is a permitting office as well, so we issue about 700 tree and special event permits on an annual basis on behalf of the city. And then just in summary, really Parks and Recreation is at the heart of Santa Cruz. We like to say Santa Cruz is Parks and Recreation. So these different components here uh, on the screen are related to health and wellness, conservation, resiliency, property values, economic development, visitor spending, uh, a lot of the departments that the council and community have heard from through this budget process, we really all work together really closely. And I think the, the role and function of Parks and Recreation is at the heart of a lot of these factors. And I just wanted to kind of highlight briefly the conservation and resiliency piece being really at the heart of our uh, climate action um, in an area where um, I, I think big opportunity in terms of just climate and investment in our parks, the green belt, open spaces. So we'll talk about that more as we go through the presentation today. And then we talk, as we talk about the uh, capital improvement plan further on June 13th. Um, just quickly through our organizational chart, the Parks and Rec Department uh, has 84 FTEs. So that includes both regular uh, full-time and part-time staff. Uh, in addition to those uh, 84 FTEs, we uh, have approximately 150 temp staff that come in in the summer in particular, um, both for parks, but in programs like our summer camps, uh, junior guards, and so forth. So that amounts to about 35,000 hours uh, in temp uh, time. So this is a breakdown um, of our uh, various uh, divisions and uh, sort of work areas uh, within Parks and Rec. Uh, uh, urban forestry, golf course, wharf, um, London Nelson Community Center, uh, sports and beaches, so on and so forth. And then the, the number under each of these supervisors' names are the amount of folks uh, reporting to each of these divisions. So here's a, a quick photo of our group from last year's summer kickoff, uh, a number of our staff there. And then this next slide are uh, photos of our staff uh, in action out in the field. Uh, that the council and community often uh, see and run into. So with that, I'm going to hand this over to our principal management analyst, uh, Lindsay Bass. Ms. Bass, good welcome. Welcome. Good afternoon. Great. Thank you so much, council. It's a pleasure to be with you all this afternoon. Um, and the uh, staff of Parks and Recreation, we really see ourselves as custodians of a one-of-a-kind Parks and Rec system. Um, so we understand that we stand on the shoulders of folks that made decisions before us that have um, kept this amazing um, system humming and moving, and we see it as our responsibility to continue to do that work, both currently and for the future. Um, so we are uh, planting lots of seeds right now that will hopefully bear much fruit to serve the community um, both now and to come. And how we think about that work is really framed through these seven strategic priorities. And so 
Um, we have a parks master plan that um, sets uh, a horizon for us through 2030, but there are many plans that we utilize. Um, within the department, we think about how this aligns with the general plan. Um, we're already considering how this will align with the current strategic plan that the city council is working on. Um, but uh, very much grounded in um, our parks master plan, um, we think about things like design uh, excellence, play community health and interaction, stewardship and sustainability, accessible and connected community, partnerships and good governance as kind of guiding themes to the work that we do. Um, beyond that, uh, we added a strategic theme outside of what's listed in our master plan, which is um, in the middle there, safety first. Um, in recognition of how important it is to make sure that we're providing a safe park system, both for the public and for our staff. And so this is really how we think about and how we measure our accomplishments and set our goals for the future. Um, so you can see here on the chart, um, uh, many of those accomplishments aligned against these themes. I'm not gonna go through each and every one of them. They're in your packet. Um, but uh, I do want to highlight just a few. Uh, so under design excellence, um, we were able to complete a number of CIP projects um, this fiscal year, um, a flagship project that we had Vice Mayor Golder help us cut the ribbon on was the uh, renovation and refurbishing of Garfield Park. Um, so a brand new playground there, um, wonderful new amenities there for that neighborhood um, to begin to utilize. Um, in terms of uh, safety first, the department has done a lot of work this year, both planned and unplanned, um, addressing safety, both of our community and um, the temporary uh, shelters that were stood up around uh, the Civic Auditorium, Depot Freight Building, um, as well as continuing to respond to um, uh, safety concerns in the park system by employing additional um, security and alarms across our facility um, to keep folks safe and also on the flip side of that to make sure that our staff are trained um, and so we completed a full de-escalation training for the entire department this fiscal year um, that was really underscored by um, the Parks Yard Arson event that um, happened last June. Um, in addition, I think we're really proud of um, the work that we do around stewardship and sustainability um, so a number of um, grants uh, we continue to bring in to the department um, to help uh, continue our stewardship and sustainability efforts. Um, and uh, following on from that, um, in the partnerships arena, um, this year we've really expanded our relationship with city schools. Um, and are really leveraging them to help us make sure that our programs are accessible um, from a financial standpoint for our most vulnerable and needy families. And so working in conjunction with city schools and Friends of Parks and Recreation, um, we're kind of uh, blowing away all goals around um, being able to provide scholarships to kids to take part in recreation programs. Um, so this year we awarded over $75,000 of scholarships to around 199 kids, almost 200 kids. Um, so it's great to see um, uh, that partnership continue to bear fruit. Um, and then just from a good governance standpoint, um, and to Tony's point, um, we have completed um, additional business plans. So for the Civic Auditorium to really ramp up. Um, cost recovery of that facility, as well as addressing um, a number of fee areas within the department, keep, make sure those continue to keep pace with um, inflationary pressures. Um, we also have great ambitions for the coming fiscal year. And um, similarly, we're aligning those against um, these strategic themes. Uh, I'm not gonna go through those. Those are also in your packet. I'll let your questions guide. Um, uh, how we go into detail there, um, but just know there's a lot of really important, incredible work planned within the department um, for the coming fiscal year. So that brings us down to the brass tacks of the budget um, for FY24. Um, we are looking within Parks and Recreation at a $20.6 million budget. This is a status quo budget. 
Um, the way that number breaks down very roughly is about $11.3 million to support our personnel, about 55%, and then $9.3 million to support services, supplies, capital outlay, everything else. Um, this does spread, uh, and for the most part, within the general fund, but it does um, include the WARF, Fund 104, and some other smaller funds as well. Um, in terms of revenues, Tony also mentioned that the department um, uh, is a revenue generating department. We bring in fees for a lot of the services and a lot of the amenities that we provide. Um, and so we're budgeting to bring in just under $6 million um, in the coming fiscal year. Uh, we tend to be conservative with our revenue projections. Um, but uh, it's worth noting that in FY22, the department brought in 6.4 million. Um, so we really do try to overperform. Um, and when you see folks out there on the golf course or out enjoying dinner on the wharf, um, in our picnic areas, that's all fueling and helping to keep the general fund um, healthy. We see that as a very important role that we play. Um, it's interesting though, as a department, um, the winter storms this year are a good example of how weather can affect um, that pretty significantly. And so we are now beginning to think about, you know, how do we weatherproof <laughs> um, some of our revenue opportunities? Um, and the last point that I'll make here is um, in terms of how our budget compares to FY23, as I said, it is a status quo budget, but um, we do have um, uh, a certain portion of internal services like other departments that have been rolled in this year. And so that's um, representative of the increase that you would see if you compared this to our FY23 um, budget. Um, so let's take a little bit of a deep dive into the 11.3 piece of that budget, that 55% for personnel. Um, so as Tony mentioned, in FY23, we had 84 FTE. Um, in the budget before you, we are recommending 86.5 FTE, and you'll see in um, the light pink um, where those increases are coming. Um, so uh, for the most part, we did our best to make these um, budget neutral to the general fund, so we're actually con uh, converting temporary dollars um, for the half-time FTE under events and classes and the full-time FTE under open spaces and greenways. You know, that's not a full one-to-one -one as we get into the future, um, but just really trying to do our part um, while also increasing capacity. Um, these shifts are somewhat in uh, response to workforce changes coming out of the pandemic. And so it's been really hard to keep half-time positions filled. We've seen a lot of turnover. Um, in classes and events, and so really trying to make that position as full-time uh, more attractive. And similarly, for open spaces and greenways, it's been really hard to get temporary folks um, into that uh, uh, area. And so um, being able to offer a regular full-time position um, will hopefully bring some more um, uh, solid uh, staffing to that area. And then finally, the last FTE is bringing a um, half-time rec coordinator at the wharf and a half-time building maintenance worker position at the wharf, both to full-time. Um, that will bring us to 86.5. Um, and as Tony mentioned, um, we'll continue to leverage um, very significantly um, temporary staff to ensure that we're able to um, deliver on our mission and vision. Um, so that's what's in the budget. There are also some things that will be a priority for us in FY24 from a personnel standpoint that we wanted to flag to you, um, that we're in discussions with city manager's office, HR, and finance on just in terms of um, prioritizing these things and figuring out the best roadmaps for how those will come forward. Um, so these involve things that um, in some ways are mixed in with the compensation study that was done. Um, that in terms of the recreation supervisor pay equity piece, um, as well as um, new job titles um, within the recreation division, just to ensure that we have really strong career ladders um, within that division to make it as healthy and strong um, as it can possibly be. 
Um, outside of those areas, we're looking at um, trying to improve and increase our capacity around capital improvement projects. So right now, that full suite and complement, and we'll talk more about this on June 13th, um, our CIP portfolio is managed by our supervisors. So this leadership team that you see on the screen before you. And so when operational um, issues arise, um, they have to set those projects aside, address emergencies, and that can slow things down. Um, we have a lot of deferred maintenance in the system. We want to be able to keep up with that. Um, so building capacity here would be incredibly helpful um, to the department and to the community and allow us to get through more of those projects um, on time. Um, and beyond that, I've heard other departments mention uh, retirements um, that continue to happen and succession planning that they are doing. We see some of these coming through to our department as well. Um, so making some of these structural adjustments around how and what positions we have within these different areas, um, we may need to be bringing some of those forward to you in the coming fiscal year. So just wanted to put that on the radar um, and uh, more to come there. Okay, so that was on the personnel side, the 55%. For the rest of the budget, that uh, remaining 9.3 million, um, we kind of think about this in a couple of different, uh, through a few different lenses. Um, and the first is this lens. So these are just the basics. So about 80% of that um, supply and service budget is to um, aff afford the cap uh, cost allocation plan. It's to pay for water, sewer, and refuse. I was taking notes as Nathan was talking about <laughs> refuse rates going up. Um, and we know that there will be water rate increases, and so we are the city's biggest water customer. Um, so we track that very closely. Um, uh, Elizabeth mentioned general liability is going up, so we see that um, hit our budget. Um, Tony mentioned the breadth of buildings and acres that we manage, so we got to get people out to these places. And so we do that through equipment and fleet, um, and that takes uh, resources. Um, in addition to being able to bring in that $6 million, we do have to have software um, to support registrations, reservations. We have to um, build into our budget um, costs for credit card fees, paying instructors, paying operators. So these are the kind of things that we see in cost recovery. And then there's just basic safety, right? So keeping our people safe, keeping our facilities and our parks safe for the public, so those costs get rolled in under safety, and then keeping the lights on, the buildings heated, and then small amounts for capital outlay, staff support. So all of that adds up to about 80% of that budget, which leaves about 20% to do everything else um, and basically deliver what the public sees. Um, so that encompasses things like basic landscape and park maintenance, building and facility maintenance, uh, maintenance of our trees and vegetation, so that urban forestry, and then programming, doing all of that amazing work in terms of junior guards, special events, seniors, teens, classes, after school activities, that runs the whole gamut. So um, with all of the pressures out there in terms of inflation and increases, um, continuing to stretch this budget um, requires uh, real dedication from the team. We talk about budget management as a team sport in parts of our nation um, to make sure that we um, come in at um, or below budget. And so now I'll turn it over to Tony to talk through some of the implications of how we're going to operationalize um, the elements of our FY24 budget. Thank you. All right, thank you, Lindsay. So as we think about our uh, fiscal year 24 budget, and the status quo budget, and to go back, that what, roughly $1.9 million is what we have to work with, um, uh, apart from personnel and apart from a lot of those sort of um, uh, costs for water, sewer, refuse, et cetera. So we've got roughly $2 million to sort of work with. And so the, the uh, over the next few slides, I'm gonna look at sort of three buckets uh, that are oriented toward how are we gonna do this in fiscal year 24. And so, um, as we talk about these operating priorities, so I just want to go through a few of these bullet points here, but really the, the message here for all of these is that as we go into this new year and need to identify uh, funding for these other needs, whether it's related to staff and public safety, these inflationary increases that Lindsay alluded to, 
um, trying to find opportunities for additional funding within our existing budget. However, these are things that we would come back to the council uh, to really uh, discuss and, and get specific approval um, for these needs. So these operating priorities, so critical equipment and facility needs um, as our facilities continue to uh, need uh, uh, investment and a variety of needs. That's an area where we're going to have to figure out how do we sort of, uh, in a way, absorb this into our existing budget or come back to the council um, or find uh, new opportunities for funding. Same with the Civic Auditorium in terms of cost recovery. So the demand is back at the Civic Auditorium. So it's a matter of how do we, uh, how do we staff that? How do we run it? How do we um, make sure that we're in a position to really serve the community through the demand and needs of the Civic? Staff and public safety, this is an ongoing thing, but as Lindsay alluded to, really investing in training and tools um, in potentially hardening some of our facilities in terms of um, uh, security systems, whatever that might be. So there, there are some needs there that aren't uh, included in this budget, but we want to be sure to be creative and be really engaged with the council throughout fiscal year 24 on how do we fund these uh, moving forward. Inflationary increases, this is something that applies to virtually every department in the city and we're feeling as well. And then staff development and MOU requirements. And so this piece really speaks to overtime um, and on-call uh, staff that we've got on call virtually all the time as different needs uh, come up in evenings uh, and weekends. So um, I may come back to this slide, but I just want to sort of reference um, an example of this at Harvey West Pool. And we may sort of go through this as an example once we get to questions. But again, I want to use these slides here to kind of, kind of contextualize the how. How are we um, managing? How are we really going to use this status quo budget um, to be successful in service to the community? So the second piece, of the second bucket, if you will, uh, in really implementing our budget for fiscal year 24 is really thinking outside the budget. So we heard yesterday um, uh, at City Council um, regarding the city's volunteer program. And this is an area where Parks and Rec, uh, in partnership with our many, many volunteers, continues to be successful. This is an area that we really want to lean into even more. And so just to highlight a couple examples here, um, and again, that pool example, uh, looking to work with Santa Cruz County Parks and Recreation uh, to run Harvey West Pool on behalf of the city. So where we don't have the capacity, per se, from a staffing or budget standpoint, um, uh, we can leverage uh, the subject matter expert uh, and the team over at Simpkins Swim Center to potentially work with the county to run our pool. So looking for those really creative partnerships on how we can provide a level of service to the community, but in a way that, that's smart and, and working with these both volunteers um, and sort of organized uh, partners, in this case, the county. The other example I wanted to highlight here is actually that third bullet point, which is the Santa Cruz Mountain Trail Stewardship um, uh, Organization, which uh, is doing virtually 100% of the trail maintenance in the city of Santa Cruz right now. So I think that that um, is a real uh, success story in a lot of ways, but it's a group that we really rely on from a volunteer standpoint and a partnership standpoint uh, through various MOUs or adopt a park agreements to really maintain uh, the trails, not just biking, but hiking trails, really uh, many of our trails throughout the system. So this is a bit of that the how in terms of with a status quo budget, the different demands from the community. How do we really do this? And it, it's uh, largely rooted in being very creative and being very engaged with a lot of our partners in the community. And in this third bucket in terms of how uh, on our budget and fiscal year 24, so we've talked about our operational priorities, but we want to make sure that we continue, as Lindsay talked about, planting seeds. So uh, the, the sort of tree metaphor that we talked about this is, uh, this is really that piece of it. So looking at the strategic priorities, uh, we want to make sure to invest in these areas as well. Um, so that uh, relates to developing plans to address infrastructure. So this could be green infrastructure, uh, but this could be things like doing a facilities condition assessment in fiscal year 24. That, so we have an idea of the true capital needs and, and costs uh, throughout our facilities. We've not done that before. So we really need to assess uh, what are those needs. Uh, capital outlay forecast and planning uh, as well. So really focusing on, on infrastructure looking forward. Um, focusing on cost recovery as well. As Lindsay mentioned, we uh, just finalized a draft five-year business plan for the Civic Auditorium in terms of generating revenue to make that uh, a cost-neutral um, operation for the city. Um, 
Fund 104 is this piece of the general fund that's really oriented toward the wharf. It is a piece of the general fund that is, uh, has several departments involved from the fire department, marine safety, uh, economic development, public works, and parks and recreation. So we really want to focus on how do we make sure that the wharf is as successful as it can be from a revenue standpoint, but also from a maintenance standpoint um, and just long-term sustainability uh, standpoint as well. Golf course and disc golf fall into this uh, strategic priority as well. Um, uh, we do have some capital improvement dollars um, appropriated currently for uh, both disc golf and the golf course. So those are projects underway and we'll talk about those more on June 13th. Uh, but we do 40,000 rounds of golf uh, roughly at the golf course and approximately 65,000 rounds of disc golf uh, per year. So really trying to invest in those areas to make those generate positive revenue for the city to help support these other um, operations and functions within Parks and Rec. Uh, and then pursuing federal and state aid, always a key uh, prior strategic priority for us. Let's see, I know there's two more bullet points on here if I can get them to go. Yeah, Bonnie, will you advance the slide there? Thank you. All right, this item uh, we framed as continuing efforts with city leadership to advance a what we're calling a parks positive ballot measure. Uh, in other words, referring to a potential sales tax measure in November of 2024. So really talking about these needs, doing the assessment, being in a position to strategically to look toward November of 2024. And then as we've talked about a little bit, really we've got a lot of identified personnel, uh, challenges, staff safety issues. So we want to make sure to continue to think about how do we keep our staff safe? How do we keep the parks safe? Uh, how do we make sure that that quality of life that people um, just value so much uh, in this community, how do we make sure to retain that and invest in that? So we wanna make sure that parks and our staff and uh, our facilities remain safe. So a lot of work to do there. And all of this, again, uh, both the strategic priorities, the operational priorities, uh, and in the partnerships, the thinking outside the budget are all the types of ways that we'll be thinking about implementing our fiscal year 24 budget this year. How do we put it in practice and make sure that we're successful in service to the community? Wanted to just, uh, for the council's um, uh, information and consideration, just share a little bit from the Parks and Recreation Commission. We met on April 24th and presented our budget to them. And a lot of similar themes, uh, we really sought high level feedback uh, from the commission in terms of themes where they believe that the department um, and hopefully the city will make investment in the parks and recreation budget. So these are really consistent with what we've talked about, but these are the high level themes. We didn't get into line item detail, but really these are kind of the, the high level, um, again, sort of categories or themes from the parks and recreation commission. So again, developing plans to address infrastructure, um, uh, progress on the Harvey West pool, uh, emphasis on green infrastructure, urban forestry, uh, continued cost recovery efforts, and then going to the bottom there, identified personnel issues and staff safety. So very similar to what we've talked about as a department uh, with the city manager uh, within the city. So a lot of uh, key themes there. I just wanted to acknowledge uh, Commissioner Jacob Pollock. We couldn't find a picture for him, so forgive. Uh, he's, not, he's not a shadow. Uh, he's a real person and he's a, he's a great commission member. So apologies, we couldn't find a photo for Commissioner Pollock. All right, with that, that brings us to the end and we're um, very appreciative of the time, uh, Mayor and Council and happy to welcome uh, questions at this point. Mr. Elliott, thanks to you. And thank you very much for the budget presentation. Thank you to all of your staff for the fine work that you do. Let me acknowledge Council Member Brown. Thank you. Um, I'm going to try to go first so I don't go on for too long. Um, so thank you. The, it's always great to hear from you and your team and see the wonderful work you do. Um, and with very little resources, thank you, Lindsay. It's always great to hear from you as well, um, your whole team. Uh, I have a couple of just really particular questions. One, um, actually, uh, one related to the goals. Um, it, could we or should we have a goal replacing the uh, walkways at Neary? I, I think that's something that's 
moving forward, and I didn't see it in there. You have a very long list, which reflects the ambitions of your department, um, which is wonderful. Um, but I'd, I'd love to see that captured. Um, and then perhaps a goal for next year to be first on the presentation list for budget hearings, because you <laughs> always end up towards the end and we and maybe feel rushed as a result. So um, I'm, I'm kidding about that one. Um, so I uh, wanted to just raise the pool. You suggested that that might be something for further conversation in the Q&A. And I wanted to first say I have, I'm, I'm thrilled that there are folks in the community who are picking this up. Um, we, uh, Council Member Watkins and myself, were uh, on a committee to try to move forward in this direction and came to the conclusion that a feasibility study, uh, along with the Parks and Rec uh, commissioners who formed a, a subcommittee with us, to move forward with this. And we do, there is funding for a feasibility study, um, hopefully enough, and there are there is a group in the community that is really excited about moving forward and they are quite ambitious and I've talked with them and I think many of you have. Um, perhaps you have, I'm not sure if you've heard from them yet. Um, but the cruise masters and I think that we just have such an opportunity right now to move forward with that study. I wanna make sure that um, you're clear that it's a priority and so I, I don't imagine there's any anyone who would <laughs> say no to that. I think it's a, it's a real commitment. Um, and, and their ambitions are you know, to really develop a world-class aquatic center. And, and I think we've got the, um, the will and we don't have the resources, but we can get there. So I wanted to just ask you uh, to make sure that you feel with the allocation that you have already in the budget that that will be sufficient. I wouldn't want uh, you know, some cost overrun to hold that up or cause us to have to rethink how we proceed. So I just want to make sure that you've got what you need there. <clears throat> yes, thank you so much. Uh, so we, as you mentioned, we have appropriated dollars currently to do a feasibility study or a market study uh, on aquatic. So we've got that direction. We've got the funding to do that. That's a project that we will undertake uh, this, this calendar year. Um, with our new recreation superintendent who's starting here in a couple weeks. Um, so that funding is there. We are in contact with uh, Cruise Masters and really support and partner and welcome that uh, involvement uh, and would even uh, welcome an expansion of community involvement in that. I think it'll be a big effort and I think a lot of exciting things there. We have, I just wanted to acknowledge there was a, a committee a couple years ago, a subcommittee of both council and Parks and Rec Commission members they said very clearly, we need a pool and we want a pool. And the current pool is failing, um, but we want to figure out how to invest in a new pool. So that's the direction that we're really working from um, with this goal of really exploring what is the need um, and then working our way toward that goal through some sort of capital campaign uh, with Cruise Masters and, and through the community. Another piece of this just to tie in, uh, and we'll talk about through the CIP discussion in a couple weeks, uh, is related to a potential Harvey West uh, overall master plan um, and our interest in doing that. So right now we're in a San Lorenzo Park redesign, which is I think going really well. We've gotten great feedback from the community. Harvey West doesn't have a master plan um, and has a lot of a lot of antiquated amenities in, in Harvey West Park, including the pool. And so I think another piece that could tie into this is that, that really overhaul or re-envisioning of Harvey West Park as a whole, and that could tie into this as well. So a lot of opportunities uh, there. Um, Council Member Brown, I think you mentioned in terms of long-term operational costs, that's the question at this point. We know that to run Harvey West Pool as it is currently is a little over a million dollars a year to run it. That's funding that we don't currently have. So we'll have to work toward getting to that point. Thank you. And just to follow up on that, because we, are, we still have a pool and people are interested in using it, and I know you've been working really hard on that partnership uh, which you talked about in your slides. Uh, so I wanted to just, um, you know, ask if where, how you're feeling about that. If, is it, I mean, what I got out of that experience with the committee was that we are, that investment to continue to operate the pool is not really an efficient investment either. And it's, it's because of the, all, all the reasons you know. And so um, do you feel like 
Um, and we're gonna, we'll have the possibility to rate, you know, for that to be a, um, you know, to, for fees to cover those costs, right? To for staffing for the pool. Um, but uh, do you? So do you have a sense that the work that is going to be done this year will be sufficient to have a some access in the shorter term? It's a great question. So currently, so today we are piece uh, piecing funding together, basically. Uh, to invest um, uh, in basically uh, making the pool safe and accessible. So we've got a, a host of issues um, uh, that we are, again, piecemealing funding together to get the pool up and, and running this summer. So our goal as of today is to open the pool July 1st this summer. Now, with that said, a lot of steps there. We've got to get the projects done from a maintenance standpoint to make it sa safe and accessible. Um, we have to get uh, confirmation from County Environmental Health to give us the, the thumbs up on all of those things. We are working with County Parks and Recreation, so they have a draft MOU that's going to the County Board of Supervisors also on June 13th uh, for adoption. If that's adopted, then we'll be in good shape to open on July 1st. With all of that said, uh, it'll be a, a light opening. Uh, so County would plan to run our pool maintain it, operate it, lifeguards, et cetera, with their existing staff. So it'll be a matter of them uh, sort of shifting staff over from Simpkins to the Harvey West pool to, to make it work. So to start, we may only be open for public access a day or two or three days a week. We're trying to figure that out right now. So, but again, we, we know there's huge demand on the pool. We know that our summer campers want to access the pool um, as part of that program. So we're doing all that we can to maximize that access, but a lot of steps to, to get there. So um, yeah, more more to come on that. Thank you. Um, I'll just say, uh, in closing, to the extent that uh, you know we had a committee and and we didn't get very far, and then COVID and lots of other things. So um, so I don't know that we would necessarily want to reinvigorate that kind of process. But to the extent that you are looking to council members to provide leadership for that capital campaign and related activities, um, please do call on me. Um, it's in my district. It's a citywide uh, asset and treasure, really, um, and we want it. We want to do our part. Thank you. Right. Other questions, Ms. Collintari Johnson. Thank you. Just a couple comments. Ditto. Um, I think we probably all feel that way. It is in your district, Council Member Brown. But um, that pool means a lot to me, my family, and the community. So I'm there to support when that moves forward. Um, I just want to comment. Um, one, that was really great to see the integration of the commission's feedback into your presentation. I'm sure that all the departments, as appropriate, have included that in the forming of the budget, but to see it visibly was really helpful. So I would just uh, like to see that again with Parks and Rec and, all, uh, and the other, um, excuse me, it's getting late and I um, can't speak clearly, um, the other departments as appropriate to integrate the commission feedbacks as well in the future. And then the other thing I wanted to note was um, I saw in the accomplishments the surf school permit RFP. And I think what I would like to add to that is there was a lot of work that went into integrating uh, an equity lens to that RFP. So I just wanted to acknowledge and call it out and thank you and thank Trey and thank everyone who put so much work into um, it's not perfect, but to getting it to the next level of where where we want it to head. So acknowledge that and then just one last sort of comment feedback I know we've talked about this there was a small group but a small group of youth from Santa Cruz High that came to the state of the youth community meeting and um, you know noted that they weren't aware of all the parks and rec um, offerings so just something for us to think about in the future of how to engage the high school students in particular here in Santa Cruz Thank you. The vice mayor is recognized. Thank you. I'm going to follow up on that since we talked about that in um, DC, and um, I think I think we talked about a good way to do that. We've been working really hard with Santa Cruz City Schools elementary schools this year, and I think we could do that certainly with the two high schools and two middle schools in our city next year, and put that in. You know, as as a, and I'd be happy to act as a liaison to help facilitate that with the appropriate. Um, people at those sites. I wanted to say one thing I was so excited, and I think you know what it is in the goals, is the spring break and winter break junior guards. And 
this is something that's super exciting and I I hope that eventually we can move towards, you know, some sort of year-round junior guard program and um, those those uh, students, their junior guards, they got to go to France um, over spring break to visit the year-round program they have over there. It's really amazing and it's life-saving as a sport and it's, you know, as, as it's Beach Safety Week, it seems super appropriate that we're training generations of kids, but obviously a barrier to joining is not being able to swim, so the pool is another thing I really want to help with. And um, and finally, there is one goal that I don't see in here, but I would like to see because I'm super excited about all those kids we got um, scholarships, and I hope that it'll just show up naturally, but I would like to see some of the demographics of the youth programming reflect the demographics of our town. Um, and so, you know, when you go to the beach, and oh, mine's the blonde kid in the red bathing suit. <laughs> I'd like to see some of the other kids yeah. from the community there. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Yeah. It, what we're happy Member to... Watkins is recognized. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, would like to welcome Lindsay to speak to that just from a scholarship standpoint. We do capture that data. We've had, I think, some really good success, so just might just want to speak to that briefly. Yeah, just real quickly, um, I think I mentioned um, about 34% of scholarship recipients were Medi-Cal families. Awesome. Yeah, which is a huge increase from last year. And I think that that's kind of been, you know, through the targeted outreach, but also being deliberate about tracking the demographics. So it's a really great point. Through that, we were also put in touch with the Central Coast Alliance for Health. And so we've been talking with them about ways that we can partner more explicitly with them to support more of the programming. And they made that point as well um, in terms of the need to better track demographics. Now, our system does allow us to track um, certain aspects, but you know, beginning to make that more robust, I think, is uh, a logical next step and something that we definitely want to do in FY24. So thank you for the call. I totally appreciate that, and I'm, I'm super excited about the work thus far, so I have no doubt that it's going to continue next year. Thank you. Council Member Watkins. Yes, thank you for the presentation. I agree with all of my colleagues' comments, and I'm happy to hear that you're also going to be tracking some of the demographics. I know it's something we've been wanting to do. Um, I, I'll just go ahead and add a, sort of an exclamation mark, if I can, on Councilmember Brown's comments about the pool. I think, you know, it's been something I feel like I've been talking about since the time I came on office. And we had a different parks director at the time who actually wasn't supportive of the pool, I learned, <laughs> and was like not wanting to keep the pool. And so at least we have the pool still, I guess, so it's on the positive. But we need to use the pool, right? And, um, you know, especially as the weather is getting hotter and um, people are looking for relief people want to access a pool and there's no public pool. And if you have to pay for a pool or you have to be a member, it, it makes it um, elite, if you will. And so however we can have that facility available to all would be amazing. Um, I think part of what worked with the scholarships, and I want to credit you, Renee, Councilmember um, Golder, for her, for her work, is really you can offer something and you can have something in place, but if there isn't a connection between why people aren't accessing it, then there's a breakdown, right? And so having your leadership at um, Santa Cruz City Schools to say, look, our families aren't registering for the online portal and they have language barriers and we're gonna sit down with them and we're gonna get them accounts and then we're gonna help them when Super Saturday comes or whatever it is, um, register for these uh, offerings and get them enrolled in the scholarships. That's that bridge, right, for those two entities to kind of be that catalyst for um, making it work. And so for the pool, I think that's the same uh, approach we should take in that we can have a great pool, but if our youth from the beach flats who have not felt culturally um, safe to be around water or um, able to even access via transportation to the pool, that's a breakdown, right? And so however we're thinking about the equity issues and ensuring that um, our parks programming reflects our demographics, I 100% agree with you, Renee, in terms of what we see at the Junior Guards program. That is a accessible beach for all to enjoy. It's the beauty of California beaches. You have to sometimes pay in other um, states to access beaches. So. The fact that we don't have um, more diversity in that program is troubling. And it's not um, for anyone's fault, but it's just the reality of how we need to be um, 
intentional and purposeful about enrolling and supporting people being able to access those programs. So I'm 100% uh, supportive of whatever that looks like in terms of resources, council direction and leadership, subcommittee, you name it. Um, you mentioned the tax, the sales tax uh, as the parks measure, and I know this is probably forthcoming, so you can just say, hey, wait. I'm totally fine with that. Um, but I know at a time when I was on this uh, revenue committee, there was also conversation about a parks bond. And I'm just curious where we're at with all of that stuff, if it's appropriate to share at this time. Yeah, happy to chime in on that, uh, Councilmember Watkins. Appreciate the question. Uh, so one thing that Tony didn't mention is over the course of the last year, the Trust for Public Land uh, conducted a really great comprehensive analysis of all the potential sustainable revenue mechanisms we might consider. Uh, one of those that's kind of floated to the top is a sales tax measure, uh, but that is work. It's early days that uh, the ad hoc subcommittee will run to ground in terms of what the best option to pursue. And in addition to um, all the parks priorities that we're wanting to move forward, what other elements might we want to also weave in there? So within all of that framework, there could be future opportunities for bonding as well for some of the capital and inf infrastructure opportunities we were talking about today, including potentially, you know, as part in tandem with a capital campaign related to the aquatics facilities and sure. um, the many other, the long list of improvements we're wanting to make from a parks perspective. Yeah, and I, I mean, I'll just go ahead and add that I think our community really values parks, they value open space, they value all the beautiful a aspects of our community that we're so lucky to live in and enjoy. And so, however, we're really using what we're hearing from our community members, from our visitors, to invest in things that they want to enjoy and want others to enjoy, I think is really uh, important. And then, bless you, my last comment I'd say is, um, you know, in terms of like the, 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 de the development and the neighborhoods and, you know, I know we have parks, but I, I'm wondering how, parklets could fit into, and I, and I see the performance measure of looking at um, a percentage of residents, a 10, 10 minute walk to a park. It's just like, you know, small spaces where kids can play or, you know, little, you, there's little parks all over. And so, especially in our downtown, I'd say, you know, we're having a significant growth in that, in this area. And um, people will want space to play and have like their kids run free or open to, and then available for um, enjoyment in other ways. So I, I don't know how to um, relay that, but maybe it fits within that performance measure is definitely something to you know, prioritize as we're looking at our development plans as well. Okay, that's it, thanks. Mr. Newsom is recognized. <clears throat> Thank you, Mary Keeley. Uh, and I uh, you know, just want to uh, thank you and your staff uh, for the great work that you do. Um, you do uh, great work around the city and just want to thank you for that. Uh, and I uh, just want to say I was, I was really excited uh, with um, uh, this proposal to see the kind of increased focus in youth programs and in teen services and also, you know, in neighborhood parks and also in great community centers around uh, that we have, you know, the London Nelson Community Center and the Civic and the uh, Beach Flats Community Center. Uh, so thank you for that and thank you for your work. Others, thank you very, very much for all your good work. We appreciate your entire department. Uh, you are one of the important faces of this government to the public. And uh, you are in the enviable position of uh, facing publicly with a big smile on your face and what you get back the other way from the public with whom you interact is a big smile on their face. It's one of those wonderful departments in which to work. And we do understand that the capital needs uh, are far outstripping the resources at this point, and looking at a revenue measure sometime next year uh, makes very, very good sense. It, uh, you know, a way to think about this is Santa Cruz without a public pool. I mean, that is just pausing on that for a second is, is rather stunning. Uh, so, and I think that's symbolic of maybe a, a a somewhat wider issue around investment in our parks and recreation facilities. Uh, we are blessed to have state parks and uh, national monuments and all manner of things around, uh, but we are the ones that are expected to do that inside the city and you folks with uh, enormous challenges on the demand side do a very, very good job. Thank you all very, very much for that. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. 
We are on the Water Department budget. Uh, Ms. Menard will be presenting on behalf of the Water Department. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. Um, I have with me David Baum, who's the Water Department uh, Chief Financial Officer. And are you putting my presentation up for you? It, it's the PowerPoint. I have a couple of um, items in there to just bring up if we uh, get a question. Um, okay, then. So I, I have pitched this presentation at a fairly high level, but believe me, if you have questions, we can go into any uh, degree of interest, uh, detail that, that you would like. <laughs> Why does that not surprise me? <laughs> well, in part because I, when I figured out that I was well, I didn't think I was at the end, but close to the end, I thought your appetite for a lot of detail might not be terribly high at this time of day. <laughs> and then again, it might. And if it is, it is. Um, okay, so I'm hoping that I know how to make this work. Uh, here's my brief agenda today. I want to talk a little bit about the overview of our department. This is, should be very fam familiar to you at this point. Achievements, proposed budget. Um, and then uh, something about the CIP. Now, in our case, um, our capital program is integrated into our budget because we use a integrated financial pro forma to help us make sure that we are pulling all the pieces together in an understandable way with respect to uh, our revenues, our expenditures, our debt service, our debt service coverage, our financial metrics that we're managing as part of this major capital reinvestment. And I did want to mention uh, with respect to the Water Commission's role, they have been very involved. And uh, over the last number of years, we have uh, had the Water Commission make an explicit recommendation about the budget, which they will do at their meeting on the 5th of June. And that will come to you as a letter, a fairly detailed letter, with a number of attachments to it, with a, a recommendation to accept the uh, the Water Commission's recommendation on the budget and the capital program. So uh, to go ahead, um, I just, uh, uh, our core service, you know, we're, we operate 24-7, 365, and we uh, provide water to about 100,000 population inside the city and outside the city. Uh, we provide meter reading, billing, and prompt cut and courteous customer service. I don't know about you, but very seldom does an angry customer get through to me. And I really appreciate the way that my customer service staff, the uh, Santa Cruz Municipal Utility staff, addresses and works with our customers to, uh, you know, courteously, uh, ex uh, res respectfully, and in a, a prompt way to address their issues, of which they often have many. Um, we operate and maintain a water system with a replacement value of about a billion dollars. Uh, our, our major uh, infrastructure is a huge part of the community's infrastructure that supports economic and environmental sustainability in our community. And I think that we know how important it is to uh, make that do its job and also to be good stewards of that, uh, that resource, oh, the infrastructure resource over time. And we also own and um, manage for about 4,000 acres of land in the county. And many of them have our facilities on them, but also we operate a recreation program at Loch Lomond that is required by our license for the uh, Newell Creek Dam and is one of the jewels of the upper basin. I understand those people up there think it's their park. <laughs> um, so uh, to move on, which, what do I need to point this at? Something. There we go. So in terms of achievements, um, I wanted to stop here for a second. And I wanted to say that probably of all the things the city does, this is the one that most people interact with pretty much every day. When you got up this morning and hopped in the shower or whether you've been going in the back and getting your glass filled up with water or whether when you get home it's time to cook dinner or do the laundry or run a, um, a you know load of dishes uh, at the end of the day, you turn the water on and you expect it to come out. And by God, it does. 
And uh, I was thinking about this uh, thing with respect to the post office, what they used to say was something about neither sleet nor snow or whatever the rest of that quote was that I think we're all familiar with. And I think for the water staff, uh, we definitely had that kind of a winter this year. It's not the first time for us. Um, and no one turned their water on and didn't have it come out, which is really an accomplishment to those folks who know how to make it work. They, they take it seriously and they make it work. They are creative problem solvers. And believe me, we had a lot of those this year. But it's not just in these kind of circumstances. You know, we have droughts. We have other kinds of issues that we are working on all the time. And my folks deliver. And I think people take it for granted. And frankly, given how complicated our world is today, that's nice to be able to know that when you turn the faucet, the water will come on. Um, I want to sort of just give you some examples in addition to that everyday operational production of drinking water that is high quality and, and uh, you know, re reliably there for you, um, that we have been doing a lot in our system over the last number of years that are involving major reinvestments in the water system and sort of stopping, starting in the upper uh, left-hand corner, at least the way I'm looking at it there. There's two, um, and then running clockwise, there's two pictures there of the Newell Creek uh, Inlet Outlet Pipeline. The one with the fellow inside the pipe that you can see in the middle there, that is the new intake uh, pipeline. And the pipe that's kind of down to the left there is a uh, yeah. separate fish flow release pipeline so that we can uh, take that pipe out of service occasionally and do an inspection. It was sized specifically so that it could be inspected internally, either with a remote rover kind of thing, or even in some cases, a person on a little sort of, are you volunteering? Yes, <laughs> um, so, so I think that that project is, uh, is winding down now. We finished up here in another uh, few months and uh, the one there to the, to the left of that one is part of the, the replacement of about 2,000 feet of uh, the Newell Creek pipeline that comes out of that dam and uh, is a really important part of a lot of the work we do. We uh, obviously fixed the hundreds of leaks in the distribution system. The, the distribution system is getting older. It does need attention. We are kind of purposefully doing kind of patch that uh, work because We've got a lot of other big things on, on uh, tap right now, and frank, frankly, it's we don't have enough money to do everything we would need to do all at once. Uh, and then in the middle there on the bottom, you can see that we uh, did a meter replacement that's uh, closing in on finishing the full meter replacement for the whole system, creating a lot of opportunity for people to understand what's going on with their own water use, but also giving us the ability to give folks leak uh, notices when we see that leaks are happening on their side of the meter. And uh, the uh, jumping people there in that bottom um, uh, left pro uh, picture is folks uh, accepting a $7.6 million check from the <laughs> state for a grant for the Santa Margarita, uh, excuse, excuse me, the Santa Cruz Mid-County groundwater base and it's an implementation grant from Department of Water Resources and that money is going into further supporting our uh, exploration of aquifer storage and recovery in the Mid-County Basin and a lot of work looking at the potential for recycled water to uh, potentially serve both so Cal's needs and our own needs for drought supply. Um, here uh, sort of on the ASR theme we've, we've been doing uh, sort of feasibility testing and demonstration testing of aquifer storage and recovery. In that upper left picture, uh, that's uh, BELTS 12, and that is a, a one of the sites that we've been using. We've done some work to uh, improve the fire sort of safety in our watershed. Those are There are two 10,000-gallon tanks that were placed up there to be available to firefighters, to Cal Fire, for example, in the event that we got something going in that watershed. Uh, a, a catastrophic burn in that watershed would be very damaging to water quality and likely produce sedimentation into the reservoir that would reduce its um, volume, which would neither of which would be a good thing. Uh, we replaced a um, uh, an intake structure on the Laguna intake. That's a, a, a there on the right hand side. That 
um, that facility has a plaque on it that says 1890. And that is one of the earliest pieces of our water infrastructure. And uh, it was a very difficult uh, supply to use, it had a lot of maintenance issues. The new intake screen uh, replaced those and gave us access to that facility and that water uh, during parts of the time this winter when we were having trouble with like uh, pipeline breaks on the Newell Creek pipeline. And then the bottom there center picture is the final replacement of the um, Ocean Street extension main that was necessary in order for us to do some of the work that's planned at the Graham Hill Water Treatment Plant, which uh, is the last slide there on the um, at the bottom on the left hand side. And you'll see that um, th that that's basically looking at that facility, which is the subject of a lot of major work ongoing now and planned over the next few years. You heard a presentation about that a few months ago. Um, and then finally, in terms of accomplishments, I want to highlight some work we did last November with a lot of other partners on uh, workforce development. This is the first uh, Santa Cruz Trades Fair that was held at the Civic. Uh, that, that event is scheduled to be reheld again this, November, this coming November. And it's part of an activity that we've been working on that's uh, focused on workforce development for um, green economy, uh, construction, and skilled trades jobs. And we've got a really great informal partnership that's involving the uh, Workforce Development Board staff, the County Office of uh, Education, the uh, some folks from Your Future is Our Business, and a number of other parties that are engaged with us in Cabrillo College in planning how we can support workforce development for um, high paying jobs, for living wage jobs, for our uh, residents here to both participate in some of the work that's going on, not just in the water department, but also uh, sort of citywide, countywide on major reinvestment in infrastructure, construction of new development, what have you, but also um, for our own employees, because we do have both us, wastewater, and others have significant operating employees that need skilled trades and are part of the target audience that we're working on there. Um, the picture with that odd thing with a lot of red in it, that's the uh, one of the new concrete tanks. Uh, there are two, there are three concrete tanks that are being um, replaced up there at Graham Hill Water Treatment Plant. That's the second one. The roof is being put on that now as we speak when the that one and the other one that's completed are commissioned here shortly, then what will happen is the, the last tank up there will be demolished and the third tank will be built where that's being demolished. So a lot of uh, effort to try to figure out how to operate a plant while you're, you know, basically tearing it apart and making it new again. Um, uh, you act, took an action here a short while ago to approve a WIFI loan for us, 1.27 million. And then finally, the bottom is some issues related to some work we're doing with um, our customers on low-income water, low-income low household water uh, assistance program, which is a federal program that we're implementing to assist customers who are having trouble paying their bills. And so that's one of the major issues too. The our future, our business, uh, our water, our future item, uh, which I forgot to mention, is a is really the most recent stage of that work that we started with the Water Supply Advisory Committee, committee that resulted in um, the Securing Our Water Future policy that the council adopted last November. Okay, so our, an overview of our budget, um, we asked our staff to do modest increases. We uh, have a multi-year rate increase that the council approved in November of 2021. The second year of that will be going into effect. And you can see it's pretty big, 16%. Uh, and uh, so that is part of a, a, the increased funding to pay for the capital program that we're doing. And then um, our proposed budget is uh, $42.6 million. And that's a little bit over last year. The numbers uh, from uh, fiscal 23 include 5 million that we haven't included in that calculation of the $1.7 million increase because we paid down a, um, 5 million on a 
revolving line of credit that we have um, with the Bank of America to help us manage cash flow. And that line of credit was under a 1% of more than a year, slightly more than a year ago, and is now running about 5%. So we don't, we want to give them that money back and find some less expensive money. Um, and uh, one of the things that the council has been looking at both historically and in come going forward are these three goals. Our budget is entirely uh, in alignment with both fis fiscal sustainability for an enterprise fund, for uh, infrastructure renewal, which we have you know, been making a major investment on over the last about five or six, eight years, and then thriving organization. It's really important to us that our folks are well trained, that they are um, that they have the resources they need to do their job, and we're working hard to make that so in an environment that I think we all find challenging with respect to some of these issues. Um, we do a lot of um, long-range financial planning in our organization, and included in that is uh, we have a multi-year financial pro forma that we use as a, we model kind of our performance over time. We have a number of inflation factors that are built into that, that look at salaries and benefits, uh, services and supplies, and what, what are the inflationary factors that, that are, um, that are included there. We include the cost of debt, um, and you can see that we have a number of different uh, financing options there, and they all have different um, kind of interest rates associated with them, and we are actively trying to move towards the least cost uh, debt options for ourselves going forward because a huge part of our capital reinvestment is being debt financed as a way of allowing us to spread the cost across the beneficiaries, multi, sort of multi-year, multi-generational multi beneficiaries of these investments. Uh, so you can see that our, um, our capital program has a five-year number there of about $373 million. The, uh, so far in uh, fiscal 23, we've spent $63 million, and we've got about $21 million carrying over, and then I believe that the number for next year is probably on this next slide. Uh, I think it's 30 something. Is that right? Right, and how much for this year? Uh, or the 24, what's the? 53, so anyway, big numbers compared to a lot of what you've been hearing about, um, big numbers. Um, this is a little bit about our revenues. We are 100% enterprise funded. The main source of our resources comes from water rates. Uh, we do have a little bit of money that is in a, a rate stabilization reserve that is integrated into water rate revenue collection. And we do use that uh, to help us sort of even out some of the things like when COVID happens and we don't sell it quite as much water as we think we're going to sell or we have inflationary impacts like we had last year that really kind of upset the apple cart with respect to fin financing. And then we have a relatively modest amount in our system development fund that is used for um, expansion of the system as opposed to reinvestment in the system. Our expenses are mostly uh, personnel and services and supplies. Uh, and we do have a growing amount of debt service that we are obviously managing and planning for. And one of the things that, that is included in the work we've done uh, that you will see in the materials that come to you uh, for the full budget is we do have a financial pro forma, pro forma, and you'll be able to see our performance against established fi financial metrics for uh, reserves for an emergency reserve for uh, cash on hand, operating cash, and then also debt service coverage and uh, days of cash. So those are those are some really important financial metrics we work very hard to manage too. Um, I mentioned the capital program, mentioning that one of the things that's happened that's been a big relief is that we've got inflation uh, back in somewhat more. Um, acceptable level last year was about almost 9%, which is a big deal. But now we're just under, um, just over 2.6% in the past year. So that's a really big help. 
And these are some of our key capital projects. Uh, all of these projects were part of the package of projects that were included in the WIFI alone that the council looked at um, a month ago. Big ones, a Mill Creek pipeline replacement, the Felton to Graham Hill segment is prioritized and really ready to go. It's one of the ones we're looking for uh, SRF funding for because we could potentially get something at 2%, 2.1% interest rather than the WIFI loan, which is right now running at 3.7%. Uh, but, you know, that's that's a thing that we're working the problem. We're trying to get the best deal we can get, really. Uh, and this just shows you, uh, according to our long-range financial plan, that we uh, have a strategy for about 15% of our uh, capital financing is uh, pay-as-you-go fin financing funding, and then the rest is debt uh, funding. And you can sort of see what's going on here about the, the amounts that we're looking at over the next couple of years. And clearly, debt service is going to be a rising part of our, um, of our budget over the long term as a result of these um, investments. And with that, well, this is my friend Eileen, who feels like you know puppies are must uh, must have, and she asked me if she could put this in, and I said, I "Knock it. yourself out." <laughs> I believe I'm smiling. There That's we right. Go. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Ms. Bernard. Uh, earlier this year, you were uh, richly deserved the national recognition that you received for your career in this work, and uh, it couldn't be more true, the, uh, the take it for granted part about turning on that water yeah. tap, and I think that it, it, that became especially evident uh, during the disaster this winter when you were challenged with essentially fix the flat tire but don't stop the car in the process, and uh, to be able to uninterrupted provide yeah. 100,000 customers with water during, they had enough worries on their mind yes, without, without that, and that was not exactly a Band-Aid fix. That, that took some real work, and you and your team and the contractors that came in to assist you uh, deserve a great recognition and appreciate from, from the public. Let me ask a couple of questions. Um, with regard to Loch Lomond and its actual capacity to impound water, yep. um, I was uh, uh, in, an, in another office I held, uh, was involved in the decommissioning uh, of the Carmel Dam. Oh, right. And uh, which uh, was put together, and over several decades, the failure to, to dredge essentially that dam, yeah. they ended up with something that's a 200-foot dam, and they had three feet of water in it because of the failure to maintain. So the only solution to that actually was to take the dam down, move the river around to there. I mean, it was really quite a complicated deal. Yeah. But my question here goes, goes to Loch Lomond in terms of its storage capacity. How do we retain that storage capacity? Yeah, that's a great question, Mayor. Um, I will tell you that we do, about every decade, we do a bathymetry, sort of a, a study that looks at the volume of water in the lake. And the last one was done uh, probably, probably it was pre-COVID, so 17, 18, that kind of time frame. Okay. Um, that report was shared with our Water Commission at the time to sort of describe it. but. We weren't, we're not seeing a huge amount of accumulation of sediment in that basin. Uh, we have seen, and you know, we've, we've been having obviously more severe uh, rain events that have increased uh, sedimentation coming in from the, the main feeder to that reservoir, which is Newell Creek above, above the dam, right? Uh, we saw some, I think, quite a bit of uh, land movement in the evaluations that the staff was doing this year. Um, but we're not seeing a massive amount of sedimentation as occurred there. That's a situation we see much more uh, in La Laguna over on the north coast and also in majors over there. And those are one of the reasons that we needed to replace the intake and the Laguna uh, 
facility was that the whole area behind the diversion structure has sedimented and um, and what happens is that when the storm events happen and that water is then available following the storms, there's uh, there's not very much uh, pressure to be able to divert quantities into the into the intake structure because it's sort of coming over at just like this amount instead of you know all across the whole face of the screen because it's sedimented up. But um, so we're not seeing that particular issue. Um, but I do think that with respect to uh, the sort of climate impacts on uh, what kind of storage we can expect to happen have over time, it's a big deal because multi-year droughts, uh, you know, years where uh, Loch Lomond doesn't fill because we don't get the, the sort of kind of gusher storms, these are becoming much more common. And so you, uh, you don't fill it, you make recovery, but you know, incrementally over time, if you continue and draw in uh, dry conditions, you draw it down, draw it down, draw it down to the point at which, regardless of its capacity, there just isn't water there that can get you through another dry season. Yeah, yeah. And I imagine that with regard to sedimentation getting in to the impoundment area behind the, the dam face, that forest fires would we got kind of lucky on this one yes. it seemed to me that we that Loch Lomond's if you will mini watershed around it was not affected right. whereas had it been which I think we should assume in the future it could be I would imagine that accelerates the sedimentation behind yeah there's a, an example uh, for a Denver watershed that was kind of on the west side of the Rockies a lot of their water comes over and come you know comes through the Rockies and into Denver uh, of a uh, major watershed that was burned over in a forest fire. This is probably 20 years ago now. And the amount of sedimentation pretty much took that watershed out of service until they came in and completely dredged it and uh, then allowed it to refill. I think a couple of things. One is uh, a Things that are happening that the department is doing, the I mentioned the fire, uh, you know, the fire um, safety improvements up at Loch Lomond. We um, we have been looking at ways to. Uh, we've done a fire ecology study for that watershed. We've been looking at ways to manage our lands in ways that are more sustainable from a wildfire protection point of view. Um, I also would say that. Uh, we have um, the work that we're doing at uh, lock, at the Graham Hill Water Treatment Plan in terms of updated treatment design will give us a lot more capacity to deal with impaired water quality than we currently have. More treatment processes and steps that would allow us to continue to use water from that supply, even if it's more impacted by you know sediments or. Uh, uh, things that would get into it as a result of um, having parts of the watershed have been burnt. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned in your presentation, and I acknowledge this frequently, uh, which is that before I got here, this city council and you uh, did a very good job establishing the city's policy framework for resiliency in terms of our water. And if I understand where we are now, what will come to this sitting council over the next little while is going to be selecting from among the menu of choices uh, that, that were predicated upon that policy work that was done in 2022. Right. And so my question is, uh, when we will start seeing that, and uh, which of the uh, which options are likely to come our way? Yeah, th that's a great question. So the work that's going on right now is basically implementation planning for uh, looking at the range of options. So the sources are some form of recycled water, some form of aqua storage and recovery or use of surface water in some other way. And then uh, obviously we have the ocean in our front yard. We can't take that off the table, even though I think we all know that that's a, you know, that particular source has 
has its own set of uh, cooties, if you will. Um, <laughs> and but I do think that what we're what we're really looking at is uh, some form of using surface more surface water when it's available. Um, and this would be a good year if parts of our system were in a little bit more robust shape than they currently are. Um, that we know that we have some opportunities to potentially work with the Scotts Valley Water District as it relates to this new intertide that were that was grant funded that we're going to be um, connected up with them in a within a couple of years to maybe do some water banking with them, which might be a really cost effective you know, low regrets kind of activity that would get us, certainly doesn't solve the whole problem, but would contribute greatly to being able to um, have some more water available for those years that aren't the worst case condition, but look kind of ugly. Uh, and then I think that uh, there are a number of recycled water options that we're actively exploring in collaboration with wastewater and also with the um, with the SoCal Creek Water District to look at those. That's part of what's being funded out of that $7. million check that came in from the state because we, whatever we're going to do there, we or the SoCal Creek Water District has to be done in a way that contributes to and supports the ultimate sustainability of that groundwater basin, which is clearly important uh, regionally, both to um, you know the users in the SoCal system and our system. Oh, and you asked me when, and I'm, yes, the, and I didn't answer that part. Uh, the when part is probably in 24, probably like this time next year. Start seeing some things about it. Yeah, that'll be that'll be quite helpful. I I do want to comment on on what you said. Uh, I know you're kidding around a little bit about about DSL the, about the cooties. But let me say this <laughs> uh, about that. Uh, that was put on the ballot at a very different time. Yes. And it was put on the ballot not during a drought. And uh, and the measure passed rather easily. Yes. But the measure did not say the city could not pursue desal. It said that the voters needed to vote it on it before yep. the trigger could be pulled. So I think it's a very good idea that we are studying this. Uh, much the same as any other technology, the desalination technology is advancing literally every day. Yes, it is. It's reducing its energy costs per gallon, and it's increasing in favorability around the coast of this country, including in California and yep. including at the California Coastal Commission. So I think we should, uh, I, I, I appreciate your kidding around about that, because I, I, I think that's a fair way to say it. But I think we are, uh, it's an evolving issue, and I don't think we as a council should be afraid to have that in front of us as an option and discuss it openly and honestly with the public. I, I agree with you, and I yeah, you know, I was kidding around there. I do think that yeah. uh, it's it's hard to think about when where we are, you know, geographically located and what resources we have access to, and how important it is for us to. Uh, have an adequate resource to deal with conditions that look like they're getting bad and there could be, you know, the kind of experience we're having with whiplash weather is uh, longer droughts, uh, drier conditions. We've done a lot of work looking at climate that, uh, you know, is kind of scary looking and makes you really want to have a lot of uh, robustness to your supply choices because, some of the things we've depended on for a long time might not be a big part of the solutions during those periods of time. I think that's absolutely right. I, I think we can look at other jurisdictions. City and County San Francisco has the entire Hetch Hetchy uh, yes. at their disposal. Uh, if you live in uh, basically central or southern California, you either have the diversion from the Colorado River or you have the California Water Project or, project, or you have the California Aqueduct. Or this year you have and the Kern River. Excuse me? Or this year you have the Kern River, which is yes, they've just diverted exactly. to send to so the state water off, project. Being what I would call off system, yeah. which means we are dependent upon ourselves to be able to make this work. And I think that's another reason to have the entire menu before us uh, in a contemporary way to evaluate uh, what mix uh, makes good sense. Let me ask if there are other members who have questions. 
vice mayor is recognized. I, th I appreciate what you said, Mayor, and I actually completely agree in that um, if, if, I, <laughs> if I back paddled, I probably would have changed my vote. I mean, obviously, um, back then it was a different climate, right? And I completely did not support desal. I think I've gone 180 degrees. And honestly, I'd rather see more water flowing down the San Lorenzo River and restoring um, native fishing. And I think if we're thinking about ourselves as just a, a, a tiny part of the the global you know, fish and fishing industry, um, you know, having that as a natural resource as well, it contributes to to food and recreation around the world. The the salmon, right? So I think um, we have to look at it through a different lens at this point in time. And so I appreciate that you are all saying, you know, let's not take it off the table when we're talking about this. Well, and I think the other thing to note, which we haven't talked so much about recently, but hopefully you're gonna you're gonna be able to see here in uh, sometime in this calendar year. You know, we've been working on a habitat conservation plan for uh, anadromous species as steelhead and coho, and uh, we have water rights changes that are pending before the State Water Resource Control Board that would adopt agreed flows. We've got work going on to bring forward that uh, that habitat conservation plan. And that's designed to share the resource uh, with our community and with the, the natural systems, including these really important species. So I think that is something that is not that common in California. And uh, I keep wondering why the state isn't wanting to make this happen sooner, because they could point to us and say, you know, this is a good example that you can make it work if you're willing to make the commitment that says, it's about water for fish and water for people. Right. Exactly. Councilmember Watkins. Well, thank you, Rosemary. I feel like your department, I, I we get so many regular updates that I, I just really appreciate you always um, just keeping us abreast of all of the moving parts, especially with the complexity of the different projects underway and issues that arise and planning that's underway for the future. I just wanted to, um, one, echo my colleagues' comments in support of, of the various options coming before us, but also really thank you for a conversation I know we've had over the years, which is how to help um, low-income families being able to uh, afford the water bill. Our water bill gets high. My husband loves his fish tanks and, um, and working people. I mean, it, it makes an impact in terms of affordability, and I know over the over the years we've talked about how are we reducing um, the balance or kind of I guess restoring the balance of affordability and that was one way we discussed so I just really appreciated seeing that accomplishment and um, your work in that area as well and just so that you know next week I'm going to testify in front of the Senate Environment and Public Works Subcommittee in a hearing on affordability water affordability well can you send me the details so yeah. I can tune in <laughs> yeah, please. yeah yeah so I mean that I think that it's uh it's a subcommittee hearing being uh, chaired by Senator Padilla, but uh, I was invited this last few days to do a testimony on affordability because uh, we have really embraced the idea that we need to address this and that it's not someone else's problem. It's the, it's our community's problem. It's we need to step up. and But we can't do the solution that we need to do without the sort of federal safety net, state safety net, kind of contributions, and that's really part of what's going on in D.C. They're talking about whether to continue the funding for the low-income household water assistance program. That funding was COVID-related. It's intended to end at the uh, end of this uh, federal fiscal year, at the end of September. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of folks around the country, not just obviously me, who's saying we need to have some funding on this ongoing uh, because we can make these commitments to doing what needs to be done to address the water system reliability, climate adaptation issues, or we can have Jackson, Mississippi be lots of places and that's not a good thing for everybody. Or we can have, we cannot do those things and we can have uh, non-reliable systems or we can try to do the whole thing in, with local rates and then we'll have people who can't afford to have water service, which is really not acceptable. 100% agree, and I couldn't think of a better person to be up there testifying mm -hmm. on behalf of this issue, mm -hmm. and very proud to have you representing us and advocating in this way. So thank you for sharing that, and thank you for your work in this. Councilmember Brown. 
thank you. Uh, I'll echo, put an uh, exclamation mark on Councilmember Watkins' point. Um, and I uh, just want, I mean, I can't say thank you enough, really, for the work you do and your team does. Uh, it's always a pleasure to hear from you. I, I don't have a lot of questions. Um, in large part because you help us understand at every step of the way uh, what's going on in, in the department and how we are going to um, mitigate the, the real risk in our future. Um, so I won't go on. Um, I, um, I, was, I did have a question, though. I just wanted to see if I am understanding here. In your uh, budget summary under in the resources by fund, this is page 20. Eight, the 711 fund, water fund, is projected to increase by a, a pretty significant amount from the from 38 uh, uh, mil in 22 to 46, six, seven. Um, and I'm just wondering if what that is, or what what constitutes that increase? Is that related to rate increase? End of drought, all of the above, so some if you, other things. If you look at the lines above, mm -hmm. um, when you see the um, the expenditures oh, kind of are drought, here. and you look at uh, debts, the debt service line, you can see what's happening oh, with debt that. service, and I, that is driving what has to happen on the revenue side. And that was my other question, so thank you. Very sure. clear. <laughs> are there further questions or comments? Seeing and hearing none, thank you so very, very much. Thank you. Keep up your good work. Thank all of your employees on our behalf. They do a tremendous job. And so do you. And they do. My goodness, are we going to ever miss you. Well. And thank you for everything. I, I know one is indispensable, and I'm sure that whoever's standing here next well, next year will you're as damn do a, close as do you're a as fabulous close as job. Gets, that's for no, sure. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. All right. Uh, uh, for the business come before us. I think we've had enough today. For the, I, I think we've had quite enough. Uh, final comment. Final comment for a moment, uh, Mr. City Manager. Uh, these were uh, quite helpful, informative. I very much like the formatting of both the presentations and the formatting within the document itself. I think it's clear and consumable, not just by budget wonks, but by people who are interested in their government, not only those of us that are elected, but the public also. There's a very accessible document. We cannot always say that uh, uh, in public agencies about budgets. Sometimes they are very mysterious. Uh, this is not anything close to that. It's very good work. You and all the city staff deserve a lot of credit for a well-done well presentation all around. I know we will see you again in June on this. A last question of you. Can you provide us before that meeting with each of those uh, directions that were given about reports back either at mid-year budget hearings or, or at the meeting in June. Could you give us a listing of that? Uh, first off, Mayor, thank you for the supportive comments. It was obviously a team effort. I want to thank all of our yeah. department heads, all of our budget leads, and of course Elizabeth and our finance team for making uh, this as smooth as it was today. Um, and yes, in fact, we've already been talking about putting together a document that we will send out to the council in response to all of the, the pending items that came up today. Thank you very much, sir. The uh, vice mayor moves adjournment, and uh, Mr. Newsom reluctantly seconds it. <laughs> it is non-debatable. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Way to order. Motion carries. <laughs> We're out of here. Way to go, team. Recording stopped. I can't believe you had my shoe. You're oh, such a prankster. I love pranks. Isn't that so good? I love pranks.